words. And no, I'm Publik as well. We did it. I did it. Hooray! Huzzah. We did it. Shlisan Al Gaib. Oh, Paul. Uh, <laughs> he, did it. he said, Dune and, I, <laughs> he said Dune and I clapped. I, I did. I, sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's see. exactly how the Lee Sign Al Gaib would go live. He's so humble. He would do it awkwardly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, All the more reason to know it's him. Is this the right channel? Yes. If you're in my chat, you're in the correct chat. See, I'm not as Congratulations. I'm, I'm not as mad if you go to the other channel. That's fine. I can I can take it. <laughs> I get yeah, big leaked to... by the EFAP boys all the time. It's fine. <laughs> Yeah, we decided to join forces instead of talking about this movie at the same time apart. Yeah. No, that so here would we are. just be silly. Talk about Dune 2. Well, unless anyone has any objections, I say we, we jump into it. Talk about our overall impressions of the movie. Uh, I think that's Metal, would you like to start? No. Would you like to start us off? No, you wouldn't? Okay. <laughs> Who would? Anyone? Jump forward. <laughs> No, I can, I can. What would you think of Dune Some... Two? I Mark. saw it uh, at a early fan event on last Sunday, and oh. I loved it. I got an early viewing. Um, I feel like everybody want... saw it like yeah. a week before me. I don't know why. Yeah, I, I don't know how that in general in the U.S. or something. I, don't know. I saw it yesterday. <laughs> yeah, no, it yesterday. just came out the normal like you know Thursday Friday of mm -hmm. this past yeah. week for me, but then somehow everyone saw it like the weekend before somehow. Like fan exclusive thing, fan exclusive had... events. Uh... They they the, well, yeah, like some local. If you checked your theater, some of them had a day on Sunday that they they called it a fan event. It was just a regular. You could buy tickets if you wanted to, right? But um, mm. but they had this special thing where Zendaya and um, Chalamet came out right before, not literally, but on screen, and oh. said, um, oh. "Thank <laughs> you for coming to this early event." And we make movies for you. Tom Cruise it was is like, here with us. <laughs> yeah, basically. It was basically one of those. Or um and then um they taught they promoted IMAX. So that that's probably what the what it was for. Yay, yeah. IMAX is Canadian. Woo. Yeah. But yeah, it's you but, gonna, glad I, you have something. I haven't been <laughs> yeah. into an IMAX screening like ever. I don't even know where I have one. In Canada. Come to Canada, man. That's a, I don't know, it seems a bit expensive to see a movie. I don't know. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, we, we can hang out. It's like $3 <laughs> more. No, okay. Fine. I mean, think you about it. You have to forgo the I'm large on, popcorn. I'm on Euro. You know. Euro is not as strong, so it's probably like more like 10 bucks more. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's steep. It's climbing. Take a boat. They're cheap. Sure. <laughs> oh, Lofty, you were saying. You, oh, yeah, sorry. You Go ahead. Dune 2. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. I loved Dune 2. I thought... It was uh, one of the, the best experiences in the theater I've had in a long time. Um, and it overall, I think my takeaway from Dune 2 is it makes Dune 1 um, a little bit... Oh, this is hard. I think I, I like viewing them as one thing. Mm -hmm. It's hard for me to separate the two. So... Um, Makes Dune after, one look like after, a piece of shit. Oh god. Well, I was gonna, say, <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say it made it makes it look worse, but actually, um, um, you can't do this without Dune one. So it's like, I, they're they're complementary is basically what I'm trying to say. I just think that this is basically bigger and better in every way. I think than Dune one. The only thing I think, um, Dune one had in a uh, benefit over this movie was the the um, slow burn development of Paul's um, Paul's journey from a naive kind of kid to, to somebody who's been through trauma. And then this one's just more about his false Messiah discovery. But um, yeah, I just think this movie is amazing and pretty much like better than the first one. So it's like a really, really, really good sequel, which is rare, mm. but I loved it. Nice. Who would like to go next? Mark, I'm picking you. Mark, tell right. us what you thought of Dune 2. I, I liked a lot, yeah. Um, I think I can definitely echo Lofty's statement about being one of the better movie theater going experiences. It sort of yeah. had that 
theme park ride element that I How mean, dare I, you. I, I, <laughs> this is true cinema. <laughs> what is this? No, no, no. What, but what I mean, what I mean by that is, um, it, like I, I guess the, the best thing I can compare it to, even though I know like most people will not not be a big fan of the stories in these movies, but the Avatar movies, going to see yeah. one of those in like an IMAX 3D theater, it's almost yeah. it's almost more like hopping on a ride at a theme park and having an experience that is just not something you'd ever be able to get at home in a way that's tangibly different. Whereas if I find most of the time I go to the movies, not too much different than if I was just watching it in 4K at home on my TV and like on my couch with my dogs. It's more comfortable. I can get up, I can pause it, I can go pee, you know? <laughs> like all of that yeah. stuff is is a better experience at home. Whereas Dune, at least going to see it in 70 millimeter IMAX, which at this point I've only seen it once and that's the only way I've seen it, was incredibly impressive to just be in the theater for. And I mean, like I, I'm not touching anything now about the story at this point, but I'm just talking about the 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 baseline experience was just incredibly impressive. And as far as its comparison to the first movie, again, like I think Lofty is kind of correct that they kind of require each other because I think the first one, while it wasn't as action packed and and didn't have as many events, it was it it was a lot of good world building where it's set up this version of the dune like world because i mean i i've heard that a, i read the books when i was in high school so it's, and i'm turning 40 this week so that was a while ago mm. um I, I don't have the clearest memories of them and honestly like i when people were saying oh god they make just changes in the book that are unforgivable i'm like i'm i was sitting there like I mean, there's little things that are different, but I don't, like, what's the unfair? I, I couldn't really figure it out. And now, granted, I'm sure there's someone here that's read the books who could maybe point it out to me, and I, I'd like to know because I've I've tried to avoid secondary sources, like I've not been watching yeah. videos on it or anything. I just sort of wanted to go in fresh, uh, fresh being like watching the first movie. Did you do but that with the first one, or uh, or this or the I, like? I mean, even even the sci-fi miniseries. Like I just every time I do oh, yeah. that comes out i just kind of want to go see it and for um dune 2 i didn't even watch the trailers really i saw one trailer um, i think when i was in the theater for avatar and it was the imax so <laughs> avatar 2 i guess and i saw that trailer kind of forgot everything i saw in it like no it's like okay there's sandworms i know the events of this story that's fine like uh, but i'm trying to not really engage with it so pretty much everything in this movie impressed me like <laughs> i was surprised by almost all of it like or the things seem that, I mean, we can get into the play-by-play -play later, but just the way the Harkonnens move in the first action scene. Yeah. It's, it's just it's something as simple as that, being like, yeah. wow, this is this is pretty cool. Like it's They're doing this in a way that is, is not like anything I've ever seen, but it kind of, it, it delivers on that idea of like a, a, a sci-fi epic, but one that's specifically targeted at adults, because this is... Like, there's nothing about this yeah. that's like even teen movie ish. No, not really. Yeah. And well, I mean, game, it, you character. know, it it could have been because this is like Game of Thrones, right? The story everybody compares it to Game of Thrones, but Game of Thrones is a little bit more soap opera than yeah, than yeah. this. I think and it's just, based. This is like all plot. Yeah. That is probably the biggest detriment it has. I think that more right. character development for um, like really a lot of the characters in the movie would have been very beneficial. But mm -hmm. I don't know. This is, this is just a very enjoyable movie, and I think that it's going to be, uh, or at least my my view on it is that if if it is remembered fondly, then I'm willing to bet it's going to get a lot of people to at least fire up the audiobook and listen yeah. through yeah. it, and then. Maybe go, maybe go into the the crazier stuff that happens down the line, like God Emperor, and yeah, it's uh, if you don't know where Dune goes, it uh, gets weird. It, it, it gets it's weird. a Space. wild ride. Yes, Ghost of Spade. That's I, I have no idea actually. <laughs> oh boy, yeah, Mark, 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 you you mentioned Avatar. I agree, totally agree. I think Avatar was incredible. I saw it three times in the theater. Um, I think it's amazing, and the the movie is okay. It's, I would give it like maybe. I don't know. I, I like the movie more than most people. I, I, probably like an eight, 8 out of 10, probably. There's Wait, some Avatar 2? The second one. I, I'm not a huge fan of the first one, but... Avatar yeah, 2, 8 out of 10? I, yeah, I for sure. This <laughs> right. is where the stream sure. derives <laughs> everybody insane. Yeah, I already had links <laughs> made about Avatar 2. I just think, well, just personally, I think I think people are exaggerating how bad the story is to that movie, but that's just my opinion. But 
I, um, I just kind of like the, the cripple who can't have totally a body. A take. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll <laughs> One of the story. takes ever. <laughs> but, but, but you brought it up. It's funny you brought it up because uh, somebody on Twitter, it was funny. The, the most epic movies of the past four years, like the I iconic movies of this decade, are Avatar, Dune, t Dune um, I would say Top Gun, and Oppenheimer. Now, by and, iconic, you mean and, again, like, for, for, for theaters, for theater, yeah. theater experiences. And it's funny because all four of those movies make up the elements. So it's like fire, Oppenheimer, air, <laughs> uh, and then uh, water and earth with Dune <laughs> and, and Avatar. Somebody made a funny meme about it. Which mm -hmm. makes the, the Netflix reboot of Avatar The Last Airbender like the ultimate uh, iconography. Right? <laughs> I, I heard that, very good I things about that. My friend Sonny just did it. Oh, oh, sure. ER loved it. Yeah, that's Avatar, right. or not, Avatar, yeah. Avatar The Last Airbender on Netflix. Well, like, you're oh. in, you're, yeah, you're in a movie too coming out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Reflection. It's it's violent. I'll I'll say that much. There there will be blood in the movie that I'm in no coming out. It's a short. It's not not a feature, but yeah. it's a sequel will... to There Will Be Blood. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Basically, yeah. Mark is yeah. gonna drink your milkshake. Except instead of oil, it's blood. <laughs> do cyborgs bleed? What the fuck? I do. I yeah. That. They bleed oil. I'm like yeah. we, judging by the creator, they also breathe. So you know that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, no, I mean, only good people. Um, <laughs> yeah. Mark, unless you had more, I was going to pass the baton to Mr. John Gramson. John, yeah, yeah. what did you think of Dune 2? I liked it. Um, I didn't read the books. Um, I've researched it, though. Like I know kind of where the whole thing goes. It does go to weird places. But anyway, <laughs> I saw the Lynch movie um, <laughs> years ago. <laughs> mm. It was very silly. Like, the villains were, like, campy. I was just kind of baffled by the whole thing. Um, uh, so I didn't really know what to expect from the first Dune when I saw it. And uh, I kind of went over my head the first time oh, I saw wait, it. Like, I had a hard time. Or this one? I'm sorry. I didn't hear No, it. sorry. I'm, maybe I'm going a little too far back with oh. boring bullshit. But, like, Definitely. just this is the first Dune I'm talking about, part one. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, part I one. thought you meant part um, two went over your head, but so so that's no, what no, other... the yeah, because the other first one went that. over my head. I just had a hard time absorbing it for some reason. Yeah, uh, I was just like, what just happened? But then I I was probably just tired because I watched it a second time. I'm like, oh wow, this is actually pretty good and pretty straightforward. I don't know yeah. why. At a yeah. hard time. Sometimes that happens. You just watch movies like I have no fucking idea what's just happened. I'm just gonna <laughs> go to sleep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, are you talking about like the lore? Because I've heard Yellow Flash said the same thing last night on stream. He was like, I didn't really know what was happening the first hour of Dune at all. He he was confused. Um, like why they were going to Arrakis. Is that kind of the maybe, stuff that you're talking about? Maybe he about? just needed a nap. Yeah, maybe. I, I maybe just need well, I, th I think that is actually true. I didn't need that. But uh, I think also I was just kind of overwhelmed by all the big. Oh, the, yeah. Uh, not, I get maybe not the big ideas of it, but just like s weird shit like the, the yeah. hand going in the box and the pin and the, all the costumes and just just everything just kind of overwhelmed me. And I just didn't really know how to process it, I guess. <laughs> I don't know how to phrase it's it. Paint well. box, obviously. But uh, anyway, I, I, <laughs> I saw it. <laughs> I saw it the second time and I was a fan. I'm like, this is dope. And then I was excited for part two. And uh, it was one of the best theater experiences I've had. I mean, the last good one I had was Top Gun, I think, like on that level. Um, saw it yeah. in a really a theater with a good sound system. And it's like, I, th yeah. I think in the same theater, I might have seen movies where like the sound wasn't good or like the sound system wasn't equipped to like handle the sound where it's like the, you can you can hear like the speakers vibrating it creates this really ugly sound yeah. that just sucks you out of the movie like that i've had that i think happen in the same theater but with this movie that didn't happen so i, I wonder like if this movie was just so well crafted Maybe. in terms of utilizing a theater sound system that that problem wasn't there Maybe it has something to do with like audio ranges or something, but like the sound was dope. Like so, like, this is definitely a theater movie. You, oh, you want to go see this in the theater if you can. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. And um, yeah, it was dope. The visual effects were like really impressive. I mean, you can tell they they do like CGI, obviously, but like it's just really well done. A good mix of uh, VFX and practical. Um, yeah, I was thoroughly entertained by part two. Yeah. Somebody in chat said to make me listen to Mahler's rant. Is that a, is that about Avatar? Oh, he he came in on my on my stream via oh. his phone to rant about the movie for like five <laughs> minutes, and then he left. <laughs> it was really funny. Yeah, I don't. Need, I I'll listen to it, but I've already debated Little Platoon for like an hour about Avatar. So I, oh. I feel like I don't, I don't, if he couldn't convince me, I don't know if anybody else can. But it was a friendly debate. It was fun. It was funny. Yeah, I think I saw saw you guys were going uh, doing yeah. something on Twitter. That's fun. Um, you said something about the visual effects. This is an interesting. There's a really interesting interview with uh, Noel, um with James Cameron and uh, Villeneuve, and they were talking about it. F. They're still there. Yeah, OBS YouTube just disconnected. I think it should be back now. Yeah, we're back. Sorry about, really that. Sorry about that. Uh, OBS just decided yeah. to shit itself. You can see the full uncut version over on <laughs> Opinions. On um, here, yeah. It was long enough to to end the stream. Should be back. So good. Cool. cool. Um, yeah. So so they're they're similar. D D Villeneuve and Cameron are doing similar things with their movies, like the the the, the story, the Pocahontas thing. They're also doing f production design is interesting because Villeneuve also had this. Um, technology where he could see this like 3d world with his ipad that he was holding up around and and so they're advancing technologies with immersion but they are approached exact opposite when it comes to production design because villeneuve is very much on set practical and camera is 99.9 percent .9%, um uh what are the what would you call it visual effects cgi basically. yeah cgi yeah. Computer so, generator, that stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah well, but, but, you know, but both of them CGI in Dune too. Oh, there's um, a lot of CGI. No, yeah. no, I don't know what you're talking about, man. They got real, they got real sandworms and everything. Yeah, right. Danger, yeah, the sandworm handler <laughs> has the most dangerous job on any set in Hollywood, is what I hear. Absolutely. That was most uh, of the budget paying for the sandworms. Yeah. I think it's Mark. <laughs> Making Mark, sure Alec Baldwin didn't have it. No, no, no. Just, uh, I'm trying to speak and then other people speak, so I'm stopping. No, so I, I, I can't, can't hear I can't hear your, your first half of your sentences sometimes. I don't know. It might just be me. No, that's de that's Discord just being like the Discord, other person now oh. gets priority. Why? Because I decided to do so. Frankie told me to turn something on when we were doing a Halo record, but maybe I'll try turning it off because mm. I think that that's been happening a lot to me lately. So um... that was like a thing yeah. that's been going around with the EFAB lads as well. Like sometimes one person just gets yeah. cut off. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what, what I was going to say is I think what he means is James Cameron will be shooting in like a motion capture volume, like right. just in a right. studio, whereas Villanova is on set and then applying the CGI through that like iPad visualizer thing, yeah. which is probably yeah, actually yeah. similar tech to yeah, what the yeah, Disney yeah, yeah. volumes use, like Mandalorian, where they're uh, they're rendering the set on a big video wall in real time so that people can see. At the I same think, time, I think, I think that that is being echo. used. There's an echo. Uh, an echo. Okay, so maybe I should turn I think that it, thing I think back. It's, yeah. <laughs> You're ruining it. Cyborg. You're Cyborg. ruining it. We go. <laughs> That's what happens when you cross streams. <laughs> <laughs> you bleed oil. <laughs> you bleed oil all over the place. <laughs> all right, Mark. Cyborg. You can do it. You can finish your thought. I believe in you. <laughs> oh, I'm still but trying right. to do my settings. But yeah, it was basically done. It was just the on-set versus in-studio. Yeah, yeah, and, and it, both of them feel like um, fully immersive. Both movies, in my opinion, like a, a Pandora feels super real when you're there watching it, and then this feels like I was in the desert. And yeah, they're just interesting how similar they are, but different. Water and water and desert. <laughs> also, it's like interesting yeah. parallels between the two. Before we move on yeah. to whoever's next, uh, 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 Lord of the Pizza Pie asks: Speaking of sandworms, did everyone get their Dune Two popcorn bucket? They Anyone weren't, they weren't a thing here in Germany. <laughs> no, I, I, they I, didn't I have any. I wouldn't have gotten one in an instant because they look funny as shit. <laughs> um, they had them in my Canada theater, but I'm not, I'm not currently in the market for any new sex toys, so I they, didn't get it. They look like they're a pain in the ass to actually eat popcorn out of. <laughs> yeah. God only knows how they're meant to be used. Um, let's see. Only the Messiah knows how <laughs> to use those. 
He will know your ways as if born to them. <laughs> the har- uh, if you were a Harkin and you would use it differently. Yeah. If you know what I, if you know what I mean. <laughs> okay now. Bring the bucket to my cell. Yeah, Discord has still decided that you're the one who gets cut off um, if it's priority. It's just the first like half second of your first sentence or your first words. I don't know why. I don't understand I'll it. Do a little preparatory before I say anything, and then I'll launch into a point. Then I guess. So, yeah. yeah. And then, oh, then yeah. Anyway, I was saying. Uh, <laughs> uh, Hugh, would you like to tell us what you thought of Dune Two? Sure. I uh, I really 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 liked it. I had a very good time with it. I didn't see it in IMAX um, and I'm not sure if that was... So towards the end in my theater, there was a couple of... uh, I think there were a couple balancing issues between the score and the dialogue because there were some some points where I I could not hear what anybody was saying to each other over the sound of the music but I think that was probably more an issue with my theater than with the overall film. Um... I have I have read the book, the first book and the second book uh, recently. I, I haven't read any of the others because I got kind of annoyed halfway through the fir- uh, second book and I finished it, but I, I haven't gone back to them. I, I fully intend to return to them at some point, but when people are talking about the changes, there are they do make some pretty some pretty big ones. I would I think I think think some of them are kind of significant, com- especially since. Denis Villeneuve has been very concerned with doing, yeah, with doing Messiah. At least I think he has yeah, since the yes. beginning of the, since the beginning of his you know tenure here. Um, there are some changes that I find pretty interesting that he would make, considering that that's sort of his end goal. Uh, but I, I don't necessarily. I don't know if I think they're bad. Or I'm in, I'm curious to kind of bring them up and get you know, yeah. everybody's opinions how, on these. Actually, how I think many of us? have read the books i can't and i mean read. you have i have read the oh, first yeah. two okay, and i read those the, recently from 15 to 17 and i'm almost 40 so it was a while ago oh okay i haven't the only the only thing i i, I consumed in terms of dune was the real-time strategy game that came before command and conquer oh dune spice wars yeah <laughs> that's a good game it's i might still it's actually hard. have that on a disc somewhere that's a hard game oh you're I talking about an old, an old game TVs. an old there's a, there's a new there's a newer strategy game. Oh, I think no. you're talking about the I'm old, old like a, a, older. A, a, I played it as a little boy child. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I might have that in like a video game collection or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's Sometimes. Westwood Studio, guys who made Command and Conquer. Command and Conquer. Okay. I have not yeah. read the books either, so going into it totally blind. And I've, I just uh, read the first book, like a month ago. Again, so I'm pr- pretty fresh. Yeah, I'm sure we'll talk all about it as it goes on, for sure. Uh, Hugh, did you have any closing thoughts on the film before we move on to whoever's next? I, I big desert movie go burr. I enjoyed. <laughs> Yay! Do 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 do. Nobody's <laughs> going to join <laughs> me on this one. Well, see, it's hard to <laughs> chant in unison over Discord chat because of the lag. Which, uh, it's. Uh... It's hard for me to know who's talking. Which one of the demon-eyed people are you? On the left or the right? <laughs> <laughs> are you Roger he, Ebert or are you the other guy? Roger I, I am Roger Ebert. And I am okay. With, with okay, that's Siskel? I could have been Adam Sandler for all I know. I, I don't know who the hell that is. <laughs> or I know, Ebert. Who, We're I know but, but Sis, Siskel has a not a memorable face, though, right? Nobody knows him. How dare you? <laughs> he doesn't. Except for when he has a mustache. How dare you disrespect the the newscasters from Godzilla 1998 <laughs> like this? Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Metal, would you like to go? Fine, like I'll do it. No, I, I would have gone first, but then you just uh, went with the meme, so that's fine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, and so. It's really nice to watch a movie in the cinema and I don't want to fucking kill myself after it. So that's a big plus already. Uh, no, I think it was uh, overall it was really good. Uh, very good movie cinema experience. Uh, definitely watch it in the cinema if you can because uh, that's the best experience by far uh, because I did a rewatch that was not in the cinema. I mean, uh, it was in, definitely in the cinema, in a bad cinema. And uh, man, you lose a lot. <laughs> you do lose a lot with that. Yeah. Um, you know what's mm-hmm. you know what another movie that I tell people that they if they don't, it's like oh I don't like that movie very much and I'm I question their kind of take on it because uh, it's like well if you didn't watch it in the movie theater you're you're getting like 
twenty percent of the experience. The this it's have you ever seen Gravity? Uh no. The, the no. sci fi yeah. movie Gravity with George but Clooney. That sounds like it's it a space thing long. that's probably visually very striking just by the name yeah. alone. Yeah. yeah. It's it's Something Alfonso Cuaron, so he directed Children of Men. Um he's a really, really visually stunning director. And that movie is like 10 times better in the movie theater you, you feel it's horrifying because it's space debris flying at people and killing them and it's a horror movie in space mm. um and at, at home it's just not even close to as good and as it is in the theater it's just not even close to as immersive and that's like a big one for me and then obviously dune and top gun there <laughs> are some mm. other ones but top gun's still good at home got a you yeah. know a charming you know it's charming it's fun stuff uh, I forgot well, what I guess. Was. Uh, oh, we're talking about Dune too. The you were talking about Dune. Too. Oh, I didn't see that one. You're on. You're in Germany. <laughs> and you're talking about Dune. <laughs> no, the year uh, is 2024. Yeah, I mean, your it name looks, is Metal. Looks looks amazing. It's well acted. I feel like uh, I really enjoyed it overall. If, if, I don't. I don't think there's anything particularly crazy wrong with it. Uh, I, I like it quite a bit, but I'm not in love with it. But that's probably just me personally. I find I'm not as hyped as everybody else around the interwebs. I feel like I don't see anything mm. wrong with it, but I don't know. It's just, I'm just not into it as crazy as most other people are. Are Fair. you a big Star Wars guy? Valid. Sorry. Are you a big Star Wars guy? Not not I'm a big curious. Star Wars guy. I haven't seen the uh, the movies in a long time as well. Okay. That's okay. A difficult question these days. Like, yeah, yeah I, mean, I just meant the original Star Wars. No, <laughs> you know, I mean, like, you, you know, I, I like the yeah. Star Wars. <laughs> mm -hmm. ever since yeah. Disney bought it. Well, if you said you're not yeah. into the you're not really like enthusiastic about this. I was just wondering if you were like not into sci fi or. Oh, or, no, or I, I like sci fi. I know. this or, is just, OK, I can't really put it into words like I liked it. I went to the cinema. I was like, yeah, it was pretty good. Then I, I gotcha. rewatch it again. It's like I don't know I'm just not super excited. Not not that not that there's anything wrong specifically with the movie, as I can tell. It's just like I don't mm. know. It's just one of these movies where I'm just like I don't. I want to see. Actually, I do want to see more of it because I I, I think the universe is pretty cool overall. Yeah, I want to see yeah. more about the Harkon and I want to see more about those weird space witches that I still don't really understand what they what they're up to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I guess there's a holy oh, crusade man. coming up. They kill bloodlines and stuff. I did, they're they're crazy and they're kind of in the background. I want to see more about these guys. I mean, that kind of goes to the point that Mark already uh, brought up, so yeah. like some more character development and a bit more of exploring of uh, different factions. Because I've seen people bring up the books. I have no idea about the books, but there's like much more about the Harkonnen and the uh, House of Trades and how they how their dynamic actually works that we don't really get in this one in both so yeah. i feel like there's lots more to explore that you could put in movies as well that would be kind of cool yeah for sure but i, I nice. still think it's pretty good uh i still give it a big 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 thumb thumbus uppus nice <laughs> thumbus uppus that's the latin mm. name for it it is um i so yeah well i'll round out the cast and say that i thought dune 2 was good i really really liked it how uh dare I use the word objectively well put together the story is in this movie is something I have mixed feelings about. There are things about it that aren't as strong, but on the whole, still really, really good. I would recommend it to basically everyone except for the small percentage of people who saw the first movie and actively disliked it. I don't think it'll win those people over, but no. otherwise I think this is a movie almost everyone will at least like, and then some people will love. Uh, there's a lot to praise about it that we'll talk about as we go through. There's a couple things that I think are not as strong. I would still happily call it good. And there's something about this movie that really, that really scratched an itch for me. I like, I, yeah. uh, I think yeah. there's something about the sort of sci-fi spiritual magical mm -hmm. aspect that feels very kind of archaic and ancient. Um, I really like that. That's really my cup of tea. I want more of that as the strongest element of this film, in my opinion. And you don't really get anything like that these no. days. So I was very excited to see that. Loved it. Um, a lot of the character work is really strong. I disagree with some people who think the movie doesn't really have a heart. Um, I wouldn't no. say it's overly sentimental, but I think there's a lot of really good character work here. Uh, visually, I think it's stunning. I think it looks really good seeing it on the big screen, especially with the music. You know, the visuals and the music together make for a big bombastic epic 
experience that I really, really enjoy. There's some things about the movie that I think, broadly speaking, I would call the combat and the warfare that are not super well executed in terms of uh, the logic and logistics and strategy yep, involved. That's a problem I had with the first one already, where I was kind of wondering, yeah. it's like, why are we doing this and not this? But I guess we get to that. Some we'll of just... those questions have answers. Um, some of them, I, I think, don't. I, I think... feel a lot of these questions will be answered with the lore that a lot of people don't know, I guess. I could imagine. Ye maybe maybe i think there's some there's some of the the action scenes if we'll call them that in this movie that um so i've seen the movie twice now mm -hmm. and i think on a on a second rewatch everything i loved got better and everything i disliked got worse which uh which is to say <laughs> i still think it's good but there are aspects that i really don't think work super well so i'm excited to talk about those yeah, that's the, the gist i'd recommend it Go yeah. check it out if you haven't seen it. We're going to, you know, jump. We're going to spoil in. big time. So yeah, big you know, time. Big spoiling timers. Big spoiling times. So you, I would go see it. Go see it. Do you guys know where this falls on your hierarchy, your rank, your uh, what would you call it? The canon of of all time great science fiction movies. Would you? Um, would you? Would this be up hmm. there for you? Or um. Hmm. Um, I mean, personally, me, I probably it, it, wouldn't. I, I don't see myself going back into it. It's like, oh, I really want to watch Dune Part One and Two. <laughs> To be honest, I definitely would. Go back I do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know if they're my favorite of all time or anything, but the stuff I do like in it, I really love. If that makes sense. Yeah, I don't uh, know if it would crack my my top five, but it is definitely it's something I I would revisit it. I enjoyed it enough that I I would recommend it and watch it again. You know. Right. I'm really it's curious to see. My top five. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say it's not in my top five because that would involve being better than like Blade Runner and Alien and 2001 and <laughs> and Empire Strikes Back. But uh, uh, but it's right outside my top five for me. I, I've already seen the first Dune like four or five times. I plan on watching all of uh, the entire five hour cut or whatever as soon as it hits, you know, DVD or whatever, 4K. I don't know. I just I understand what you're saying. Some people feel that way, but I think this is an, a very epic fun movie to re to watch um over and over to, to pick up all the details and stuff mm -hmm. but yeah that's where it's at for me it's like really really high up there yeah i'm interested to see um, where the conversation of these two movies is going to be in two three yeah. years from now yeah that's always interesting yeah. to me when and i would, I would like, say that the, oh, go ahead sorry yeah people... I, I would say that the book the first book is probably up there in one of my like that would crack yeah. my top five for favorite science fiction novels of all yeah. time um the movies would not make that list and there are some changes that the like at, the more i think about them the more I, I kind of go like hmm that's that's an interesting diversion yeah there's some there are some uh when we'll get into this obviously like we can we can yeah. talk about that and I, i'm curious to hear what everybody has to say about like finding out about some of it but uh i i think that that probably <laughs> sums it up is i i would if you really into dune but you'd feel like the movie didn't give you exactly what you want you should probably just reread the book <laughs> or read the book and check it out see if that can yeah. scratch the itch because it is pretty re like i i've heard a lot of people say that the first one is like oh it's it's you know the first hundred pages are really tough to read i didn't find that uh at I all either. no no um i i thought that they it was it kind of hit that say because i was a big song of ice and fire fan for a very yeah. you know for a while and the book has a lot of what you want out of you know like kind of like what you get out of a song of ice and fire so it kind of scratches that itch with a little bit more of a sci-fi vibe to it um but yeah we can get into it whenever i think now is as good a time as any to jump in i figured we just kind of go through the movie sure. relatively chronologically i i don't like to restrict myself to not being able to jump ahead if uh the conversation demands well, we can, it but we I can figured... jump around sure yeah, but mm -hmm. well, we should All start right. at, the, at the beginning. Mark, Mark was already talking about it. Uh, Mark, I, I just wanted to say something, then you can piggyback off of it if that's cool, because we both sort of agree. I think Race the opening back. to this movie, yeah, the, the opening to this movie is amazing in my opinion. It's so um, thrilling um, with what they do. They, 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 there's sort of like a skirmish or like a battle, but they, I think it was perfect opening because it's like people who thought the first Dune was slow are going to go into this and. The, instantly going to have like attention you know um and then i just wanted to get mark and you guys to take do you guys did you get any christopher nolan vibes from the opening to this because 
the, with what he was doing with the um the camera and then the people like flow uh the Harkonnen um or was it Sardaukar but they were like floating up in the air and then the camera yeah. would go like sideways and it was like this to me it felt very Nolan I don't know I just thought that was awesome like something I'd see out of like Tenant or something I, I thought the, I loved it I thought the audio design of that scene helped it a whole lot too definitely because- yeah. He, it, it was it's not like they were wearing jetpacks and you, you heard like engines going off they no. just kind of effortlessly floated up into the air and that's sort of so cool you know, it gives you some yeah. context yeah. around when the baron does that in the beginning and it's just this creepy weird shot and it's like oh no they have the tech to just do this they can they can move in it accompanied and by a sort of like choir um like kind of a faint distant shrieking yeah. sort of yeah. cute but was really strong i really like the music in this movie yeah very good yeah, really music was, itself. it was very complimentary to the lack of sound effect in the the movement of the harkonnen and then it, it like the uh, this is a thing that i might a phrase i might mention a lot because the scene then breaks out into probably the aspect in the movie i love the most that it was mostly <laughs> desert ninjas fighting spacemen yeah but for a lot of the movie i was like well this is pretty cool when they were when they were getting so <laughs> You know, they had to flee because of a sandworm. Uh, the They had to jump on top of a mountain to get away. And then that was planned because then they started getting um, sniper fire and they were getting picked off one by one. And when their bod- bodies were falling and slamming into the ground, amazing audio. Uh, you know, it, it was like shocking, I thought. The first one at least scared me. Um, I love that whole thing. It reminded me of the happening when they were falling off the roof and, and you know, um, de- <laughs> <Yeah>. deleting themselves. <laughs> right. No. Yeah. It was really one, cool. One of the strongest things I think about um, the violence and the action in this movie is that there are a lot of moments where the where something rather aggressively violent happens very quickly. It's very yeah. sharp and pointed and unexpected. <laughs> Those moments seem to hit hardest, I think, they to do. me. Yep, yeah, they do. Um, yeah, so, uh, Metal, do I understand that you have some notes that you were going to work us through? Is that right? I mean, I just took broad notes. Uh, I thought we oh, okay. had enough people so I don't need to take particular crazy notes. That's, that's all good. I just, I was just Stop curious. yelling at me. <laughs> <laughs> Stop ganging up on me! <laughs> you guys ever watch The, the Room? Oh, my God. That's oh, I get, I get a lot of oh, hi. <laughs> don't get, don't oh, hi, Mark. Mark. <laughs> yeah so uh the movie starts i i would say with the opening uh monologue voiceover from florence Pugh's character you're talking alone. about the immediate aftermath of the end of the first movie or uh where they hearken in obliterate house atreides um uh we we learned that if i understand correctly this all happened in the dead of night and so a lot of the other houses aren't aware yeah. of what's happened here yet Yet to, much. They, yeah, yet they learn. they kept it secret basically because House mm-hmm. Atreides. I don't. Yeah, I rewatched the first one and this one kind of like back to back days. Um, I think House Atreides is the like essentially the the ones that are elected to speak for the members of the other great houses. So they're kind of a popular faction for supporting the the the, the Holy Roman Emperor. So the Holy Roman Empire's sort of Congress or Parliament, uh, and so it, it is a it is imperative that they do it in secret so that the great houses don't rebel against the emperor. Yes. Yeah. And then we we transition into the fight scene, the the tense sequence that has already been mentioned, where the Fremen uh, come up against what those are Harkonnen troops, right? They are. Yeah. Yes. They're Harkonnen. Yeah. Who, who are hunting them? In the deep desert, yeah, with their and, um, devices. Yes, and this is clearly around uh, dusk or dawn or something of the sort. It's very rich and orange in yeah. a way that mostly Arrakis, especially during the day with the blinding hot sun, is very like white. Talking about blinding, how many times did you guys get flashbanged by the movie in the cinema? <laughs> <laughs> Several, <laughs> quite a few times. I was like, oh, they're in this cave. Ah, like, oh, God. <laughs> I, I, that's one of the great ways I would give the movie. Like when it's dark, it feels dark. Yeah. And when it's bright, it feels bright, which is something a lot of movies struggle with. So, also, I'm pretty sure you know, it's someone next to me in the theater, cinema theater, who yeah. was translating the movie to someone in a different language because they just they they talked 
every time there was dialogue and he was talking to the other guy <laughs> like not uh, super but... loud but i realized i was like is he translating that because they weren't talking in that's funny i was watching it in english and germany but they were translating it to a completely different language it was very confusing very interesting that's my story um go ahead <laughs> <laughs> yeah so the 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 harkonnen are trying to hunt the fremen in the deep desert at one point, they, they use their silent jetpack type things, whatever they do to float, and they float silent, silently up onto this rock, and they're looking for Fremen and signs of worm sign and all that sort of fun stuff, and they're starting to get picked off one by one, not sure where the fire is coming from. And then um, one of them who isn't shot floats back down, and uh, what's his name? Paul and oh. his mother Jessica are there, and they're like, uh-oh, he's going to get us. What do we do? So Paul runs and grabs a sword off one of the dead guys and has a little fight with him. That's pretty neat. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. But there's a, there's a guy with a sniper rifle behind him who is, looks like he's going to take him out. And then Jessica grabs a rock and smashes his head in. I um, thought it was, a, it was an effective scene, but it did make me wonder how flimsy their armor is. I think there's going to be moments of that later. Um, where I'm not sure quite what the Harkonnen's armor does. They seem to be cut through like butter in it a lot of like uh, like ac action movie. armor. We have armor, but when you st when you slice me, I'm dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit of that. That was, thing, that was one thing I was unclear of. Does everyone in this universe have those shields? Like, are we just assuming they're on at all times? Well, no. no it, okay, it, so I can I can the... answer that for you. Actually, oh, right, so the the shields um, are you can't use the shields in the desert because the rhythmic thumping of the shields attracts the worms. Yeah. And the reason that they have the shields is because it blocks guns. So the re that's why everybody uses swords in yeah, combat, yeah. and it has to be like super slow, right? So like that, and so but when you're in the desert and you're a fremen, you don't have a shield, and you have to use the knives anyway. Um, so, I mean, then like, why didn't they just why didn't they just shoot them all? Well, <laughs> good, um, you know. There are moments where they seem like they really should. Others, you know, yeah. like, you know, they don't have a good vantage point or they're, you know, they get snuck up on. Um, but there are moments in the movie where it really seems like, ah, they probably should have just shot them and they had the opportunity. Those are those are some of the weak moments. We'll get to the specifics later, but that's sort of what I, I, I was... I have one particular thing in terms of weaponry in this universe that kind of breaks yes. everything, I feel like. Go for it. Should I? Okay, okay. Sounds like you wanted to. Uh, the the blue laser thing they use, that seems very powerful with like no doubt it... signs at all. Yes. Yeah. It has amazing range. <laughs> it shoots through big metal things. Like you you take yeah. one and just sweep it in a cone motion on the ground mm -hmm. and you kill everybody. Yeah. Just yes. Chop the whole planet in half. So when those things hit shield in the book when those things hit shields they detonate basically like atomic weapons oh if that's... i'm oh what yeah <laughs> oh, okay well wow. yeah so the Wait, I, that they thing that the they movie does not the movie no because if they I would have done that i would be like it. okay yeah i probably want don't want to do that unless they're far enough away then you definitely want to do that yeah, yeah uh, and uh, yeah, that's that's somebody in chat just mentioned I should bring up the nuke effect on the shields. So yeah, uh, basically, if shields get hit by a big enough laser, they'll they will detonate like atomic bombs. Is that in the movie? No, that is, that is not okay. something that they mention from what I could. Yeah. So as from far what I... I remember watching it, like as far as we're concerned in the movie, that's not brought up. But I believe in the movie they do bring up that the shields don't work in the desert because of the rhythmic thumping, right? Is that something yeah, that comes yeah, they, up in the first one? They, 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 they do in the, the first, first one, one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that partly explains why, you know, the Harkonnen don't have shields when they're hunting the Fremen in the desert. That's all fine. Mm -hmm. um, I Someone asked if what they're wearing is armor. It definitely it looks, like, looks armor like it. Certainly looks like it. If not, they probably should be. Um Though, like, obviously, you know, the weapons and the knives are sharp. You know, like, obviously, it, it's not impossible that they could get a knife in through holes in the armor, you know, armpits and things of that nature. You know, it, that's not really my main objection. But there it, there are scenes, especially one later, um, where, oh, God, what is as the wrestler? Dave Batista. what's his Dave character's Bautista. name? Uh, oh, that's uh, Ra um, Raban. Ra Raban, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's Rebond there's a the moment world. later in the movie where his his little faction gets just cut through like wet paper towels. Um, <laughs> it seems like they should be a bit stronger. So one thing I noticed when I was rewatching the first movie 
is yes, they the Fremen have that blue laser that is very powerful and very very useful. Mm -hmm. um, in the first movie, we when uh, very very beginning of the film, we're getting a little prologue. We're getting voiceover from Zendaya about their struggles against the Harkonnen, and we see them fighting the Harkonnen who are trying to harvest spice, and they have that blue laser. They shoot it through one of the ships. It starts to explode. Then the ship launches these little missiles that swarm. Uh, you might remember them from the first movie. They kind of swarm and find their targets, mm -hmm. and they suffer heavy, the Fremen, that is, they suffer heavy casualties in trying to destroy the, the spice harvesting machine ships that have those missiles. In, in this movie, the second one, I don't feel like they used that very much. There are whole scenes where they're fighting against the, Har uh, the, the Harkonnen who are trying to harvest spice, and they're not using those missiles. And so as a result, the Fremen, with that very powerful blue laser, just cuts through ships like butter, and they don't really suffer any heavy casualties at all. Mm -hmm. um, that yeah. kind of undermined some of the tension in those scenes for me. It also kind of, I, I would have liked it more if the Fremen had to be, if they were more of the underdogs like they were in the first movie, or that's how it felt in the first movie anyway. I don't know if anyone else felt that same way. But uh, there's a whole montage where they're fighting against the Harkonnen spice harvesters, and it seemed like they were just kind of obliterating them. So I, I got the impression that the Harkonnen air support made firing those lasers impossible because it seemed like well they didn't in the even... first scene yeah in the second one when you see there's two of them there's still yeah. two copters uh, uh copter what the fuck are they called ornithopter yeah those yeah, ones ornithopters. there's still two of them in the air and they just shoot the fucking thing so that's what I thought as well that had, that's what I had in my mm. notes and then the second scene happens like oh no there's two of them and they just use the laser. Are you talking about the laser the laser gun? Yeah, we're talking yeah. about the laser gun just now. Aren't they firing that from like crevices or crevasses in like you can't really know where they're coming from? That's what I thought. They were like hiding and then shooting them from like you know unknown yeah. areas. I, I'd be willing to believe that the hard Harkonnen um, horticopters, horticopters, right? Yeah, ornithopter. Yeah. Hornithopter? Thopter. Or, yeah. horn. Just call it thopter. T h o p t e r. Thopter. <laughs> like. <laughs> The Thopters. Um, it's I, a funny Uber that, word, Thopter. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I can believe that when a weapon of that power starts charging up, they would have sensors that will let them zero in on it, which is why the 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 Thopters yeah. are such a problem. And I, again, like I mean, metal <laughs> having it in notes, like we didn't talk about this at all. So I mean, okay, apparently we got the same impression that it was the air support that needed to be taken care of. Yeah. Well, but I mean. <laughs> Also, like framing Dune is something that's been been adapted as a, strat a real time strategy game. It's, you know, yeah. <laughs> that's that's a good way to yeah. give me the impression that like okay, this is why this needs to happen before this. Yeah, I I, I don't I, under I see what you, got, what you guys are saying. I just don't think I think these are nitpicks. I think I I um I think I could make this <laughs> you can make the same arguments with with some other you know a lot of other uh, media. I, I feel like. Um, but when, when you're, when we're doing the, uh, uh, guerrilla warfare style stuff, I thought, um, it was just like, what's it called? Um, it's the word I'm looking for, uh, com or, uh, I thought it was just supposed to be known that they're, they've been stealing this technology from do they, I don't think they said this, but like, they were like slowly gathering all of this stuff from the Harkonnens right over the course yeah, yeah, of yeah. a period of time. They didn't, they didn't have yeah. this stuff in. Um, before Paul was like leading them, right? Like they they just got mm. this technology. No, they had it in the first. Movie. No, they that's well, I don't some think of that's it. really because like the, the Fremen blue, technology, blue. like the still suits and the the thumpers and everything. Like they they're very well renowned for like building stuff that right. works well for them, and they don't usually steal the other. Like they're not <laughs> running out and stealing. Well, I just meant like the laser guns. guns. They but, have those in the first yeah. movie. In the, oh, they in the did. Prologue. Okay the first movie they're using them say like as i mentioned they use that blue laser gun blows up one of the ships but then they shoot missiles and a whole bunch of them are killed so it's very it's clearly very dangerous and they suffer a lot of casualties i felt yeah. like it was less balanced in this movie and made it seem like okay so there's a scene and i think this impacts things i don't think it's just a nitpick i wouldn't say it breaks the movie or anything but it impacts the feeling that the fremen are kind of underdogs here there's a scene there's a specific line where Paul says something about how fear is all we have. And it's like, I don't know, you guys are kind of cutting through them like butter. Like, things seem to be going really well, honestly. And yeah, like, I would have liked, liked a couple of scenes where they 
actually lose a lot of people or at least a, yes, a bunch of that people. that would have helped for sure. Like they have the blue laser guns, they're very especially, powerful, they do a lot of damage, but a, then it's risky and consequential. And I mean, especially during combat, obviously they get well, they, they, to shit they, later they, on, they, of course. They, they got mowed down pretty hard when they were trying to take on that harvester. Like those, those ornithopter weapons are op <laughs> they will like one pull of the trigger will fire like, a big, like 75 big rounds in shotgun your or skull. something yeah i i I, th I thought they were taking a lot of uh casualties every time they went out to do these things like they showed a lot of the the fremen just like running and then like all of them died except paul and shaney and a couple others you know and at least in that um, one skirmish in the first one when they when they shoot the when they have to k take down the ornithopters, um, uh, yeah. circling the uh, circling the yeah. Shot them, for sure, yeah. There's yeah. a few, yeah. There's a few of them that, that get shot, but I, I don't I don't know yeah. if I would. Yeah, they didn't. They're the only survivers. I, it doesn't because no. it, it seems like a yeah. whole group of them are celebrating afterward. Yeah, so. it was a resounding victory for sure, and yeah, then was, that's yeah. probably the best of them. And I think the ones we see in the montage coming up are even worse in that uh, they're even more OP and they don't suffer any casualties and they're just wiping through the Harkonnen. I think it was kind of, I think the impl the what it, the consequence of this decision um, kind of makes the Harkonnen look weaker than they ought to be for the sake of the story. Um, I think we kind of, we, we do some things to make the Harkonnen by implication kind of stupid and not as competent um, that I don't like, especially with the decisions made by Dave Batista's character, whose name I already forgot. Raban. <laughs> Raban. Raban, yes. Uh, but we'll, we'll get to those as they come. I think that the scene where they attack the Spice Harvester for the first time and they have to shoot down the Ornithopter is probably the best one in that regard. Um, it has yeah. the least annoying imbalance problems. Yeah. If, and if I could just use that as a quick jumping off point, because there was a comment in the chat about the, uh, like, why are there, how are there no satellites? above the planet because uh, I think one of the things is that the Harkonnen do have that sort of that like cartoony villain incompetence a little bit in that they've never tried to image the south of the planet with satellites yeah, yeah. Um, it's bribery like that. Bribery yeah from it's bribery for, yeah it's bribery from the Fremen the the spacing guild uh stops basically like this is something that is not explored in the movie but it is explored in the book and i was so about I to say that they missed a... like 20 minutes of a movie no. <laughs> yeah, <it's something laughs> that i think that they they did a they they did a little bit of a disservice by excluding from from the movie is that yeah. the spacing guild is paid in extra spice by the fremen for not having for basically for keeping satellites away so that people can't see what they're doing on the surface. Yeah. Okay, that we're... would have been smart to include because yeah. as yeah. it stands, and this will come up later, uh, the South seems to be an utter mystery to people who are in orbit and can just like go down there and look at any time. <laughs> well, they, they also showed that the South is very rec reclusive. Like they, they have a, they live in, don't they live like under the ground? Yeah, but they also have a big rock with a temple yeah. like base mm. carved into it, kind of yeah. like the one in Jordan. So uh, and, and, it would be hard yeah. to miss. There is also some uh, traces of green, like in the, especially yeah. not in not in the movie, but the way that it is in the novel is that they're like they're they're planting things out there and trying to make it turn into a hospitable environment, which is something you would be able to see. You would think on a planet that's mostly just desert yeah. but if they're be if they're bribing the people who run the satellites to hide those images then you know there you go problem solved um and they do mention in the first one that there are no satellites operating around the planet they just never get around to explaining why that is oh okay. so especially when it becomes a uh like a big reveal towards the end of this one that holy shit there are people they uh by the way you idiots there's people living down there it exhibits signs of life how did you mm -hmm. not see that it's like well yeah. There's there is a reason. It's just we're not gonna we're not gonna talk about it for for that. Don't don't do you, the the Har Harkonnen have these these I don't know human computers or something going on? I heard about that. Like, yeah, so you don't really see it in the movie, but I heard about this. Sounds kind of cool. The ones who roll their like um Stuart from Devs. I can't remember the actor's name, but I like him a lot. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a good. Yeah, yeah, he um 
he rolls his eyes. The guys who roll their eyes back and, you know, turn them white while doing calculations are human programmed computers. Mm. And Computer. yeah, one of the one of the things about them is that in Paul is also trained in those ways as well as the Bene Gesserit. So he's combining like all the different this is the way the novel tells it. Right. So he's combining all the different superpowers that people have into one person that these futuristic people have into right. one person, which makes him particularly potent as a weapon uh, yeah. more so than others, which, uh, you know, again, I think the movie does a bit of a disservice by not including some of that. Um, I think cut mostly for time, but you know, yeah. cause you'd have to do some work to explain that. And uh, they, they decided to, you know, push on with the, with the action fun stuff instead, but yeah. there is a little bit, Somebody also yeah, the, the human computer thing isn't just Harkonnens, though, is it? Like, no, uh, no, it's no, not. no, it's no. The, everybody has one. House oh, Atreides okay. has the big guy. Uh, well, the everybody guy has one, and, and it's the only way that computers are allowed is because they don't. The AI caused a revolution that almost wiped out humanity like several thousand years before any of this. Took Terminator. Place. Uh, yeah, Skynet. pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, is it the Schwarzenegger? The Schwarzenegger Sequel. Jihad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Terminator <laughs> Cross Sardaukar X uh, versus <laughs> Alien versus Predator. Terminator versus Sardaukar. <laughs> we got to get that movie some at some point. Cyborg, he's the best of us. <laughs> Someone chat Somebody in chat wasn't said, Google Gemini, uh, Gemini by any chance? Was it <laughs> Google Gemini? Uh, Gemini. No. Yeah. Somebody also it? asked, uh, "Whose armor is stronger?" Um, My uh, Dune armor. Dune armor or armor from Troy? <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's um, oh, it's because we did the EFAB movies uh, with Troy, and we were wondering why they all even wear armor because the armor didn't do anything for anyone. It just stepped uh, through all the armor and slashed through it. <laughs> that's that's why yeah. they show so much skin in the outfits. Like, <laughs> I would say that. Yeah, as far as whose armor is stronger, I think the plot armor in Disney Star Wars is probably the strongest. Oh, that's, the, that's, that's yeah, that's, that's, that's a very good one. That's a very strong <laughs> one. That's yeah. much better than Mithril, I think. It's, yeah, some of these sure. some of these action uh, shortcomings uh, and warfare shortcomings the movie has are definitely worse in a lot of other bad movies, but they're oh, yeah, they're yeah. kind of like a little too reminiscent of a lot of Hollywood tropes. For my liking, you would think. Uh, in this movie, and I think this was explored, I think, better in the first movie that, like, the technological advances that they've made and the technology they have should change what warfare looks like a bit more than it does. But war never changes, second. Cap. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so they have that initial battle uh, where they destroy the spice harvester and then they're celebrating their victory. And this is one of my first favorite scenes in the movie where they're all celebrating in their little tent at night their victory mm -hmm. and um they're talking and eventually the conversation comes to you know what paul's goals here are you know because there's a lot of uh, a lot of the fremen from the very beginning when they first arrive in the first movie a lot of them are speculating that he might be the lisan al gaib the one the the, the person who's going yeah, the person is going to come and save them. The voice from the outer worlds yeah. is going to come save them and lead them to victory. Um, and at first, at this point in the movie, he is not concerned with doing that. What he wants to do is fight and live among them, like alongside them, that is. And so this is when we sort of get his intentions and what he wants. And then we have a great scene where they choose names for him now that he is uh, mm -hmm. becoming a part of their group. I love this scene so much. I, I should say that Javier Javier Bardem is probably what's it, what's his character's name? Stilgar? I'm so bad with these names. Bill Gar. Yeah, yeah. He like is him. so good in this movie. I love yeah. his character in this movie. Isn't it great incredible. when you have a character that is a bit funny but not in a cringe way? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. <laughs> I didn't expect that. Yeah. He's yeah. definitely oh, the he's... funniest character I think in the whole movie. Oh, yeah. yeah. The whole movie. He's Some funny. of the lines. He's Wait, very. Really good. I love a very sympathetic. Oh, he's so good. And Javier Bardem is great. Uh, so someone said, you skipped his mom drinking the water, right? I don't remember the exact order. I think what we might end up doing is like following certain plot lines for a bit. Yeah, I can't remember that. I, I saw it a week ago. And I, and I yeah. that this movie you have to watch twice at least. 
you know? Yeah, to really well, I did do a, a, a rewatch to move some notes. I mean, it doesn't matter. We're a little bit out of order, but it's, it's fine. That's okay. Yeah. The exact order of what plot lines we're cutting back and forth between when will probably be lost to us at this point, but I'll sort of follow the threads I mean, as it, they go. It, it probably is worth pointing out. So when they when they first arrive at their HQ, the Fremen HQ is what I called it. I don't know if it has like an actual name or something. I think it's just their hideout, one of them. Uh, or the biggest one. It's definitely where the people in the north live. Yeah, we we see that still got to talk to yeah. I don't know the 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 desert council or something I don't know, uh, and he's like, oh, I saw he's he's on her grave, and they're like, yeah, right, this one is it for real this time. It kind of sounded like he uh, like he uh -huh. tried that before or something. Like that reminds be me signs. of Morpheus, or I guess Morpheus reminds me of him. Right, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. And they basically I... say, well, let the desert uh, choose their fate uh, of the boy and uh, woman. Well, we actually have a dying reverend mother, and she knows the way, so she's going to do that. So she's becoming the new, uh, supposed to become the new reverend mother. And we also learn that they have, like, big, big water thingies underground that is all made out of dead yeah. people, as from what I understand. It's like a religious place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm actually the not water... entirely sure what I was supposed to do with that like they pull it back right. like as a very another instance of it's another instance of context being removed where maybe it shouldn't have been i but... i don't know uh, i'm going to interrupt you only because i think it works perfectly well without any additional context because from what um, i understand maybe i understand they they put that in there and if there's enough water uh, as he said it the the messiah is gonna use that to bring back the green of the world or something I think. yeah yeah so the way he describes it is that, you know, the underground in their little underground uh, living area, there's a sort of temple chamber in, in the mountain that has a giant uh, shallow lake that seems to extend almost indefinitely. And um, what they do when the Fremen die is they take the water out of their bodies. They kind yep. of, you know, mummify them in a sense. And they take the water because they worship the water so much. They put the water back into this eternal pond where, you know, all the water comes from and where all the souls go to rest, that sort of thing. And um, he, he says specifically to Jessica that e even if they were on the verge of death, they wouldn't drink from this water because this water is sacred. Mm -hmm. And he says in a sort of, um, uh, regarding the prophecy that like when there are, n are enough souls in here, when there's enough water in here, that will be the time for when the prophecy is made manifest. And yeah. I believe he says, what's the name of the, the sandworm spirit that they... Shai, Shai Halud? Shai Halud. Shai Halud. Yeah. Well, I said it almost the wrong red rod. Hi Shalut. That's the one. <laughs> uh, I think he, I think he <laughs> says, if I remember correctly, he doesn't say that uh, the the Lisan Al-Gaib will make the world green again. He says that the... Uh, I've Shai Halud. Shai, Shai Halud, Halud make will, green again. will re make the world green again. So it's 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 less like this water will be used to make the world green again. In, in my opinion, it seemed more like <laughs> when enough of us have fought and died for this battle, like the time will mm. come, kind of thing. Yeah, that's how it uh, seemed to me. Yeah, no, and I I like the religious signif. I think the religious significance it works fine, right? It works it works perfectly well for the sim the symbology that they're going for. It doesn't necessarily need the extra context, but in you know. The extra context is that they are in the in like in the way that it's written, they are trying to actively bring the vegetation back to Dune. And so they need a very specific amount of water. And so they will not allow that water to be taken. It, like there's a practical purpose okay. to it as well as a religious significance. So I like it's not again, I don't think it's terrible to remove that context necessarily, but it is one of those things where it's like, well, you know, it, it adds a little bit, and I think it, it helps um, to get uh, some Counterpoint, I think maybe that lessens it for me a bit. Okay. You know, that I like the symbolic significance, the religious significance more than the sort of, I don't know, for lack of a better word, basic materialist significance of it, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. I don't know. That's just I don't know, like hearing that extra context kind of lessens the impact of it a bit for me. I can understand maybe, that. Yeah, I mean, I, I the, get it. Um, yes, I really like basically every scene with Stilgar in it. Um, yeah, you know, it's kind another... of funny. Oh, go ahead. Oh, Sorry. no, I was just gonna say um, the, the the end of this scene. He's talking about you know this this lake of all the souls of the dead and all that sort of thing. 
um, she starts crying. She weeps over how many dead this must be to to have filled up this massive underground mm-hmm. pool with with the water of the dead must have been a ton of souls. She starts crying, and then he uses his thumb to wipe her tears away and scolds her for yeah, um, so don't waste, waste wasting water on the dead, not yeah. even for the dead. Yeah. yeah. Um, says a lot, I think, about their people and their attitude towards not only what they're trying to accomplish, but also how they view uh, the souls of the dead and also how they view water. All that together really works. Then he says um, that they've agreed to let her stay. They have a reverend mother who is dying and that because she's a Bene Gesserit, because she knows the way, Mm -hmm. that they're going to make her the new reverend mother. And she says, oh, what if I don't want to? And he says, oh, well, you know. It's either that or you die, yeah. <laughs> essentially. And the way he says it, I don't remember exactly how he says it, but he says it in a very funny way. It's very charming in this movie. Yeah, Blunt and matter of fact, but fact. charming. Um, it's something to the effect of if you're not going to be the mother, you, then you have no use to us. And if you have no use to us, then your water will be better served going back to, to um, oh, I forget what true. they say. Yeah, to, It's actually to just, true. it's <laughs> self, it's... um fulfilling their own, it's what's what's the how do you how would you call it like when they're fulfilling their own prophecy like he's deciding yeah, that she is you know like he's using uh threatening her to to basically be part of the prophecy which doesn't really make sense if, if he wouldn't have to use a, like a threat like that if, if it was a real actually, prophecy that's actually one of the things that i found really interesting about stilgar because i think yeah. he's yeah. a great example of developing fanaticism where right, right. every single every single action that paul does he interprets as being <laughs> as through the, as being correct through the lens of the right, prophecy right. and uh, i i thought that that created some funny moments but also moments that, that kind of made you think about how these things can get out of hand if mm. uh, right if you start believing in them too hard you know yeah that's a good that's that's the theme of the book yep yeah uh, I've seen some people say that uh, the Fremen are very utilitarian people, though. And it's like, well, yeah, but they're like in this movie, at least, they're incredibly spiritual people. They place no, a they lot are. of value, but they're also on the spiritual also and religious significance. Basically, split in half in how far they go with this, because uh... I wouldn't say in half necessarily, because it seems to be like half of the people in the north only. So maybe oh, like a okay, quarter, yeah. if that makes sense. Um, yeah. yeah, it's definitely, yeah, there's definitely there's a, a, there's... an outlining of people who's like, nah, we're not going to wait for the Messiah. We're going we're gonna to fight for ourselves. So it's not going to be well, super yeah. easy to just uh, get everybody oh. on their side just like that. Yeah. What I would add is that it's not necessarily that those people aren't religious or spiritually inclined, but they don't necessarily believe in the prophecy. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, they're very spiritual people. So that, that the, so, like, the idea of making that pool of water something that they're trying to collect in order to achieve a certain goal. I don't know. I think it kind of minis- minimizes the spiritual significance to me. And I don't think it makes them less utilitarian that they're not just saving that water for a specific purpose. Yeah. yeah I, and- I think that the, the saving of the water for, you know, it's for, you know, use of like, we need exactly this much, which that's, that is a part of the book is that the, the ecologist's father calculated the exact amount of water they would need to complete you know basically to you know fix the planet's desert oh, problem right okay. um is I, I the main thing i think with that is that it's like it goes along with the theme of what the book has this whole theme of like when is prophecy you know something that is serving a greater purpose so like the the bene Gesserit created the prophecy in and it's then they go into this in you know in the movie like they've laid the groundwork for the prophecy among people all throughout you know the universe basically they they tell these stories that differ from location to location and planet to planet all that kind of thing and there's a there's an like a cynical nature to it where it's like well yeah i mean like spirituality is a very powerful tool for manipulation yeah. and so in the the way that like the pra- having the practical purpose kind of draws a comparison between the Fremen and the Bene Gesserit for me in that like they are intensely spiritual, but also there is, you know, some material reason for why they're doing it. And you, you start to, you know, kind of draw the, draw the comparison between like, all right, well, how different are they really from, you know, the ones who are on, 
you know, the ones who are in power now to the ones who would become, you know, would take power later. Um, yep. And, you know, where does that line get crossed of like what? And I, I don't know. I, I like that that sticks with that theme overall. But I do also like that, like, that it backfired because people actually believe what's happening. And especially once Paul arrives, the, the, they're, the, you know, the Bene Gesserit are like, wait a minute. Shit. <laughs> we might have accidentally created the perfect uh the perfect storm for removing ourselves from power without mm. even realizing what we were doing yeah that's uh, interesting I, i've seen a couple comments in chat to this effect i think my, now might be an okay time to talk about um how much we value being uh accurate to the source material here uh yeah speaking only for myself it's not something i'm concerned with if there's if there's something that isn't that doesn't work about the movies that was better in the books, that seems like a valid criticism. Like, oh, you did something stupid that you didn't have to do because it was right there. Um, but if they change things, like comments to the effect of there were no factions in the book, they all believed in the prophecy. The whole conflict between North and South was fabricated for the movie. It's like that's probably true. Mm. Uh, I'm okay with that. I'm yeah. okay with uh, yeah. drastic changes. I don't know if anyone else is um, no, a purist. In, in the adaptation argument <laughs> it's uh no the, the the purest people to me i don't know i don't know how you can be that way all the time because like for example like the, the uh, i always bring up the shining but like the shining is not like the really like the book that much but it's a fantastic movie mm. and and pure purism yeah. in general it's like what i don't know i think do you think some people are just very, very stubborn with with that, or do you think it depends? Yes. Because I think some people are just super stubborn. Like if it's some not are. one to yeah. one, yeah. it's the problem. And it's like, well, I don't, I don't, I don't understand that at all. If something is improved upon, or if something is different and also good, yeah. like Jurassic yeah, Park, or like Blade yeah, Runner. Cool. Or Lord or, of the Rings. Lord of the Rings. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, like, I'm not going to sit I'll, here I'll, and argue that Tom Bombadil should have been kept in no. the theatrical version. Like, I think we'd made a good choice trimming a little no. bit of the fat there. And, <laughs> and I'm, I'm not going to argue against... Oh, go ahead. I think, though, that the idea of, of using words like improved upon is where people start getting sensitive about it. Because I think that... It's the old argument for adaptation or from adaptation thing saying yeah. this yeah. is not good because it's not exactly like the book. And that's not always true because you do have to make changes when adapting any story to a different medium. You would right. have to right. add gameplay to Return of the King to put it on Xbox and PS2, you know? <laughs> like, like that is it is a different right. experience than the movie even though it's based on the movie and supposed to be similar to the experience of the movie and i think that very yeah, often with yeah. books because of I, I think because of the intimacy of of uh, the reading medium i guess like uh, be it audiobooks or, oh, which isn't really reading i suppose but you know you're still experiencing the story or reading because you get so connected to it be, people will often react to emotion when it's not their vision of the book on the screen. And I think that it is incumbent on the directors to think about those people enough and not change too many elements to the point that you can't even recognize it as an adaptation in the yeah, first that, that, That's bad. Yeah. yeah. Like, that's not what this is at all. No, I, I was just I saying, like, so. like, like, for example, like Arwen's, um, you know, girl boss moment in Lord of the Rings where she summons the water horses, which doesn't happen. It's actually Elrond and Lorfindel. But I love that scene. I actually think that's one of my favorite scenes in the entire movie. So it's like, is it an improvement? I don't know if I would call it an improvement, but it's like, I'm glad that Peter Jackson uh, changed it. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah. you know, it's, I can't it's, help that I like that scene. It's not like, I'm not going to pretend that it, that's, the scene is bad. And and yeah. just, you know, going forward, like when if I'm making like, comments about you know that this is what they you know what they did here like, and especially like with this one when we're talking about like there's no factions between the north and the south right like i don't think that that is no. a change that has like bears as much um it, it doesn't affect it as much and i think it makes it it, right. it works well the way the movie did it i think it, i think that is that's yeah. something that is that works yeah for me at least you know yeah. if, if somebody else it gets always did, weird you know, when 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 you uh have a yeah, thing, thing. To, you adapt from and then you point out a thing it's like huh this doesn't really make sense but then you you get to know it's like oh in the books it's like easily 
explain with like a sentence like oh yeah they were bribing the people it's like oh you could have easily put that in there like yeah, it was right yeah, there yeah. like you could have easily just grabbed yeah. that without i agree that's diff- that's the kind of go ahead sorry yeah, yeah. no that's basically is like you could have just grabbed that and put it in there with a line or two it's it's like, a line of two dialogue of what they're doing and like how they're keeping mm-hmm. people and from seeing where they I'll are be honest, in the South we could have easily made a couple of minutes time to put that yeah. in <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, there are definitely changes like that where it's like, oh, well, why would they get rid of this? That actually helps everything make sense. I think sometimes what happens when people are adapting things, they're so used to the source material that they forget that certain things need explanation. You know, that, that right. for example, that they, they have no idea really how many people are in the South or where they live or anything. It's like, well, if you leave out some of that important information, you watch the movie and you go, wait, why do they have no idea that there's millions of people down there? It's just open desert. Look, they have a giant like temple door carved into a. Well, they, no, they explain yeah, that explain enough that in the movie. They, they definitely explain that. They explain how difficult yeah. it is to nobody can survive in the de- deep desert. They explain all that in the movie. It's well, very um, sim- it's yeah, simplified. Yeah, satellites yeah. don't see it. I thought we already covered that part. I know, but I don't think most people are thinking about satellites when they're watching that. That's a very like I what what guess. if uh, I don't know. Well, there, I, I mean, you you might have been, but yeah, there's ships in orbit that are looking at the surface and stuff like that. Yeah. It's not like the whole bottom half of the planet is covered in yeah. one giant sandstorm. There's rocks with like giant temple doors carved into them. Right, right. That I'm just saying, like, we need to ruin yeah. the movie, Lofty, but I mean, it, it is still yeah. kind of there. It's like, wait, so why don't they know about all these people? There's so many of them. Well, every, like I said, a lot of every movie has these, like, what if, why not, what if, like, what, why, like, before Johnson did the hyperspace into the thing and then kind of retcon everything, why, I, people have asked him, well, you know, can you, why can't you just hyperspace into a ship? Why can't we, why can't you fly, uh, yeah, uh, uh so, why can't you fly an X Wing into the, into an at a- ATAT? Uh, and then just like eject yourself and, and then and save like a lot of lives. Like, you know, there's always, there's always like, why can't they do this in like everything? I, I, I just um, feel like yeah, that why aren't there satellites is a very <laughs> nitpicky. <laughs> no, that's not that. Well, first of all, it's not the complaint. And second of all, it's what yeah. about it is the complaint is how do they have no idea how many people are there? It seems like they just didn't look. That's the complaint. And if yeah. well, that's, reason- that's, that's wrong because they hide. They're good at hiding. Yeah, but the right. emperor no, comes in later and says there's human humans there. Like he arrives, it's like there's signals there of human presence. Why didn't you know? Yeah, but that was explained on the scene before. There was something specific that he was talking about. Like he knew about Paul's existence. So I think there was another. Wasn't there something else besides? Like the if emperor there's a giant him, mountain yeah. with a giant temple door carved into yeah, it, they're not it. hiding super well. Well, yeah, but the Harkonnens are stupid. Though. That that's another. Yeah, thing. yeah okay. Well, then that's a problem. I think. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a problem for me. Lofty, Lofty, listen to me. Dumb villains. Lofty, what yeah. our point what? is, it would not have been very difficult or taken very much time to write in a way that that makes, oh, yeah. makes sense to us why the Harkonnens specifically do not know about those people in the South. You know, like like that, and that's more the issue. It's like how could they have tightened this up? Is is sort of what we're getting after? I guess I just. You know, they 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 talk about. Uh, Vladimir says that it's an uninhabitable. Like they they're 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 lazy. They're not. Um, they weren't efficient with their. He was not a good person to run run the the operations on Arrakis, and he failed. I just think it's it's a big mistake to chalk up as well. He's retarded. You know, <laughs> so like. But yeah. but he was though, and that's why okay. he failed, and that's why Raban. Yeah, that's I mean, why I'm um, fade. Ralpha took over and was so efficient instantaneously. Not that was very important. To, like, look at a satellite though, I guess. Well. Fade was heavily distracted with warfare at the time, but yeah. So, okay, let's let's start here. I think based <laughs> on how this movie presents the Harkonnen, they are stupid. Um, we can yeah. agree on that. I think that yeah. was a bad narrative choice. I think that was a very bad narrative choice to make them absolutely retarded. It seems That's like they got there. suddenly I mean, a lot dumber agree. since part one. Yes. You know, like, yeah. I agree. Part with that. two, they just felt like kind of meatheads. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, That's fair. Yeah, I just they're, they're, someone yeah. said, I don't think they're stupid, more arrogant. In this movie, not the first movie, I would say, they're arrogant in yeah. both, but they're arrogant to the point of stupidity in this movie. And it's probably my biggest problem with it. It kind of makes them worthless as an enemy faction to a degree. I don't think, yeah. it, I don't think it's good for this story that they're stupid. That's fair. I just disagree. I, I 
disagree. I think I, I, we could argue about it for a while, but I, I guess yeah, we're no, just trying we, to break we, the movie we, down. We <laughs> but I guess I mean yeah. that's that's just I I don't know. I hope I've I hope I've explained the perspective of our side yeah. of the yeah. argument to you. Though. Oh yeah, I get I get it. I get it. And they they could have added a line about the satellites. I get that. I get that. Yeah. When I mean, if to have it there, I think the the main yeah. point too of like bringing it up as like part of the adaptation is to have it ready made for you. And to just kind of choose not to include it is a little bit of right. a misstep, would be what I'm saying, right? Like, it's not... They, they they do come across as kind of foolish and arrogant in the book as well, even though that is present. You know, yeah. the fact that they, they write in an excuse for why they can't just right. scope out what's happening, you know? Yeah. So, for for example, when Fayette, Fade, is that how you say his name? Fade, Fade Rautha, yeah. When he comes in and goes immediately to their temple and just decimates it, how does he know it's there? The temple or the um, yeah. oh, the seats, the northern seats, the, the, the northern the siege in the yeah. north. It's the I'm siege. not sure what what to call it, but yes, that the thing he utterly oblit obliterates. Um, I think how it was just it Im Im implied that he did he did he did a crackdown and he um. But if decided... they're so good at hiding, how did he know that it was there? Well, it's just implied that he's a good military strategist, and it doesn't have to. No, the movie doesn't have to explain everything to you. That's it's very. Um, well, that's, okay, that's could, not you, what I'm asking ask, for. I know, so. but but the, I'm, I'm just telling you, it's it's implied that he he found out they were there, and he found uh, just because of as his strategic you know superiority wait, to wait, his what, brother. What the heck are we talking about? Sorry, I just kind of. Um, like, yeah. So this is this is when Fade takes over. And yes. he, the Northern Siege that contains the Lake of Souls or whatever they call that thing. Yeah. Uh, he, he, at one point, he takes a ship to it and just blows it the fuck up. I thought, yeah. I, th I, I thought that was the the one that uh, Raban actually went to and got slaughtered at. Wasn't Is that, that the same, same rocket? Yeah. Wasn't was that the same thing? That's what I thought. Where he it shot it with a bunch of missiles. Yeah. And I guess he just yeah. went back and just fucking nuked the place. I don't know. That's what I thought. I could be wrong, but that's, okay. that's what I thought. How yeah. did he find? How did they find that one? Remind me. I don't know. It, 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 it's just implied that they were doing military reconnaissance. Like, do they have to uh, show like a guy in a chair going, "I know where it is, uh, Captain." No, but, if, but if they can, the find, hey, but that's if they crazy. can find that with these, maybe they could find the people in the south with these. Uh, maybe, maybe the south is just more hidden, and it's and maybe they have it like anti sat. Well, I mean, how big is the planet? Um, you know, the same size on, it's the same size on both halves. I was right, but, like, but they have a big. But they, ha they, they have, have no satellites. The big temple. They have ships in orbit. You know, be, I know they're using to map the place. You can see that in their like reconnaissance ships or whatever you'd call that. Their HQ. They yeah. have like maps of the place, but only with one half of it. Curiously enough. Right, but un underground civilization. I mean, you're, you're talking about the one door, right? The big door. I think well, that was yeah, the big, choice. The big, yeah. the big place that they go in the in the south, yes, is yeah. similarly hidden to the big place in the north that they find with ease. Well, I mean, it's that's how it is in the book, also, isn't it? They go south, and they're it's 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 more peaceful down there until later when when they in, in decide to invade it, and then their their son is killed. Isn't that the same well, thing in the book? It's like the South is supposed Sorry, to be. When you say more peaceful, yeah. I, so the, the reason that the South is more peaceful is because it's hidden by That's what the I mean. guild. Yeah. Yeah. Which I, we've already, I think we've established they don't mention that in this, which would have been what we were asking for is like just a little explanation of why, why they can find everything on the first, on the one half, but nothing on the second half. Right. It's just like some, yeah. Just Plus give, that they give think us no the, one's even there. Yeah. yeah. They just kind of ignore the fact that it's like, it's an uninhabitable. There's no there's no way that we could possibly figure out how to how to scope it out. Well, they think it's yeah. uninhabitable because they don't have access to all the satellite data. But with, right. you're, you're, which you're, is but you're yeah. getting that you you find that from the context in the book. We don't get that mentioned in the film. Right. Well, that's fair. I just I like I I think somebody can watch this and like just develop that theory on their own and it's it's not that theory specifically but the fact that they don't have like detailed satellite mapping in the south for some reason it's just it's it's like a thing that you can just be like oh okay that sort of makes sense and then like focus on like the other 99 percent of the movie it's one of those like well none, that, I mean, like, yeah, any people, of us, none of us are saying that yeah, it yeah, breaks the movie completely. completely we're just saying that's, that this is a if i know you we're recall, focusing we on this for too really long that's my point it. it's like it feels like you guys are saying this like breaks the movie but 
I mean, you've uh, run. Oh, I mean, if it's done, we already went down with this. <laughs> that would be your your first clue yeah. that we don't think it breaks the movie is that we. Okay, said okay, so it doesn't break the movie. movie. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Cool. we all. If you remember, we also. We're just really saying it, it is a problem. We all liked it. We're just saying it is a little <laughs> bit of a problem, and it could have been fixed with ease. Yeah, but then okay, yeah. <laughs> the Harkonnen, <laughs> the Harkonnen, but but it does lead into the fact that somebody. Do, so you don't think the Harkonnens are competent? So does that break the movie for you, or is that another? Just kind no, of okay. Like, um, I really like the movie. I think yeah, it's good it's like... overall. So nothing has broken the movie. Okay, okay. Yeah. I yeah. think that. The Harkonnen are incompetent, and it weakens the story. It would have been okay. better if they weren't incompetent. Gotcha. And I think I think it seems we all agree to some extent that some of their actions really reek of incompetence. Uh, yeah, at least the the uh, everyone but Fade Ralpha. <laughs> yeah, that guy come, that guy came in when he yeah, when he like comes Napoleon. in and starts <laughs> kicking everyone's shit, and I'm like, mm. okay. Yeah, That's that cool. Uh, where was this before? You know, and because it's not just that he's ruthless, he seems to be competent. You know, part of the problem is that um, uh, God, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep doing this. Dave Bautista's character, Raban, Raban, Raban. <laughs> he seems very stupid, but also by implication, Baron doesn't seem to be much smarter, at right. least in how he's handling the situation. But when Fade comes in, he's like. All right. Well, we know where their temple is somehow. We're just gonna go blow that up, and then that'll make them scared and leave yeah. the north completely. <laughs> and it's like that's smart. You probably should have done that a long time ago. Now, I would I would like to also point out that the you're saying so. This is a good point that you're raising here. That like it, Raban being kind of. Um, Raban is a brute, right? That's kind of his thing. Is like brute strength, uh, muscle, mm -hmm. the bull in a china shop kind of strategy, right? Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure that in, excuse me, that the way it goes in the in the book is that the Baron picks Raban because he knows it's going to cause problems, and that way when he then brings mm -hmm. Fade in, Fade will seem like, yeah. you know, a, a relief in comparison. So that that will win over the people in the city to like to the Harkonnen, or at least that's what he thinks will happen. Uh, okay. uh, which is um, a conspiracy yeah. that is like that gives him a little bit more of like a chess player feel, you know, like he's oh, doing. So, so the idea in the book is we have like one super evil guy that actually starts just killing everybody, and then Roth is actually the one that's a bit more reasonable. Or looks yeah, that's like he's the more that's reasonable. the Baron's idea is that he'll oh, look reasonable by comparison when he comes in. That is yeah, but, yeah. better. Yeah, it's different, obviously, and I don't mind the change, but they needed to do a little better to make. Make also, them less competent. Funny thing I remember just now. Apparently, uh, Batista, I don't know, it was an interview or a tweet. I, I heard somewhere, maybe I watched a stream where someone was talking about it. And apparently, he said he's happy he doesn't have to play another character where he just yells a lot. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's sad. <laughs> knock at the Cabin. I mean, he was really good in Knock at the Cabin, a very subtle performance. Yeah, he's the only good part of that movie, in my opinion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah, we talked about that. Um, we sure did. I don't know. I thought Ron was good too. I liked him. Yeah, but he was dead uh, so Harry fast. Po Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's good. Um, I like him. I like him. We jumped ahead. I want to rewind back to the scene where he gets his name because I don't yeah. like that scene. Uh, um, also, somewhere before that, uh, Jessica drinks the worm piss or something. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so she she be uh, she is invited to become the new reverend mother she doesn't know exactly what that will entail because it differs on every planet she says and so she doesn't really have a choice because it's either that or we throw you out into the desert and you die so she decides to do it um but we're kind of cutting back and forth between inside the ceremony where she has been given being given the water of life which is a liquid of some kind that comes from the worm the sandworm and um the old reverend mother is there she's a very very frail old woman she's got the blue eyes and all that fun stuff and they're giving her the water of life it's a very neon blue liquid in a vessel of some glass vessel outside paul is hanging out with the other fremen we and this is where we learn that zendaya and some of her friends are not believers in this whole prophecy nonsense. You just mentioned they that think... I find it fun that everybody just calls her Zendaya and not actually by the name in the movie. <laughs> like, funny. Zendaya, I, Zendaya is so funny. Chani Zendaya. Zendaya. It's, like, it's like, you know. I have a bad habit of just calling them by actors' names. Oh, yeah, I'm trying I, to get I, better I at it. Deal. 
I know, I know that. Well, it's hard to remember alien space names and shit. Yes. Yeah. Except Stilgar. Yeah, Zendaya, yes. <laughs> Stilgar. <laughs> yeah. We roll in Hollywood, okay? <laughs> Zendaya is more of an alien space name than Shawnee. That's really yeah. funny. Um, yes, uh, I, that's worth true. mentioning now because I remember seeing a comment to the effect that some people didn't think the acting from Zendaya was good. And I want to say that really? I thought the acting was good across the board. Yeah, I, I think so too. really, yeah. really yeah. liked the performances in this movie. Some stronger than others, perhaps, but I really think it was all quite good. Um, yeah. Zendaya didn't necessarily wow me the way a couple other people did, but she's good. I think she's good, and I don't necessarily agree that she was distractingly bad or anything of the no, sort. No, I think no. No, one no, of no. Denny Villeneuve's strengths as a director is getting good performances out of people, and I think it really shows in this movie. Everyone feels like they really care, and they're really trying hard to be to like elevate right. their performances and standing you know, to the side with shows. a gun. It's like, you better act your ass off, okay? It's like, okay. <laughs> oh, you. Um, well, he's doing yeah. what now Christopher Nolan does. He he does this a lot. Christopher Nolan and um, some other people, Tarantino, they get very famous people to be in their movies. And they do that so that you can have this like recognition of your... Well, Oppenheimer was helpful because all the weird names and like too many too many characters. But with Villeneuve, it's like, yeah, they, he can get anybody he wants. So he just gets really, really good actors. And, like, nobody's bad. Um, I can't even think. Like, even maybe the girl that Shani, Shani's friend was, like, kind of mid. I don't know. That's the only person I can Yeah, she's, eh, eh, you know, nothing crazy. Yeah. I didn't. But she doesn't have enough really... lines for me to be distracted by it, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. But right. Florence, uh, you said that she, she, uh, she uh, signed, she signed on. on. Oh, sorry. Whoa. That was what I heard myself. Mark, Florence, Mark, a little. Florence Pugh said that she, um, he, he approached her and was like, I'm so sorry. You don't have a very big part. I, I understand if you don't want to do it. And she was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> it's like you and you and uh, Cameron and Nolan are like the only people in the world that I would just do like literally anything for. Yeah. Uh, if you're, you know, if you're oh, ever don't want to say that in Hollywood, <laughs> right, be careful. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think in some cases, the actors would reach out to Denis. Like, yeah, I think Oscar sure. Isaac for the first one. He's like, I want to do Can something, do? like whatever role. Does, I'll, I'll be Dune. the fucking janitor in the back of the shot. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, it, and he's the want. best part of the movie. I just want to. Did, did yeah. that, I just want to hang out. Did that yeah. really happen? Did that? Did he? Did he say that? No, 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 no. I'm just. But he, oh, uh, Oscar oh, oh, oh. Isaac, did reach out to Denis, and so uh, Javier Bardem, I think, was another one. He okay. reached out. He's just like, I want to be a part of this. I think Javier actually suggested, like. Being the character that Denis had already intended him <laughs> to That's be. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. And he's just like, yeah, perfect, dude. Yeah, he's, wow. he's great. Um, so, uh, Chani says that they don't, this, her and her friends don't believe in the pro prophecy. They believe the prophecy is used to, in a sense, enslave people to make them wait for a messiah to come. And so they won't yeah. fight back themselves. That's her theory. Meanwhile, you have, uh, Stilgar and his sort of faction of this northern warrior group who very much believe in the prophecy mm -hmm. and yeah. um they they so part of the prophecy with the reverend mother the the Bene Gesserit is that she'll survive the poison so the water of life the juice of the worm the worm juice uh is a poison that will kill most people unless you have uh, I don't know, certain magical training. properties or the training, the, training, the yeah. Bene Gesserit training to survive it. So they're arguing. Um, meanwhile, uh, Jessica is having a the trip of a lifetime. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's, she's like seeing, I, one of the things she mentions is that when she takes the water of life, she will receive all the the wisdom and experience of like hundreds of generations or right. something. And yeah, so she'll experience yeah. all their sorrow at the same time. And so it's quite an overwhelming experience. And so she she goes on a little psychedelic trip. She yeah. sees, sees, I really, really like the sort of surreal, abstract, trip-like imagery that he uses in both of these movies. Yeah. I think it's really strong, very effective. Pretty good. Um, yeah. She oh, goes to old Jim Morrison. She rides the snake. But it's yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jason the um, dragon. The, the, the figurative sand dragon. And yep. um, yes, and then her she seizes basically on the ground. She's writhing on the ground and sweating and freaking the fuck out. Um, and we see these really cool shots of like a sort of viscous blue liquid and sort of invading her womb. Mm -hmm. uh, she's pregnant, by the way. We forgot to mention that. But that's all right. Pretty she's hunting. pregnant and she's got a little embryo that she talks to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
what? That's she starts like. talking. She starts yeah. talking to it after this. Is um, yeah. What she yeah. specifically said. She you. she's talking to me. That's the that's probably the important part. She thinks the uh, the okay. Because I thought talking to her. the water of no. life. She was talking to it, and now it talks back. Did I? Miss no, that? So, no, I don't remember her normal. talking to it. <laughs> it was nor. It was relatively normal before but so the thing is that the water of life infuses jessica with like you said all of the generational memory of all of the uh reverend mothers who came before her and the when she's writhing around the dying reverend mother has a line where she says what have we done she's pregnant uh mm -hmm. and that the reason is because the water of life then gives the fetus also all the memories yeah. and life yeah. experiences of all of the Reverend Mothers, which basically fully awakens her consciousness in the womb, and that's when she starts yeah. speaking. Oh. That's the kind of weird that I'm really into. I thought <laughs> yeah. that was, the, the sort of magical, spiritual side of Dune, I, I really yeah, like it. Right. It's the right kind of weird for me. I'm into it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's so, such a cool idea to have a sort of sage... Sorry. I was just gonna say she's a fetus with the intelligence and maturity of like a thousand year old being or something like that. It's yeah, pretty, yeah. yeah that's pretty weird. <laughs> it's, it's an abomination. It's an abomination. It's a freak of nature. And she calls herself a freak in the book too. She's like, I'm, I'm a freak. And and uh, she's like, No, well, you're not. Yeah. You're not a freak. And clearly, she's a freak. <laughs> I mean, I've heard her talk. So it's like, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, what a cool and useful thing for a society to have, to have this sort of overseer that, like, um, yeah. just understands a whole, like, everything that has happened throughout history, like, mm -hmm. all this collective knowledge and how useful that is, right? And yeah. Oracle, yeah. Cause, like, yeah. like, offsetting the chance that history is just going to repeat itself over and over. Right. Um, all, of, all the stuff they do in this movie with this sort of spiritual and, like, magical, like, ancient ritual sort of elements of this movie are very very strong they all feel very real and like kind of visceral and there's a part after she takes the water of life where she talks to paul she says something about how now you have to take the water of life and she says you'll experience the beauty and the horror and she's got this look on her face it's so good uh, rebecca ferguson great in this movie his look made me oh, yeah. giggle a little bit yeah. he was looking at her it's like okay <laughs> all right sure mom i'll do that yeah. Rebecca oh. is really good. She, Rebecca Ferguson is good in everything she's in, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Yeah. I think she's yeah, especially she strong in this because she makes quite a turn. Um, so she's always been a Bene Gesserit. That's you know very much clear in the first movie. She's always been kind of torn between her love of her husband and her son and like her, who she is as an individual woman, you might say, and her role as a sort of priestess of the Bene Gesserit. And they have a much more bird's eye view you could say of history and the sort of political machinations of this empire and so in this movie she kind of loses who she was originally to fully become um this reverend mother Bene Gesserit sister person mm -hmm. it's a really interesting thing because one of the things uh before we see the end result of this ceremony before we know whether she lives or dies Chani is talking uh to Paul and they're joking about how she's going to take the worm piss, and they're all laughing. Yeah. And Chani scolds them for laughing because she says he's about to lose her well, stop because laughing. she thinks the poison's going to kill her, right? Because right. it would kill most people. But right. it has a nice little double meaning, I think, especially as right. the story goes oh, on. Oh, yeah, that's true. I it's good stuff. A lot of, and the Benny Jets, another Benny Jesserit uh, thing where the Benny the Benny Jesserit have uh, what's it called the Missionado Projectiva, Projectiva or something where um they've they've that's part of the prophecy is like the reverend mother will um the mother the son of a reverend mother or something um is part of the prophecy and then uh drinking the water of life and not dying even though reverend mothers trained are trained to do this like biologically it's not part of any prophecy it's just their biological training right it's like mm -hmm. their um their tolerance mm -hmm. and the fremen don't really know this and also they don't quite and then paul told them Later in the, didn't he? Doesn't Paul just tell in them? In the like, scene, yeah. Oh yeah. In the scene, no, yeah. 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 no, she was, like, no, she, she was trained yeah. in this. So. And he just basically, I don't think he does that in the book or anything, but he um, he just admits their plan and like confirms what Shani was saying, basically. It's kind of yeah. interesting. Well, it's in, it is interesting because at this point he's very much not about the prophecy. You yeah. know, he doesn't want that for himself. 
and um, that she survives this. Po he says poison transfiguration or something of that sort. Transmutation. Yes. Yeah. Transmutation. Thank you. That's the word. Um, it's something they're trained to do. It's no miracle. But, yeah. you know, that doesn't really sway the opinion of Stilgar and his contemporaries. No. It's like, well, of course, the Reverend Mother would be trained in that. You know, that, that doesn't change anything for them. Yeah. It's a really interesting interplay uh, between the people who are skeptical of the prophecy and the people mm -hmm. who believe in it. They all kind of, they all, they all yeah. end up kind of following into it anyway. It's a really and, interesting yeah. and, fate, destiny sort of thing happening. Well, that's a, uh, sorry, yeah. go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, this is a pivotal scene for Shani because... So I've heard some people say that they, they, they don't buy her her uh, romance with with Paul in this movie, and I just disagree. I think her I think they have a lot of chemistry, and I think this scene. Oh, in I particular, do too. Yeah, like this this scene is like, oh, he's a, he's he's not an oppressor. He's like actually mm -hmm. here to help. Like he's a totally different kind of uh, oppressor. And she mm -hmm. says that, and like she's she's falls in love with him because he's like the genuine person. He's not actually manipulating anyone, even though he kind of is a little bit. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and, he, says, least, he, he yeah. says he doesn't want power. He wants to fight alongside them. And this is not something she's ever really experienced from an outworlder. Yeah. And so I totally believe their romance. I think it really, I really works. I do, yeah. Even, yeah. even yeah. in the yeah. first yeah. movie, she's extremely impressed by the fact that he survives his, his knife duel. Like she, yeah. she yeah. really thinks he's going to die. She's like, yeah, he's, he's a great fighter. Does he ever <laughs> tell her about his visions? Did he ever tell her about his visions of her? Because that's kind of a thing that he, probably would tell you would tell somebody you're in love with like mm. hey i had visions of you i don't think, think he does <laughs> hey, i don't think he does no. in the movie is that no. right away <laughs> so so is paul like a psychopath from the beginning but he just doesn't know it or is he because it because <laughs> if he so. had visions of her and she's like oh love at first sight but he's like actually not really yes, i've been having visions dreams. of you that's creepy, and it's if like, you don't okay. tell her that, <laughs> right? So if she's not aware of that, she's being manipulated. Right? No, it's and, creepy. If you do tell her that. that. You don't. Yeah. You don't tell. <laughs> you don't tell her. <laughs> right. So it's it's very deep. I can't remember what happens in the book. How that, how their relationship. Ex There's so much in the book. I don't remember even though well, like, skeptical she is. That might have been the end of their relationship if he said that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. the, so this is where some of the the more drastic changes start to come right. in. Is really re they right. revolve around Chani um, <laughs> because Chani is not like I think somebody I saw somebody in the chat say ask if she's an unbeliever in the prophecy. Um, we are we I think we already kind of addressed this. There are no yeah. real unbelievers in the Fremen world in the book, um, but Chani is actually. She, she's a Sayadana, Sayadina. I, she, she's an she's an adept of the of the of the religion, right? So she understands the process of like the water of life uh, and all of that kind of thing. Right. Um, so she's the daughter of kinds, yeah, yeah, yeah. The unbeliever uh, doesn't the unbeliever aspect doesn't play in the book so much. No, no. Um, but I do I do think it works in you know, yeah. in the movie the way that they have it. That particular point of that particular point of change doesn't really seem like like it. It doesn't do a total disservice to the movie. I would say it's no, an interesting choice. Yeah, but but it does make a big change. Some people hate that about this movie, but I I think you're right. I think in the context of Villeneuve's version of Dune, it makes total sense why somebody like somebody like there there, there might be like non-believers in a cult of like mostly believers that's just a thing that happens and if the I fact think, that yeah he's, yeah and they made it the work. main yeah the yeah. main okay. change the main reason that this change I, f I find the changes to chani's character so interesting is because he because of how much he clearly wanted to make dune messiah and because of what a specific role she plays in dune messiah i i struggle to see how the changes that he made here are going to align with where it where it ends up in the book so it seems almost like to me it seems like there's a rewrite like a big rewrite that needs mm -hmm. to be that needs to happen in order to make it work but we can hey, we can talk about that when we, when we get a little further in yeah. you know yeah for sure uh, but i could see like some people who are big messiah fans or big dune super fans i could i could see where they would be um disappointed with those changes a little bit just because sure. it is a uh it is a big shift 
there, there's I, a there's been like, seeing a fair amount of that talk mm -hmm. online like people just being like man i hated that because it changed so many things from the books and right, right. it's always going to be that though no, right no, with no, every no, movie yeah, adaptation. Yeah. Awesome. that's not like in the books though it's like yeah then go yeah. into books leave me alone <laughs> no, if they if they make that change and then don't change other things that are affected by how it was originally, right. you know, then that's yeah. when you start running into problems. But if they change this and then change everything that relates to it in a way that works on its own, no problem with it at all. And I just gotta say, gotta gotta, gotta disagree with the people in the chat saying they don't have chemistry together. I thought you know yeah. they worked quite well together on screen. So yeah. <laughs> someone in the chat says, I don't buy the chemistry, not because of Zendaya, but because that twink wouldn't go for a girl. That's so mean. <laughs> you mean <laughs> I don't know, man. He, I, was, he was holding... Didn't he, he pull Kendall Jenner? <laughs> <laughs> There's that. But also, I, I honestly, it's really quite incredible uh, what Timothy Chalamet pulls off between these two movies, just like how much he changes. It didn't really strike me until after I had seen the second movie, just like how intense of a role this is you know how much you have to do because he goes from you know a rather kind of timid frail sort of effeminate oh, kid yeah. to, like mm -hmm. when he finally puts on his like i'm the leader man voice later in this movie it hits really hard it's pretty good like, he's incredible yeah he brings yeah. the energy yeah he's good he I gets a lot impressed. of undeserved shit i feel like i I, mean, I know a lot of people calling him a twink and a wet <laughs> cigarette and what whatever <laughs> wet cigarette <laughs> i've never seen yeah. that one before that's amazing a wet cigarette type of oh, male man, but like everybody I, I think he's he like yeah he's i've never seen him give a bad performance i think he's quite no. good he's well kind of, you, you obviously uh, haven't seen wonka yeah no, that's terrible oh that, no i haven't seen that that's not that's a that's a mid performance from him. It's and the movie sucks ass, but they, but he's okay. He's not good or bad. He's just kind of there, in my opinion. It should have been J Jeremy really, Allen White. It should have been Bones. Like I, I don't think I've seen uh, Bone, Bones and All is incredible. That's probably still one of my favorite performance. Um, it's about cannibalism. Bones and All. It's a really good horror movie. Yeah, he's good in that. Um, and they call me call me by your name. But but DiCaprio got the same treatment, right? And so did Robert Pattinson. And everybody's you know makes fun of the pretty right. boys in Hollywood. It's just a thing that people do until they're like, oh, oh, this, oh, this person can act really well. Actually, it's like, have we not learned our lesson yet? <laughs> like, yeah. There's also, yeah. The there's also something yeah. thematically that really works about Paul being kind of right a little bit more effeminate. Um, yeah. And partly it's that like what what his character sort of represents is someone who is like a master of both worlds, right? He's a he's a warrior, but he also like has he's trained in the magic. Bene Gesserit yeah. art, which is legitimately just like purely women's magic, right? They're, they're, yeah. And so there's something yes. kind of androgynous in his character by design, uh, thematically, yeah. I would say. And I think it actually yeah. really works. He's and he was supposed to be a woman. Cat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, good stuff. Uh, yeah, he's sort of like an unassumed leader, and it, yeah, and then yeah. it's just like, oh shit! Like, but when he, he turns it on in this movie, yeah, he Tom, he Tom really Holland gets it. the same treatment too. Tom Holland was—I thought amazing. he was fantastic in No Way Home, especially that scene where oh, he, yeah. like him and him and Toby and um and Andrew are all together. I, yeah. Tom Holland's another really good young actor. Oh, yeah. like, it's yeah. a lot of shit. <laughs> just so we don't go on too much of a Holland tangent. Oh, yeah. right? <laughs> One thing I think Timothy <laughs> Chalamet needs a bit of credit for in this movie, too, is it seems like he was doing a lot of those action scenes. Like, I, I don't know if they were just doing a lot yeah. of clever cutting to stuntmen, but he, he seems like he put in work for this. And, and it yeah. wasn't just, hey, I'm a good actor, so I'm going to show up on set, deliver the lines while cry, and then leave. Right. Get my <laughs> man to do this fight. It's like, yeah. He was going to training sessions like they, these are pretty well choreographed scenes and the editing is not it's not spastic like you, you can you can right, tell right. what's going on in a yeah, whole lot yeah. of the, the up close fights especially the one-on-ones so yeah i think i don't know i think the guy deserves some credit for this movie like even <laughs> though he's just acting it's he went in he became an action star even though you know he's a bit twinky like yeah. bit <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's, he's, twinky. he's <laughs> um let's see what where were we what are we talking about? Well, I feel like it, we need to point out that they basically make the life of Brian joke. Yeah, the uh, he is the, I'm not uh, a messiah. He's like, I just no, want to fight the messiah. messiah. <laughs> and then they they cut, fight beside you. And yeah, they, and then they cut to talking to the other guys. I was like, oh, he's humble, like foretold. He's too humble to admit yeah. he's the messiah. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was wondering yeah, where I'd so heard that though. from before in the theater when I was when I saw that. Oh, you reminded I, immediately me. Immediately, yeah. I was like, "Oh, that's Life of Brian." 
Because yeah. he's like in this house, like, I'm not the messiah. Only the messiah wouldn't admit he's the messiah. He is the messiah. I fucking love that. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. Good stuff. I love that. Um, uh, just, I love just, Javier just, Bardem near the end where he's just like, uh, like he, Timothy does this thing that's impressive and he's just like, uh, fuck, what's the term again? He's just like, Lisa and Al Gaib. Like he's just. It's like he's yeah, fatigued by his own conviction. Like <laughs> yeah. he, it's like even he's tired of like saying it over and over. It's like at least on our game, okay? Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's just a little detail. I'm already mixed up about when these scenes happen chronologically, but the scene where he gets his name is a really stellar performance from Javier yeah, Bardem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. He gives him the name Usul, which means like the base of the pillar. It's relating to something about their mythos. It's not specified, but some figure in their mythos uh, is called the pillar or something of that effect. So he says, I see strength in you, so I shall call mm -hmm. you Usul. And everyone's like, Usul, 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 all sorts of fun stuff. And then he says, you need a warrior name and that you choose yourself. And at first, Paul's like not sure, and then he chooses the name of the little the little desert mouse yeah. that we Sam see. Muadib. Yeah, Muadib. And I love when everyone laughs, and then Stilgar says, "No, no, 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 no don't no. laugh. It's yes. a good name." <laughs> yeah. And he's and he's and you can see him like like no, 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 no. He he knows the ways of the desert, and as he's describing the sort of symbolism of Muadib. He says something about, like, Muadib we call the constellation that points to the North Star as well. And he goes, ah, yes. He's, like, realizing it as he's saying it. And you can see, the, like, the gears turning. And I don't know. It, it, the way he performs that scene is just incredible. Yeah, and cool. I feel like in terms of, like, themes and stuff like that and symbolism, I think this movie is fucking stellar. It's yeah. so good. And yeah. all these, I, I love the way these these are very... At least with Stilgar, these are very sort of symbolically minded people. And I feel like they're very, very well realized. They're very believable. This is how these people would think. These are the connections that they would make between different symbols that are part of their culture and all that. And it's just, oh, it's really effective. It's, well, it's well, a very yeah. good feeling of how a theocratic empire might be started. Well, it's, yes. And there are descendants in the book, and they're descendants from um, Sunni Muslims in Egypt. This is like not even really, I don't even know what book specifies this, but it doesn't really matter. But mm -hmm. um, the fact that that's how it is, like in the language too. Um, so, and then, you know, if you know anything about that, like the Sunni and Shiite sort of different, di differences and uh, conflicts and of their dogma, um, it, it makes sense. That's another thing that makes sense about why the north and the south in this version of the movie would be at odds with each other it's like well it it just kind of fits like that and i've heard people say that this is like a maga north versus south thing and it's just like that's the dumbest no. thing i've ever heard no, it's <laughs> not. It's, it's, that's so stupid I, that, that is the believe. worst thing bro it, it, i couldn't i was shocked when i had to actually like talk to somebody who believed that it was like very strange to me and then they said that like um, Harkonnen is Trump, and then all the I was just like, "Come oh, on, God. can you just okay. Yeah. Jesus?" Okay. Yeah, <laughs> you're into deep. You a need lot to of... get out. It's you like... need to stop. <laughs> you need to calm it's down. Like... Yeah, yeah. I, it, I call it critical. I call it um, critical woke theory because it's like critical <laughs> race theory, but it's the it's it's with like wearing a woke your woke goggles, and then everything looks woke, and then you yeah. take them off. It's like it's not. Uh, oh, yeah. I think yeah. the same, the inverse of that, I, there was an NPR review that said, I like, I couldn't help but think about current day Middle East conflicts when watching the movie. And it was a shame oh, it didn't God. have more prescient things to say about that. I'm like, oh, you God. fucking want Paul to say free Palestine? Like, what do you want? <laughs> this is so stupid. It's the yeah. same with the Helldivers discourse. There's like political yep. discourse about Helldivers. Yep. I've, I've seen this on Twitter. It's like, are you guys crazy? I'm just going yeah. to kill Helldivers some Helldivers stuff is even doing? brought light. Yeah, the Helldivers <laughs> stuff has even brought like Starship <laughs> Troopers back into the spotlight right like everybody's <laughs> shitting on starship troopers because of hell divers now like i'm yeah. sitting there i'm level 34 i'm a death captain it's like this is a palestine something i don't even know and it's like what is shut up I'm play video games <laughs> but, but, but that's what good sci-fi does it parallels well history repeats itself so like ukraine russia gaza israel uh you could just do a million of these you could but the that's not the point of the like the movie isn't doing one specific uh, uh, analysis of one specific region. It's just yeah. it's the conflict. It's the religious 
dogmatic fundamentalist <laughs> sort of conflict of false messiah is just like you know this happens all the time every religion it's has to, fundamentalists. It's speaking to things that are uh deeper or higher yes. depending on how you think about it that can be trickled down to political discourse but it's not yeah it, it doesn't reduce itself to a neat political <laughs> allegory no. it just happens to confirm your beliefs that you already have like that's like, not what's happening here it's and every like, religion political has... brain rot is just yeah, yeah, it. It. people's yeah. abilities to talk about movies on both I sides. I hate it. I hate I it so much. Someone in chat just wrote Harkon and Derangement Syndrome. <laughs> 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 like yeah. more people now than ever have politics brain. And like the the idea that you can't like if you tell a sci-fi story in a desert planet, people are immediately going to draw like you know right, Middle Eastern. <laughs> <laughs> well, a bunch of yeah, fundamentalists yeah. who live in caves and are like, <laughs> the, yeah, yeah. The, well, there I mean, must be a story about Muslims, right? Like that's just what they all do. <laughs> what the it drives me like this. because clearly, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, Arabic think... culture and Islamic beliefs are definitely part of what he's drawing on. For the Fremen, but they're not one-to-one -one Muslims. They differ in so many very remarkable ways, right? It doesn't right. work as an allegory because that's not what's happening here. He's just like, okay, these are people that live in the desert. Let's look at real people who live in the desert and draw inspiration from them. It's I really not Mark, more complicated. Mark was right. trying to say something, I think, right, Mark? Yeah, yeah. No, no, then my puppy started growling. But I, I was saying that I think that the analogy works a lot better if you you zoom out a layer and look at it more as kind of the way I brought it up before. It's the the formation of a theocratic empire. So it's yeah. it's, a, it's not necessarily a direct parallel to specific religions, even though I mean there are some obviously influences in like right, the culture right. of the Fremen and everything from our actual history. But for Hebrew, for most Hebrew, part, it's its own yeah, story yeah. and just being like, hey. What if a what if a leader is looked at as a direct representative of a god, and, yeah, and yeah. how could that go poorly if they become powerful? Yeah, and and the and the Kwisatz Haderach that's a that's a Hebrew like the um, Frank Herbert drew from all kinds of religions. You know the the Benny Gesserit or Jesuit priests. You know the they they use they speak like sort of Hebrew uh, dialect or language and. The Fremen are more like um, Middle Eastern, also some African influence that he, he talks about. But mm. um, but but the bottom line is um, every religion has fundamentalists. Um, Jew Judaism, they all do Christianity, but fundamentalism is kind of scary. So like that's the yeah. that's the whole point of the of the of the thing. It's like if you're defending, if you're like attacking the movie because of that, it's like what. Are you, I guess you're just saying like f based fundamentalism. Like, what are you saying exactly? Like, <laughs> let's go. Like, I, I guess that's what you, where you're at politically at not that point. But, but fundamentalism, not based. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Trump should have secretly casted as the emperor. That would have been so damn funny. <laughs> so <laughs> I went to Dune. Lots of sand was like, man, that's a lot of sand. <laughs> yeah, a lot of sand. Wow, that's okay, a lot, lot of sand. sand. Like, wow, that's a lot of sand. A lot of spice. A lot of spice, too. Paul, he's gay. <laughs> <laughs> he's gay. We got to close yeah. that border, okay? We got to close the border. No more Fremen <laughs> passing through here. Okay. <laughs> It's funny. Like, um, I love I love Trump's humor. Trump's humor is never ending. Yeah. The spice is clearly fentanyl. You just gotta look at it the right way. Um, <laughs> yeah. <that's cool. laughs> um, oh my god. Where the fuck were right we? Right to right to jail, Vladimir. Right to jail. <laughs> Dune two. Um, <laughs> where were we? I'm so lost already. We are talking about uh, the scene after the names. After we were the, the name scene. Okay. The name. We got the name scene, yeah. and then um, crap. I don't remember. Oh, okay. Yes. In the name scene, he says something that I thought was interesting that I wish was developed a bit more. He says oh. that you guys have been fighting the Harkonnen for decades. My family has been fighting the Harkonnens for centuries or whatever. He's a millennia even. I don't even remember. Mm -hmm. A long time. He's a centuries, I think. Yeah, a long time. Doesn't matter. And, lots and, lots, and he's lots like, of years. I know how they think, what their mindset is. I will help you fight them. And I was like, oh, that's cool. The thing I would have liked to see more of as a result of that, maybe we'll get more of it in the next movie, but at least in this movie, their plan and their strategy just seem to be the exact same. Uh, we attack their spice ships and do the same thing and kind of mow through them. Um, it, would have, it would have been interesting to see maybe how what knowledge he has of the Harkonnens that could have helped in this specific movie. Mm. Maybe we get a little bit at the final battle, maybe. Um, but... 
I like the idea of that a lot. I wish I would have seen more of it. Then we, I believe it's at this point we get a montage of them just kind of plowing through the Harkonnens. It's um, like one or two scenes where they destroy some of these uh, balloon thingies. They look like balloons to me. They yeah, they're, they're yeah, bringing the, the spice. The ships, the, the drop ships mining. that bring the harvest. Oh, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, they can destroy yeah, a couple um, of those. Uh, this is where, where the one scene them. is where I was confused that they killed him without destroying the the thopters first. Because they made such a big yeah. deal oh, in the yeah. first scene, but then they just do it without. That kind of confused yeah. me. Not a big deal. This but is, I was like, huh? Yeah, I think, honestly, you could probably cut these scenes and improve it because these are a couple of the examples of them just kind of mowing through the Harkonnen. And it's like, man, I really thought the Harkonnen were more formid formidable than this, but that's okay. Um, it's not the end of the world, but I, I, I would think have we liked... need an extended cut. I, I, I like the problem, the Lord of the Rings movies. I can't watch without the extended cut. I just, I don't feel like doing like it. Rated, I mean, please. Um, <laughs> I, I just think with, with Dune, it would have been too much for too much to do that for a, a theater experience, like three and a half hours IMAX. No, oh, but, <laughs> but like, so I, I understand, I totally, I totally understand, understand why. Oh, well, I, he, why he cut all of all that out. But like definitely for DVD, he's kind of a dumbass because he said he doesn't like adding. He's not adding any deleted scenes. He's cutting them out. He's not sharing it with anybody. Aww. Like even, Ooh. um, I, even uh, no, Gurney like Halleck that. has a has a Gurney Halleck has a, uh, like a Basilette scene or whatever where he plays that instrument and they cut that out. It's like fuck. I want to see it. You know. <laughs> yeah. Damn it. <laughs> yeah, I have. I I kind of have mixed feelings about deleted scenes and extended cuts. Um, I I. You know, obviously, the extended editions of the Lord of the Rings are probably the shining example here. But right. if 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 you feel like the director, sorry, not the director's cut, the theatrical cut is the movie you wanted to make. I don't even like seeing deleted scenes. Really, uh -huh. uh, usually, if I ever watch deleted scenes, it's like, oh, I understand why that was cut. Actually, I you know, I, I kind of like the the theatrical version being the definitive version, barring some sort of either studio interference or like well, blade, technical blade limitations. Runner? When it shifts the rating, though, like if, if you have a PG-13 theatrical release and there's like an unrated version on DVD or like, I mean, that's oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. DVD, um, then it, I find it it generally can imp improve a movie depending on the genre, in particular with horror movies and comedies, I find, because they, yeah, they do yeah, often yeah, cut some of the best jokes. In, I like it when there's horror. one definitive version. I get annoyed when there's... Yeah. <laughs> bunch of versions i like it when there's there's one thing and this is it everything not in it wasn't meant to be in it boom here's here's the well, the studio the fucks the studio messes with i, I don't know can I, say, I, can I say the f word on the stream i don't remember some streams are <laughs> allowed no. to there's a lot of but, uh, words i would like to say you shut the fuck up <laughs> <laughs> okay the studio will fuck with your sis with, with, with your shit like um weinstein okay. tried to with with snowpiercer and bong joon ho and he like tricked him out of it but like um with uh being there was another was Weinstein yeah also. yeah but like they, they did it with Blade Runner they Blade did it Blade with Blade. Ridley Scott had to do a director's cut and a final cut and those are the better I didn't like the theatrical cut of Blade Runner but I understand what you're there saying are exceptions I just in yeah. general I like I if in a perfect world there's one definitive version of the movie that's yeah. that's just how I would like it to be. That's it, just it's personal preference. It's thing to be going into a movie expecting it to be the beta version of the the actual film, right? Oh like yeah, like Rebel Moon. Really yeah, oh, there's no, no alpha oh, version of no. Rebel Moon. Stop. No. <laughs> I just I I, I hate yeah, the culture awesome. that is especially developing as a result of Zack Snyder, where it's like, oh, here's the movie. Oh, but an even better one that I'll. But it's actually what I wanted to show. It's embarrassing. Be coming later, and it's like, okay, well, just fucking make that one. The promoting of that yeah, movie make, was so yeah, weird. No. Like, we have this movie. That's not the real version, though. Also, there's a video game. Also, a month <laughs> later, there's a longer version that's R-rated. Yeah. That's the real one. It's a different movie, actually. I was like, "What is happening? What are you? What are you saying?" <laughs> I don't know what you want from me. Yeah. Anyway, I want to see the it. Madam Web cut, extended cut. <laughs> I don't want to see any cuts of <laughs> Madam Web ever again. <laughs> what a piece of shit. We're good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I don't know if there is like significant extra material that he cut that that, that they filmed rather that was there's, cut there yeah there's stuff from the mentats and gurney halleck that were cut that, that that's all i know about but i'm oh, sure there's more yeah mm. like thufir thufir howat i think has some cut uh some cut cut footage with fade, I was fade Ralpha. Was. yeah so him and him and fade have like a conversation that he that he cut out of the movie um mm. so 
Yeah. I don't know what else he cut. Probably Interesting. other stuff. Yes. So we see the montage. He's sort of ingratiating himself with the Fremen, earning their respect. He has a name now. Uh, eventually, he has a scene at night where he wakes up from a bad dream. Um, he is envisioning himself walking through the desert following a woman. It's not clear who it is yet. And there are people starving. They look like, you know, like the burnt mm. bodies of, you know, <laughs> Hiroshima that show up in Oppenheimer but they're crawling along the ground and they're dying and he says he says to Chani that like my dreams uh lead me to a path of war and destruction and she says like you've look you've been ha you've been having a little too much spice you know it has an effect on your dreams don't maybe take it so seriously um <laughs> it sounds like he he ate uh, uh, like the wrong food wrong before food. he went to sleep <laughs> almost like yeah. you shouldn't yeah. have had that pepperoni pizza for bad you get nightmares <laughs> well that, Bro, man, that's I, i'm funny. telling you mixing kimchi and spam <laughs> that'll give you i think that's good though that's good writing that's what she would say and imagine if he told that to stilgar it would be a completely different response he would like yeah you know what yeah, i mean yeah. so she's trying to pull him back away mm. from the fundamentalism and that's why he falls in love with her because he he realizes that she's the best person to be around for him um because otherwise he will just fully embrace this like god emperor like you know yeah that's it's such a great relationship i love what they did with her character in the movie i it's think really it's really good cool. i think at one point yeah. sorry, i'm sorry to interrupt you but i totally no, you're, agree. that's all i, I have to say <laughs> shani says some uh he says something about how he'll always love her as long as he breathes, and she says yeah. something that like she'll always love him as long as he stays who he is, right? Yeah. And so yeah. that's a big that's a big thing that happens in this movie. It's a question yeah. of like whether Paul is even the same person anymore at, after a certain point. But yes, I really like that conflict, and if it's not like that in the book, I think it it you know depending on what how it results. Yeah. The consequences it has later in the story, I like the change to have it be that Chani like doesn't believe in the prophecy and just wants him to be someone yeah. who works alongside them and becomes one of them, not mm -hmm. someone who leads them as a messiah and has plans, like uh, galactic plans, I guess you would say. Um, well, well, that's a valid... You said you didn't read the book, right? I have not, no. Okay, so that's a valid take, and it's like important that we don't become book snobs and be like, oh, anybody who has not read the book, clearly Shawnee's better in the book. No, it's perfectly fine for somebody to, to like this interpretation. Like, I prefer Dr. Malcolm in the Jurassic Park movie over the character in the book. So it's like, you oh, know, I Frank Herbert, yeah. Frank Herbert yeah. is not God Emperor, okay? Frank, if you, hmm. you don't have, you're not forced to like everything in the book better than the movie. It's, it's, it's okay if you don't, you know? Um, I think, even, yeah. Someone, <laughs> someone in Metal's chat. Yeah. <laughs> and Paul whining about his spice dreams, bro. You should see my melatonin nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, taking, film, taking too many Benadryl before you go to bed. <laughs> anyway, film but, adaptations yeah, don't necessarily need to be right. a step down, right? I mean, like, right. some t there's yeah. that opportunity to improve on the material yeah. that's already there. After and if you don't want it's... to call it an improvement, that's fine. You can call it a lateral move. I think it's right. Good. Lateral. It, it creates sure, yeah. a lot of dramatic... Uh, interest in their relationship and i really really like the way they play her relationship to him as he slowly yeah. changes into the person he becomes by the end of the movie it's good mm -hmm. stuff yeah um, i i agree with you i just yeah. so the the thing that i want to like just want to bring up about that is that a lot of the ch like i think the change works especially yeah. in the movie i think it works for you know getting this story right. the way that it is it, to be told um it, it, the main reason why I find it so interesting, though, is that because that cha because of that change in her character, it almost it makes it, it it. I don't know how he's going to do the second one that he was clear like very invested in doing because it is so fundamentally different as to completely take the wind out of the second one's sails, and yeah, I mean it it is it is a very big shift, and it's not. You know, I've not, I've only read Dune and Dune Messiah. I was not a huge fan of Dune Messiah. I, I did not, uh, to quote Tolkien, uh, I, I disliked it with some intensity, but. <laughs> oh, so if, so if they change it, maybe if they change, if he changes it, maybe you'll like the movie version. Better. It, no, it's certainly, it's certainly possible. I just, um, I'm just, I'm, and this is more of a, a, a question of interest for me uh, of like, where is he going to take this? Mm -hmm. knowing that he wanted to tell that like for some reason the story in the second one spoke to him enough to 
included in his plans from the get go, but not enough to want to keep it, which is just I think it's, it's an interesting I think it's, thing. I think it's just Paul Paul's arc in, in general. It's not like I, I feel I feel like he likes that messiah mess, messianic uh, rise and fall or whatever you want to call yeah. it of, of that character. And he wants to just do that story and he doesn't necessarily care about preserving it every little detail of it it's just like for miss for messiah maybe it's just important to tell paul's story and whether or not shani is a hundred percent in support of him or like partially in support like he'll work that out at some point it's not like super we'll relevant see for him. we'll see because she is yeah. very tied to the plot yeah. in the second one the way that oh, okay i didn't written. know that yeah know she that. is that's that's why i'm bringing it up because she so okay I, i'll just bring up the like what the change is that yeah, kind of makes a uh makes a big difference the fremen are polygamists in the book which is completely removed okay. from from this one and in this one it's used to sort of drive some of the drama moving into the next chapter right um where it is not considered anywhere near as big of a deal in, the way it is in the book so she doesn't leave when he ends up taking the throne mm. that that doesn't happen Interesting. and <laughs> that changes quite a bit <laughs> yes oh oh, yeah. oh 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 hold on a minute hold on I'm holding. this is where i had i are you interpreting the ending to that movie as her leaving because i'm not she, I, I i don't interpret it that way i think it's open-ended i think she's i think she's just she's angry. just going for a ride uh, yeah going for a drive yes well she yes. doesn't go with him so i think she, yeah i would th i think well, call that leaving well, where where does he go at the end of the movie? He just he's just at the he doesn't go no, anywhere. He goes up in the ships, doesn't he? Yeah. Doesn't he? Does he, he stay yeah, on but, the? But isn't he, he just gonna do a like a like an orbital space battle and then come back and get her and then? No, they're starting the holy war with all the rest of the universe. Yeah, I don't think she's gonna be stuck on Arrakis. I I don't think that. I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't think they're gonna be separated. Maybe maybe you're right. I, I just think it's I an mean, open. -ended. Ultimately, I'm sure she'll come back, but she definitely yeah, yeah. left at the end of this movie. Yeah, she does not join with him the way that she would, or that she does in the way that yeah, you know, and the betrayal of him, you know, deciding to pick a different wife in order to legitimize his claim that, to the but throne. It, but also the betrayal of realizing that he doesn't just want to live among them. He wants he has yeah. he has bigger ambitions and of, of for power that he said he didn't originally. So it's both of those things combined. Yeah. What's interesting for context is uh, uh, when he gets to drink the flame juice himself. He also okay. says that she will come around eventually to understand, but I don't know in, yes. what, in what way. That means just like it's just gonna be on Arrakis and just be like, mm -hmm. oh, that's what he's doing, or is he like, oh, I'm into this, I'm gonna hang out with him later. I don't know. That kind of depends what happens next, I guess. But it's just uh, another bit of context. Yeah. For that see, thing. I didn't know in Messiah. We want. I've only read the first part of it. She's asking <clears throat> her him to have a child with Irulan. And, um... Because she's so yeah. I mean, I don't really want to go into the whole complex yeah. web of 4D chess that's getting played in Messiah because that's really <laughs> where it drove me up a wall while I was reading it. But um, basically, she she is begging him or asking him to have a child with Irulan with Florence Pugh because she is not conceiving a child. Even then, she and he needs an heir. He needs yeah. an heir mm. and Irulan in the in the whole thing is that Irulan is part of this giant conspiracy between the Bene Gesserit, the Spacing Guild, the Great Houses and some other faction, another faction called the Talaxu, who are like shape shifting alien human hybrid people uh, in order to convince like they have to manipulate this set of circumstances in a very specific way in order to make Paul give up the throne without being killing killed him. because they don't him. want him they do not want martyr. to martyr him and then they also don't want to give him or anybody else an excuse to you know to take all like okay. to completely re rewrite everything um but so the the main driving thing behind this is that they're going to prove to him that they can create clones that have memories of people that were cloned and then killed Chani or have like Chani's dead. So then they can use her, like use that to be like, Hey, we can make you a clone of her and you can go live in the desert by yourself, but you have to give up power. 
is basically the the crux of the conspiracy in the second one. And I don't know how that works My head hurts. moving forward from where <laughs> yeah. It, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, this is this is why that like You suddenly I, talked about a, clones of clones, it was like I'm out. <laughs> yeah, that yeah, this is where it starts to get like kind of this is, we're already starting to go like way deeper than you know, most regular people would want to in this kind of thing. Um and this is what annoyed me is like how the the Const, like every it's like kind of like the in the dark night with the joker where if you start thinking about it a little too much you're just like <laughs> okay but like really though like that he he planned for all of that to happen just exactly the way it did and like oh he's maybe just he's just like a really good improviser wow. like uh, you know, all that kind of stuff plans within so, plans yeah say in the book. yes plans within plans within plans uh, it's very 4d chess kind of thing but i don't know how they get to that in, the, the in this I mean, version of it, you know, with the with the, how they well, set maybe, it up, maybe they don't. I, I I didn't. Maybe the movie just wrapped up so quickly that I missed the part where they leave the planet to go on the holy war. Oh, they, I, they, I start, just board, it, they start boarding ships at the end and fly off. Stilgar is in there as well, so he. So there's definitely some people oh. leaving. I'm not sure if we see Paul I'm specifically sure go into it, a yeah. ship. I don't know if he, yeah. he's just going to make Iraq as a space of operations and just tells people what to do. Right. Uh, yeah. No idea. Oh, no, that's crazy. Yeah. Well, we won't see it for another five, six years, <laughs> so it yeah, doesn't really yeah. matter that much, to be Those honest. I think that. Years. Yeah, I think. Yeah, this, it's just it. Yeah. It's just a change that I like, especially it if people are particular. Yeah. It impacts things pretty heavily, and people who have been very attached to the way that the books go, mm. wanting to see that adapted onto the screen seeing this change that fundamentally changes quite a lot of it um it, like i you know that's a yeah. that's kind of a big deal and it, it it seems small at the at the time when you're watching it but the more i like the more i think about it and the more that we're talking about it here the more i'm like oh actually this is kind of like being becoming almost a completely different story in a lot of ways so I, i'm interested to see where it goes again i was not a huge fan of dune messiah I've heard that it gets uh, better in the next couple, but um, that that you know, we'll see. We'll see where that goes. Yeah, maybe I'll need to check those books out. That sounds fucking crazy, but fun. It, it is. <laughs> it is bananas. Yeah. I will say these movies have made me want to check out the books, at least the first one. Um, yeah. Question then about the books, because my understanding is that the first book ends basically here, obviously with some some big changes and mm. other context. Does does the first book end conclusively? Because I'll tell you, uh, one thing to notice about no. these movies, I think, is that so far none of them have hyper conclusive endings like some trilogies might. These all feel to me not in a bad way, but very much like two so far two feature length episodes of television. Yeah, um, I, I remember when when I finished the first one for the first time, I was like, oh, I thought we were still doing a thing before we wrap up. <laughs> but yeah, then well, it's, it's kind of. First it's, one is a prologue, really. It's not. It's a. It's. It's well, like definitely the first act. It's the first act yeah. Yeah. But it doesn't um, have like a very good climax to me. It. It doesn't really. It just yeah. sort of ends. Yeah, because they, they, they have the fight. Weird. He wins, and then well, we're we going to the thing now. Anyway, end of movie. I was like, oh. I know, but like, okay. if if you compare that to Kill Bill Volume One, for example, that's mm. a that's a definitive story structure for a movie, in my opinion, because yeah, yeah. the fight the fight at the end of that movie is a boss fight like it's a it's an mm -hmm. epic rivalry battle and mm -hmm. paul's battle with Jameis is like kind of just like oh i have to kill this guy now like what the oh, fuck yeah, yeah. and I, then I, like i completely agree with and you. then it's just I agree yeah, yeah yeah it's just like yeah so that's why like kill bill one is my favorite i talk about it all the time but i think kill bill volume one is a standalone even though it ends with a little bit of a does she know her daughter's still alive like it's a really cool ending mm -hmm. but like it's st it's a standalone great movie and then yeah. Dune, um, especially after watching part two, part one just feels like a prologue. <laughs> like I can't even. I think that I was know, my conclusion man. when I talked I, about it back then. I was like, yeah. I feel that I can't because I was like, I can't really rate this very well because I feel like there's so much more that I need for context to actually understand <laughs> what, what is even going yeah. on now. I but, agree. Yeah. I think I think especially after the first one, it's like okay, I liked that, but I'm very curious where it goes. Yeah. I think two has a more definitive ending than one. So if that's something that bothered you about the first one, I think it's definitely better here. But still, still yeah, the story, the story isn't leave. over. No, like no, as no, far no. as I'm concerned, this is not the end of the story at all. Does the end of the first book feel like the end of a story? 
the way I remember it, yes. Um, I, I feel like you can read the first novel and not go to any of the others, and you can come away with a pretty solid story in general. I don't think that there's anything that necessitates going to Messiah, you know, or moving on to the rest of the yeah. books. Um, Messiah I, yeah. does feel like a good... So, yeah, obviously, Dune is a very hero's journey type story, right? But Messiah feels like a good... And idea-wise, it feels like a good way of kind of taking that and turning Paul from, you know, Jason and uh, with the Golden Fleece into King Minos, who, you know, does the hero's journey, but then doesn't, you know, like he he's struggling with ruling after he brings the knowledge back, right? Yeah. The idea there is good. It's just that the execution is a, and most people who it really enjoy the first one, from what I could find on the internet anyway, from when I was reading it, they tend to enjoy the first one, and then come to the second one and feel like it, it's feel like it's it's done something a little maybe like dirty to the character, and it yeah. usually tends to bring it usually tends to be divide people from what I can tell. Um, it was it apparently always intended to be that Messiah would be the end of it, but uh, he then kept like. A lot of people also say that Messiah was meant to be a bridge chapter between one and three. Yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, uh, well, it's the, the book ends like this movie pretty much, except the last like ambiguous shot of like the the open. I think it's open ended, but like where the hell? What the hell is Shani doing in the desert? But like, um, other than that, the book ends abruptly. Like the it. I don't know. Frank Herbert's not very good at writing like conflict i don't think it like the battle is like like half a page or something like do you remember Everything, this in the book? all the fights happen off screen in the book yeah it's all it just, like people yeah. talking in rooms you know which is <laughs> a bit of an it's a bit of an off-putting thing especially yeah. like and i think this movie does a really good job of showing you the fights but definitely. frank herbert definitely did not include that at all <laughs> No. So just like fight, George Lucas yeah. writing they fight in the Star Wars scripts. <laughs> they fight. We'll do the storyboards later. Fuck it. We'll do it live. <laughs> uh, yeah. I guess my, <laughs> my, rhymes. my main question was uh, if, because this doesn't feel like the end of the story at all, because I was wondering if the book has that same sort of vibe. Same, similar. It, feels, it feels like an end to me. I mean, when I read it, I felt like it was a completed story. It's now, satisfying. But it's not do, yeah. do, it, not like this. This, it, this does not yeah. end on that. Like it doesn't end the way this does with that. Like you know, what's going to happen next kind of thing. Right. I don't think the original one. Like, I guess I I could still see if like assuming he wasn't going to make Dune Messiah, I could see this ending in a way that's as satisfying, satisfying. as the, of the original so. Matrix film. Like you know, like if the Matrix never had any sequels. That would have still been a pretty good ending, and we just assume okay, Neo fucks everybody up. So I think that yeah, well, I think to the stars, if you never get anything else, you can just kind of assume okay, and he conquers the galaxy, crazy holy war, bad stuff happens. I would be yeah. pretty upset if we never got any more after this. This doesn't feel like the end for me. I this is not in the same way as the Matrix one does. Oh, don't this, get like, if, yeah. if this all we ever got, I would be like, no, this is not over. What do you mean? Like this is not the end of the story. I, well, I what about the eighty-four Dune? Yeah. Well, what, what I mean is, why I'd like to see more as well. Like I, I, I had a great time with both of the Villeneuve Dune movies so far, and I think Messiah. Like, when does it come out? I'll buy my ticket today. But at the same time, if Messiah is terrible, and then they do Children of Dune in two movies, and that's terrible. Yeah, with a different I, director. Yeah. I could see myself thinking, okay, maybe they should have just stopped at Dune Part Two, and yeah, maybe. But what about the 1984 Dune? Because that movie has, sort. I mean, it's well. I mean, it's what, like what, now what, he what, has what, god what, powers; what? he can make it rain. It's very like it, it, it introduces so many questions. But that's okay, people seem to be okay with that one. Uh, that's a whole yeah. other thing. And no, people are not okay with that. Like, no, uh, people oh. mostly are not okay with that one. <laughs> well, I know a lot of fans of that movie. What are you talking about? There's a lot the movie, of cult the classic. Fun. The movie. <laughs> Fun, but it, the movie yeah, fans are yeah. not Dune fans who are like, "Yeah, this was our adaptation." I know that for sure. It depends. I know a lot of, I know some Dune fans that love that version of the movie, but it, 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 yeah, I don't love it. I think it's okay. I think it's got problems, but I think it's beautiful. It's a really production design is insane. But yeah, I'm pretty <laughs> sure uh, Dune Three. I mean, it's not. I don't think it would be greenlit yet, but I know he wants to do it, didn't he? 
Yeah. Um, but but not immediately either. I think no. he wants to make like another movie or two like different oh, things okay. before he comes back to Dune because I think that makes sense. Be a bad idea. He's that tuned out. I think. I think it's like twenty something. It's something like seventeen or twenty years in between right. the first book and Messiah too. Oh. So that that makes a lot of sense that he would wait a little bit for Actors them to sort of get yeah. older. Yeah. Right. Yeah. A little bit. Ten years might be the time frame. Wait ten years and then make the next one. Hmm. Sure. And then, um, in the meantime, he wants to do Cleopatra, uh, and he wants to do Rendezvous with Rama, which is a sci-fi Arthur C. Clarke book, another really right. good sci-fi book. So. so anyway, back to the story. Um, <laughs> no. Fine. I, where, <laughs> fine. Okay. Off the story. Where do we, we were? Where we were just we at the up? point uh, where they've professed their love for each other. You know, right. I'll love you as long as I breathe, and as long as you, d you know, keep being you. Kid. <laughs> hey, it's a little better than that, but yes, that is. Nice. Um, I like the scene cool. when they're on the they're on the dune. Oh my god, they're on the dune. Oh, and, the planet. Uh, I'm gonna oh, dune. I'm gonna do. Um, there, <laughs> <they're, laughs> uh, she's asking him about if there's really like if water really falls from the sky on his planet and that sort of thing. I like that scene a lot. There's a couple good moments in there. Um, yeah. uh, there's one point where he says something to the effect of like, I, "I would really love to be equal to you." And these lines that are like they're good, and I can see you know they have good chemistry in that scene, and I I really believe them falling for each other in a sense also and it's sad you have to point this out today they have like a normal conversation like human beings that's pretty nice yes. yeah, yeah they listen yeah. to each other and respond to what there's person too many saying. movies and shows i've seen in the last couple of years where they feels like they're talking against a wall or speaking to a wall and then the other one talks yeah. to the other wall and then they edit it together together <laughs> <laughs> yeah they they respond to each other meaningfully yeah. like a story almost it's cool <laughs> what? Yeah. It's not uh, nuts. Let's see what. So, the, like, meanwhile, in here, uh, God, I can't do it. I can't remember this fucker's name. Dave Batista. Raban. 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 God damn it! I'm never gonna. I'm <laughs> yeah. never gonna get it right. So, um, he is not doing a good job of conquering the Fremen. The Fremen are destroying their ability to get spice. Yeah. Things are not going well. The Baron and is so. Angry. Bang, Baron is very angry. <laughs> we, very like angry. off screen, he kills a couple bitches, and then he's like, <laughs> "Rabba, get in here, you fuck! Get this shit right, or I'm gonna break your neck." That sort of thing. And so Rabba is getting increasingly uh, desperate here. Things are not going well for him. And I think somewhere in here is when he is looking for the Fremen. He's hunting them, and like the sun is setting. And he's tracking them. They have a mentat, I assume, with a weird mask on. Mm -hmm. Is that who that is? Q, help me out. No, that's not a mentat. No. That, that's oh, that's okay. just a pilot, basically. Yeah, the mentats, the mentats them. do not show up at all in this movie, oh, okay. which is another well, thing that I think people who were fans of the, like, were a little disappointed by. I mean, like, okay. you would be I forgiven for, sure. real, yeah. for sure not realizing. Tracking them. Yeah, um, well, and... and you would be forgiven for not realizing this, but uh, Stuart from Devs is actually alive. So that like he survives Wait. the night of the Atreides, the crystal in the book the or in the yeah in the book he is alive. Oh, I I don't know if they'll keep him alive then because he seems to be very much dead. He's, yeah, he's movie. completely uh, absent. So you know. Anywho, oh, chat made um, a good point, but this is the the Landsrad not, not rejecting Paul's claims at the end. That's the only thing that I have no idea why existed but i guess we can talk about that later but they they they, they said at the end of the movie that they, they rejected his uh, ascension basically which makes no sense mm -hmm. then why would he marry Irulan at that point yeah you know that's the only thing that like doesn't make any sense but maybe there's some explanation that i just missed i have to watch i it. don't there might be later but i like it doesn't yeah. happen in the book so that's a that's a change to sort of make sure that the holy war happens oh, while, so where we can the see books, it they like all right you're the boss now Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because he marries the emperor's daughter, and he has nukes pointed at all the spice that make interstellar travels uh, yeah. possible. So, like, hmm. they they can't say no. They have they to have say no yes. Yeah. So that's why they that's why they join forces in the second one with all the other factions well, to try to get him off the throne without killing him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah, was, someone it, has mentioned in chat that the Baron, uh, they say, at least based on the books, the Baron should not have been angry. He planned on Raban being ham fisted because he wanted Fade to come over, to take over and uh, look like a hero to them. Yeah, that's very much not in this movie. In this movie, um, he brings in Fade, among other reasons, um, to do what uh, Raban could not do because he has failed him and embarrassed and humiliated their family. Um, very much humiliation in defeat is something that they really, really don't like. It makes them very angry, as was mentioned. Um, that, that, that'll actually play a little bit into Fade's character. Um, <clears throat> they talk about when they talk about him later, humiliation, something he does not like very much. Um, so then this is probably my least favorite scene in the movie when Raban and his Harkonnen soldiers trying to hunt the Fremen, they they lose them, they're tracking them somehow, and they lose them around this big giant rock. And so Raban says, fucking shoot, a, shoot them a whole bunch. <laughs> <laughs> shoot them a whole bunch. Big explosions, creates this big cloud of dust and sand and rock. And then they go walking into that blind, like, where are you guys? Come out with your hands up. And then they just get picked off one by one by Fremen who are just hiding in the sand as they are wont to do. Uh, and they get killed so easily. It's insane. It's just like, oop, someone jumps up, slashes once, they're dead now. But they shoot um, one of like, themselves as well. Because the, the one Yeah, they shoot one of them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was kind of dumb. One. I mean, that yeah. can happen, you know, yeah, I guess yeah. in the fog of war. But it's just, they get obliterated here, man. It's wild. And so then uh, when... Uh, Muadib, when when Paul shows up and he has all the other soldiers with them, they retreat, they go cowering, and they run back onto their ships. It's just a total and utter defeat for the Harkonnens because yeah. they did something very, very stupid. So, like, shooting, the, they don't even wait for the dust to settle so they can actually see what's happening. They yeah. just go waltzing into this cloud of dust and dirt that they've made themselves walking around <laughs> blind and they just get picked off one by one they're like oh what are we doing and then they run away yeah. it's i hate it it's probably <laughs> I, I, my I least favorite it, scene in the movie i think denis made you made it that way so that he could make the a action scene look really epic and i like that part of it but you're right like i don't know i'm willing to trade some like a dumb harkonnen dumb raban commander for mm -hmm incredible action scenes in the in the movie like I, i'll make um, that i, 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 I don't well that good, fundamentally yeah. disagree that it's a good action scene the dust makes oh, that, for that a one? cool visual the yeah, one that's i'm what describing I mean. no no i mean I, I meant the launching those missiles into the rock like that moment was so was one of the most iconic scenes of the whole movie in my opinion it was so epic like, uh, okay well here's um, what they could have done yeah. is they could have waited for the dust to settle which it does oh yeah afterwards before waltzing in their blind yeah, yeah I, I just think he, he liked the visual of them wandering through the yeah, sort that of too. fog yeah. and then they get picked off one by one, but it just makes them look so stupid and incompetent. Yeah. Really yeah. not a fan. Because I feel like they kind of did Dave Batista's character dirty as well. Like him being a hothead, I'm fine with. He's a hothead in the first movie. He's like, he's uh, in the first movie, if you remember, he's very mad that the emperor has taken away Arrakis and given it to... Um, Oh yeah, uh, trade yeah. yeah, and he does. He fails to see the greater machinations happening here. He's just like, why would they take it away from me? I'm so angry about it. Um, and in the end, he's yeah. a hothead, he, but like he's very stupid in this movie, and I think that's a shame. Uh, it makes the Harkonnens pretty stupid by implication, and and I didn't like that. This is not a very effective scene, in my opinion. They just kind of get they get cut through like butter. And it's very frustrating. And especially compared to the best stuff in the movie, this scene really sucks as far as I'm concerned. He felt that the Batista's character felt very like uh, a force in the first movie, like an angry guy, but somebody who's like a competent warrior. He's and intimidating. In the second sure. movie, yeah. 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 Like as soon as he like smashes that guy's head off the panel, I was just like, okay, he can be like blinded by his rage uh, to the point where like he He's came off as, like less, less scary <laughs> yeah. like less of a kill. yeah and then i yeah. mean and then he doesn't even put up a fight in the end although to be fair i mean yeah that's another part is like well that's a little underwhelming his even his send-off but yeah to be fair to, like i think i think gurney is a better fighter right if they, they didn't even fight in the book but like i don't think they did right 
it was they, a different. They, I mean, again, a lot of the fighting happens off screen, so we, we're yeah, not yeah, yeah. really like we don't know exactly what mm, goes down. Yeah. There's a lot of room for interpretation, right? You could have a pretty cool fight scene between the two of them. We know That's... Gurney's the better fighter because he wins. Yeah. We don't need it to be like a, a, a cakewalk for him. Right. It was so it. fast. I was like, what the fuck? He just got stabbed. Was, like, oh, that didn't bother me. As, that didn't bother me as much because I like Gurney and I have no problem yeah. believing he's more competent. It's just like when it comes to the strategy, he yeah. he has a ten digit, not ten digit. Like he has his. What am I two trying digit. to say? He's very dumb. Two. Yes, two digit IQ. A ten digit IQ. That's a yeah, lot. That would that's be a, a lot. That's a mentat. That's me. Yeah, exactly. hey, what is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> it yeah, kind of undercuts the tension of those yeah. scenes because the you know. The, the Fremen are just walking all yeah. over them. And it's like, I feel like that's not how it should be. They should be scrappy and just like winning by the skin of their teeth. I think that would have improved the movie. Um, that's fair. Yeah. Uh, what's next? What's next? Uh, somewhere in here, uh, now that he has his names and everything, Paul, the final step to truly becoming a Fremen is that he needs to ride the sandworm. Oh, yeah. He just ride the sandworm oh, first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We that's sort of, to that's the point where we're going. No, we're not going south yet. That's what happens the next five or six minutes. He's trying to get the worm and uh, succeeds. Succeed. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so first of all, uh, the, the setup to the scene is really nice. I like when oh, yeah. um, uh, Dilgar is telling him, oh, sorry, I need to rewind just because there's a line I really liked. This is earlier, part of their testing of him they they tell him you need to go out into the desert and spend a night there yourself and make it back you know and so while you're doing that you know you know watch out for sandworms and all that sort of stuff and you know be careful in the heat of the day but also <laughs> he's like is there anything else i should watch out for and he says yeah the centipedes they can be really nasty not the big ones but the little ones and when he says little ones he puts his hands out like three feet apart like <laughs> little one. that's such a good little joke i didn't, even, a great I didn't joke. even catch that that's funny oh that's, oh, that's big nice ones are harmless like why why are the big ones harmless <laughs> yeah, i really great. liked that say when he's like uh yeah look out for the little ones and you know be careful of the gin the desert spirits don't listen yeah. to them and then he like laughs like he's joking goes no but seriously they are, like, they are a problem yeah <laughs> <laughs> they are a problem that and he goes like boo yeah. and he goes no but seriously watch out for the gins there yeah <laughs> <laughs> It's good. I like that stuff a lot. Stilgar's very uh, charming character. So uh, anyway, go going back to the scene where he has to ride the sandworm, and he says, "Hey, nothing fancy, all right?" Because the uh, remind me the name of the worm spirit thing. Shai Halud. Shai Halud is like yeah, Shai Halud so. will decide whether you become a fremen, or whether you die. Good luck. <laughs> or whether <laughs> you die. Anyway, good luck. <laughs> yeah. And oh god, this whole sequence is incredible. It looks yeah, really cool. I, I love this one. I Pers love personally, it. I could have made with two minutes less or so. I don't know. No, you're wrong to feel that way. <laughs> yeah, wow. Your feelings wow. are invalid. Stream canceled. No. Banned. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's... I understand. I, I really like it. I think there's, there's something very triumphant about it. The music is certainly helping. Um, I saw it in like the Dolby screening at mm -hmm. AMC and like the whole theater was rumbling. It's great. Really cool stuff. And I like the way it plays. I like everyone's reaction. So everyone cheers when he finally accomplishes it, when he mm -hmm. finally rides the worm and he's using the little hooks to to steer it and all that sort of fun stuff. I really liked too, like the, the jokes from the sideline where they're like, uh, you know, don't embarrass us, call a big one. And then <laughs> yeah. it starts coming in and they're like, Jesus, not that not big. That big. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a grandfather worm. One of the biggest they've ever yeah. seen. I was like, Oh shit. Stakes are high. And so when he finally accomplishes it, when he's riding the worm and doing the thing, he's really become a Fremen at first they're cheering. And then they all start like bowing down to worship mm -hmm. and that makes Chani uncomfortable. It's a really interesting turn really we're really heading towards a change in how the fremen view him uh later we'll get a line when he's talking to gunny how he says like at first you know we were partners or allies you know but now they worship me and that's something that makes uh even paul uncomfortable at first yeah um it's a really interesting turn it's a great scene the music is really selling it i love the music in this movie but that's a big moment good stuff yeah. he's he's a real true fremen now because he's ridden the worm a little fremster I'm sure that's a right. euphemism for something. Sure. <laughs> I can't quite put my finger on it. 
So they, 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 they steer the, the, the big worms with those flaps. Uh, wait, I'm, sorry, I called them. Is his name not Gunny? What's his name? Gurney? No, wait. Gurney. No, Gurney. Gurney is the is the Gurney. the other guy. The sorry, Chinese Wolf. Guy. I, I misremembered Stilgar? his name. Are you talking about Stilgar? Gurney. No, I was talking about Gurney. I, I called him Gunny for some reason. Oh, okay. I'm just bad Gunny. at names. Continue. Uh oh oh yeah I'm just curious about how the actual mechanics work with controlling or steering the worm is there like specific flaps you have to <laughs> hook onto or is there multiple flaps you could use? Well, I, I, yeah, I, yeah, I understand how they how they do it. I'm just wondering why that works. Just there's there's a whole about like it. explanation <laughs> about it. They like they basically get hooks underneath the worm flaps and then the worms <laughs> try to avoid letting sand into that flap so that way oh, like, they'll okay. they'll write themselves to make sure that that's on the top and the sand is going beside them and that's how yeah. you you steer it. That's not made explicit, but I don't I feel think it like needs it's to be. totally yeah. No, I, I was just totally generally curious preferable. how they would explain it in the books. It's yeah. like a crazy, crazy, crazy big worm. I think that's a inferable from how you see the scene that, you know, they show the shots of the, like, the pores or whatever you want to call them. And so, like, when he pulls up on those to expose them, the worm goes up so that it doesn't get sand in them or something like that. Yeah, I think, it seems, I think it's it seems something. It's, that seems that seems right. I don't remember exactly, but I'm gonna I'm gonna say it is yeah, fact. No, I'm more asking <laughs> because I was not really looking into it too much. I, I understood the mechanics in general, but why it happens was just one something I was wondering about. That scene I thought was really thrilling. It felt like distilled <laughs> cinema, like that one. Like even just before the worm gets there, he's like waiting for it, and then like the big cloud of sand goes up and it's just like mm -hmm. slowly approaching the effects were so good i was laughing because i was like man if that was me i would like shit my pants if that, if i saw <laughs> yeah. that coming and at me you know? i love i love and, when he's like walking around like, just like okay 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 he sees it coming yeah. he's like oh, okay okay Ooh, okay he's like <laughs> yeah. hyping himself up yeah. to do it it's great it's, yeah. it, he's doing a great job and then when it actually gets there he sort of like falls into the crevice that's left mm -hmm. in the sand and it's just this like cacophony and of and whirlwind of like sand and you you feel like suffocated it feels suffocating to watch the like sound yeah. design is so good and like the way he's sort of like clinging on to the side like you you actually feel a sense of danger in that scene i think because it's so well done and then obviously it just the music crescendos and then it's like you know he's the one like it's just yeah. a it's great it's climax, climax too, as well, too as well. Yeah. Awesome experience in the theater. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, man. The sound, the kind of man. Stuff. Fuck yeah, it's so it's it's so very good. Triumphant. Looks really good. good. Stuff. Yeah, that's the cinema, baby. Good stuff. Yeah. So now he's a fremen. He's like a, he's he's a real one. Yay! He's a real. F and th then what happens? <laughs> Remind me. Uh, let's uh, see. We could always well, talk about the fight in the Colosseum, I guess, how we get there. Is that where oh, it goes next? Yeah. I mean there's different uh, there's different threads in the movie yeah. that we keep jumping around to I mean, one just of a, them. Just a short thing. We have like the a short scene with the daughter of the Emperor talking to the Reverend the, the yeah, boy Reverend was... Mother uh, on their planet. Okay, and right. She's basically oh your father cannot know that he might be still around or something. Uh, yeah. Well, let's let's back I up to the first so. time we see uh, Florence Pugh is, is with the Emperor. So Florence Pugh is the daughter of Emperor of the Emperor, played by Christopher Walken. Is the Emperor just called the Emperor? Or does he have a more specific name? I mean, we could the Padishah Shadam? Emperor Shaddam. Okay. Well, yeah. they don't. I don't remember that. Padishah so we'll Emperor Shaddam the Fourth or something like that. Shaddam the Fourth. That's right. Yeah. And um, what's his daughter's name? Irulan. Ir the Sorry, daughter yeah. of the emperor. Irulan. <laughs> Irulan. Yes. The daughter of the emperor. Yes. Yes. I, I don't think I'm Florence trying Slipier. to remember the names. I'm trying. I, I'm, I want to be. <laughs> I better. think I didn't work uh, on it. Write down her name in the movie at all. I just called her Pretty daughter. Of the you emperor don't hear it in my notes every time. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I, don't think I say it a bunch. Um, it's yeah, kind of funny. It's, it's just a bit of a tangent. Every time I make like notes for a movie for like a forge or something. Like, I, I keep writing down, like, something else for the particular. It's like, oh, this is the daughter of this or son of this. It's like, okay, maybe I should actually look up what's, what their name is. <laughs> and then, like, halfway through the notes, I start typing their name out. 
that's, um, a, that's, a, that's another yeah, awful so the first story time, that the nobody first time... about. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, don't know I actually did chuckle. <laughs> the first time we see her, uh, they're hearing, they're hearing the news. I believe, right, that the attack on the. Wait, what? What's? What are they being told then? The first time we see them, she's in the sort of like a conference, and the Bene Gesserit uh, priestess witch lady is there. And they're discussing what should be done about the Fremen. Is that what's happening? Like, uh... There's a new Fremen prophet, and right. he's okay. disrupting spice production, right. and Thank it's you. causing problems for everybody. Yes, and so they're discussing what they should do about it. And interestingly, the emperor asks his daughter what she thinks. And she says, mm-hmm. well, you know, uh, the faith, like, faith is a really strong component of like the fremen culture right so like you can't just kill the prophet because he becomes more powerful right like, uh as a martyr and so her idea very cunning is to like let war break out and then you be the one who comes and brings peace and then they'll see you as a savior and i'm like okay cool we're doing something where she's you know she's clearly this is very much made clear by the rest of the movie that she's being trained by the Bene Gesserit herself. I don't know if she's officially one of them. I don't quite she know is, how that is, works. The Reverend Mother says in that scene, like now you see why she was my like most astute yeah. student. She okay. studied directly I didn't know if, her. I didn't know if she was the equivalent of a grad student or whether she was like a full blown Bene Gesserit at this point. Um, pretty, yes. So pretty for for moving like pretty much everybody, every woman who is in a high born position. Like, uh, like the wife of a duke or, you know, anything like that is a Bene Gesserit in this world, basically. All of them? Pretty much, yeah. Okay. I think there, there's always one somewhere in every house. Okay. Like, it's it's an important yeah. thing. It's how they keep, how they power, keep power, basically. Yeah, it so we learn... Concubines. Yeah, we learn that she has been trained by the Bene Gesserits herself and that she is rather cunning in this. We're planting little hints that the emperor isn't really the one with power here. That's something that the movie plays around a lot with mm-hmm. that makes rather explicit, honestly, that the Bene Gesserit are the ones kind of behind the scenes shaping things or Pulling at least trying to shape and things. Yeah, and there's a lot I mean, of... all uh, kinds of crazy things. I mean, after we yes. see the whole Colosseum thing, it's like... Yeah, let him impregnate, impregnate me, no problem. As you ask. It's a girl, it's a by the way. I'm just like, whoa, these ladies are crazy. They can control that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, and so Jessica, really powerful... like, they mentioned it in the first one. Jessica was supposed to, Paul was supposed to be a girl. She was supposed to give birth to a girl, but she decided to create a male instead. Uh, because she wanted to him to be the, the chosen one. Lisa chosen... Hadarak, yeah. Yeah. Because the chosen one is a man with with that power, with those powers, right? Oh, right. He's yep. another chosen one with another name. Oh, God, he has like seven hundred titles. At the when we're yeah. this, yeah, <laughs> does. I want him to at the end of the last movie, whenever that's going to be. I just want him to. I am Paul Bennett Jesuit Lisa Al Paul Atreides Las Lisa Al Gaib Jesus Spaceman God Emperor God Emperor Quisat's Hatterack of you know this. Yeah. <laughs> One thing shit. that I didn't, I didn't love on the first on the first watch of Dune Part Two was the Emperor. I, I kind of wanted him to be uh, more imposing or whatever. But then on the second watch, I realized that it's very much intentional that he's kind of an old, he's an older guy. He's kind of and he's kind of more of a puppet than anything. He was chosen because he could be controlled and influenced. Mm-hmm. Once I understood that, I, I was like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm on board now. Yeah. But at first, I'm like, really? This is the Emperor? They kind of hyped him up in the last movie. Listen, I was but, just uh... sad I didn't get more Christopher walking on my screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I was what thinking the same thing because I, I saw some uh, critique of Christopher Walken's performance. Like, a lot of people just weren't satisfied and bring enough energy to it or whatever. But I wonder if that's just the character that he's just meant to be playing this bewildered old man who doesn't really have any real authority other than in title you know i think that's pretty accurate to the way it goes in the in the book cuz the book is, makes it very clear that it's more like the control of the empire is more a balance between the great houses the bene gesserit and the spicing guild and then the emperor is kind of just 
kind of just a figurehead or the space guild, not the spice and guild. The the emperor's kind of more of like a, a figurehead in between all of them who has like a really powerful army, but he like, so he kind of you know, he has that authoritative position, but everybody kind of like, and they you know nominally coattail to him but he has to take everybody else into consideration because there's a real concern in the first movie too that you know the great houses the emperor doesn't want to risk you know war between him and all the great houses who make up the council right the parliament Mm -hmm. of intergalactic uh, planets and he also doesn't want to risk upsetting the spacing guild. He doesn't want to risk anything with the Bene Gesserit. So like, there's there's that whole like push and pull between all of them. Um, he is presented more that way. So I think I think they did a pretty good job with this. I, I don't think yeah. that yeah. this this is I mean, yeah. I think when when there's so many moving parts and you're in charge of all, you I think you just become kind of numb to everything. Right. I just wanted to hear him say one time. We got to have more spice, baby. (laughs) (laughs) We got to get more spice. (laughs) We need (laughs) the spice. I would have been pretty entertained if that happened. (laughs) Have you seen Man on... Have anyone seen Man on Fire? uh, He's in that movie. uh, Man on Fire. Yeah. There's a a lot of my favorite relationship with that movie. I think it's botched in editing, but I actually still like it. Tony Scott, what are you going to do about it? But yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, He says says a line, uh, he goes, uh, Creasy's aunt is deaf, and he's about to paint his masterpiece. (laughs) I wanted him to say something like that. Like, Paul's aunt is deaf, and Paul's aunt is genocide, and he's about to paint his masterpiece. I would have loved it. He becomes super hitless. He didn't say anything like that, though. He didn't have any I, iconic lines or anything. He didn't ham it up. No, no it'd be, it would have been cool to have a scene with the kind of intensity, like in True Romance, where he sits down with. Uh, oh yeah. What's his name? Yeah. De- Dennis Hopper. Dennis Hopper. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ooh, chilling. So the we'll get more scenes. Well, let's just follow this through line for a bit. Uh, I've already forgotten her name. Daughter of the Emperor. Irulan. Ir- Princess Irulan. Yeah. Yep, that one. I'm not going to remember it, so I'm going to give up. Uh, <laughs> she's talking with the Bene Gesserit priest. Metal, you were saying something about those scenes, um, about what they talked about, right? Weren't you talking about that? I wanted to get back to what you were saying there. Uh, I forgot. You forgot where, where, where I was talking about. <clears throat> this, uh, you were when, talking this is about... when she asks about, like, what if Paul Atreides was still alive? And... Oh, yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you were talking about how she's trained and how they're more she's more competent than her father and all that stuff yeah Mm -hmm. he says something to the effect of you'd make a great empress Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. um yeah and so she's asking probing questions about what the bene gesserit's plans are here what if paul is still alive what does that mean you know Mm -hmm. all that sort of stuff i believe at this point in the story she does not yet know that the bene gesserit bene gesserit and the emperor signed off on the obliteration of atreides she knows it happened, but I believe she doesn't know. No, I think the, that's one of the, the next sort of scene after when she realizes yeah. that's happened. That's what happened. Yeah. Doesn't at the very beginning she say something about when my father learned about the death of the Atreides? He, like he loved the Duke like a son. Yeah, he basically didn't mm-hmm. do anything. She was uh, yeah. She was like, my dad's a bit sussy wussy right now, but I don't know yeah. what to do about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So she's 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 clever and cunning and she's kind of slowly putting the pieces together uh, that's one of the things i like about her character is that she seems pretty quick you know she's on top of it she <laughs> she's kind of piecing yeah. all the pieces of the puzzle together uh i suppose we could jump then to the gladiator scene in the introduction of another really great character in this well that I, th- I think we can use the segue because when she's talking to the bene Gesserit <laughs> priestess is when she um they they bring up fade Ralpha as another prospect as the you know Quisat Satarak. Like, yes. oh yeah, we have others. We have others and it could be him. Right. Oh, and uh Florence Pugh says like, but he's psychotic. It's like that yeah. doesn't matter as long as he's controllable. Controllable. Mm-hmm. Yes. Exactly. And so then, then Coliseum. Intro- we go to yes. G- yeah. Getty Prime, I think is what what's called, right? Mm-hmm. Getty mm-hmm. Getty Prime, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> they have pretty big, sick big, looking set. Yeah, the triangular black sun. Coliseum. Yes. So uh, okay. Uh, okay. What was, was the black sun? What was that, Mark? Black sun. Your, your move, Gladiator Two, because you know they're making a Gladiator sequel. 
This is are, pretty, yeah. yeah, they are. Oh yeah, uh, Hugh, Paul, tell Mes- me, Paul Mescal. Yeah, t- t- Hugh, tell me about the the Black Sun thing and why does it make everything in black and white? Because <laughs> it's cool, man. Because it's cool looking, yeah, man. Like cool. I don't know, I, I don't know what I to just tell didn't you. Know, like... I didn't know if there was a reasoning for it. <laughs> uh, yes, we go to a coliseum. It's kind of triangular shaped. You've probably seen this in one of one of the two streams trailer footage playing on screen. Um, it's all in black and white. I think it's last, actually shot in infrared, which is an interesting okay. detail. It kind of does different things to your pupils and the way like light hits things. Oh, I very cool. Didn't even know what my eyes were doing. I was like, whoa, that's a visual yes. experience I've probably and, never had I mean, before. <laughs> I don't know. No, no, I don't. No. I don't know if this is like a, is all that relevant, but there there is a black sun symbol. Uh, from Nazi Germany that Frank Herbert might have been drawing on when he decided to give this planet a black sun. Okay. I don't okay. like that seems accurate. I mean, it seems like it lines up, right? But uh, like, yeah. I don't know if that's, you know, 100 percent. But yeah. when we're first right. introduced to Fade, he's in like he's preparing for the big gladiator fight and uh, a servant comes and brings him his blade and he tests it on a couple unsuspecting servant women. Uh, and kills them instantly, then licks the blade or something. Yeah. And he says uh, it needs to be sharper. So if it's like, okay, no, he's right. a psychopath and he's cruel and he's brutal. Great. Um, he's our new antagonist in a sense. He's kind of like an anti Paul in a lot of ways. And <laughs> yeah. there's a lot of interesting parallels, especially the scene with his Bene Gesserit uh, witch lady. Leia Sadu, I didn't even think she was going to be in this movie either. She's good. Oh, Leia. What's her name again? How do you say Leia it? Sidhu. Leia Sidhu. Yeah, she was good in this too. It, it's stacked cast, this movie. And so, um, right before the battle, we see them drugging a couple slaves for him to fight, but they don't give the drug to one guy. And you're like, hmm, hmm. what's this the about? The last three uh, of the House Atreides, according to yes. them. Yes. Um, Baron shows up at the fight to oversee the whole thing. And they, uh, Leah Sadu's character and a couple other Bene Gesserits are there to look at their new prospect, mm-hmm. Fade, and to assess him and whether he will be a worthwhile prospect for them. So they're, they're here to see the fight. And one of the Bene Gesserits asks, it's like, this is rather dangerous to do with one of our main prospects to let him fight. And she says, oh, no, the fights are staged. It's all for show, which is what the drugging is. It's just a prank, but curious, bro. It's just a prank, bro. But Baron has secretly not given the drug to one of the slaves so that the fight can actually be a real fight for once. And so he can really prove uh, what he's worth, so to speak. And so the, the, the big moment happens. They, they release the slaves out to fight him. By the way, side note, there's these little... I don't even know what to call them. Also in the arena. Also in the arena. And eventually they kind of, kind of surround the fight to make sure... Like, Xenomorph looking like, motherfuckers. Yes. Those are yes. fucking scary. I love those. Those are great. The, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't even know how to describe this. How would you describe those? What, like, They're like Minotaur demon. thingies. Yeah. Like demon looking, demon horn Minotaur thingies. They've done it. You know, this is one of those. Yeah. They're also Sorry, keep like going. referees. They're, they're, they're the ones making sure that he wins, and he starts getting pissed off when <laughs> they enter the fight. Yeah, he He's goes like, like, no. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Um, and he's, so this so he's, is, he's enjoying his I just fight. Want, yeah, he's he's having a good time. I just wanted to like to point out that like I don't remember if those exist in the book. Um, and then I know for a fact that there's in the first one, uh, this like weird, I, I don't know how else to describe it, like a weird bondage spider thing that the the Baron keeps. Oh as a yeah, pet. that's in the in the first one. It just kind of in walks the first around. One. I was like, well, neither of those thing? two things are in the book. Um but I think they just like those are examples of changes where they like really they really add to the atmosphere of the whole yeah. thing where I'm just like, oh yeah, that's pretty neat. Like oh wow they've got these like weird tortured human centipede creations that they kind <laughs> of use for certain weird purposes. And like they've got these Minotaur things uh on the outside. Um just like lots of it's it's fun it adds a lot to the to the environment that they're doing you know especially yeah. with getty prime this is this particular set uh with the ink blot fireworks a couple people in the chats have mentioned already and like, yeah. all that stuff those look fantastic looks really <laughs> cool especially yeah. because it's at awesome. night when it's dark it's like uh well white ink and then at the at day it's like black ink it's like it's 
it's yeah, visually it's like very ne- impressive. negative. It's really it's like fucking negative, cool. Negative uh, photography. Yeah, exactly. And uh, somebody said it reminded them of uh, Final Fantasy X Blitzball, like <laughs> <laughs> celebration. <laughs> I don't know if you ever played it, but yeah, yeah. I, I love that, that. That that I wish there was a whole movie on that um, planet. Just to but, see what they're up to, yeah. But yeah, but they gave enough in the movie. It was like a long time on there. I didn't expect like, we we spent that long on on this planet. Yeah, any at all. Yeah, like but we were just kind of doing the thing. It's right, cool. and then and then um, L- Lady Margot, uh, Leah Sado's character was had a whole scene on that planet, and then yeah, I yeah. I, I think that this is really a, uh, like for anybody who's seen the I don't know if I can't uh, the 1984 Dune, you know the Lynch Dune. This kind of preserves a lot of the way that he did his set design, where things are very like almost like abstractly Abstract, tall, tall and large right yeah beyond the scope of normal of like what you would consider normal but and they keep it and it, it's really good it's really cool how they yeah. do that keep the and best the of it really otherworldly it looks very alien and in, mm-hmm. in a way where you can have humanoid people like people that effectively biologically look like humans although i mean the harkonnens have the no hair like shaved eyebrows thing going on but <laughs> And then still make them seem like they're almost another species, because like, what? Well, even their architecture is just bizarre. Oh, yeah. So you're, so you're telling me they're not uh, white, white supremacist skinheads, Mark? Are you telling me that that's not the analogy we're supposed to take away from the movie? I mean, that's what they're on as well, obviously. <laughs> a different yeah. planet. <laughs> I felt yeah. represented as a German. Represented. Yeah, right. <laughs> Let's go. with the black, the Nazi black sun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very, yeah. Oh, we have that here in Germany all the time. It's like, man, it's crazy. Yeah. When I go somewhere else, it's like color everywhere. It's like weird. <laughs> Do you live in Schindler's List? <laughs> it was crazy. The black sun that makes everything all infrared. Mm-hmm. Someone mentioned that beat in part one with the creature in the throne room, and I like that beat, and it makes me laugh like every time <laughs> I see like, it because oh, yeah. there's basically a line of dialogue where somebody's like, "What the fuck is that thing? Get it out of here!" <laughs> yeah. And then it just waddles out, and then it's like, like, "Okay, they say, they say on something with the like, scene. Our pet doesn't understand, and then she goes like, "Get out!" And then it starts leaving. It's like, "Yeah, it does. Yes, it does." <laughs> <laughs> So in the Colosseum, he dispatches with the uh, drugged slaves with ease. And then he comes to the other one expecting to dispatch him with ease. And he doesn't. And he's like, uh-oh. He, he gives a look to Baron up on the ledge. And Baron's like, happy birthday. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, this is my present to you. But Stellan Skarsgård, also great in this film. Uh, oh, yeah. And so he actually and has Austin a real... Butler. Oh, yeah, Austin Butler. Austin yeah, we're, we're, we'll get to more scenes where he gets to act even harder. But he's mm-hmm. very good in this as well. Um, So he has a real fight for once uh, with this last member of House Atreides. And uh, you can see him really enjoying the thrill of the actual fight, you know, that there's a little bit of danger to it. Um, There's a part where, like, the one guy's trying to stab him, but he can't quite get it through the shield. And the way he laughs in his face is really kind of maniacal. Mm. It's good. Good stuff. And then right as he kills him, he says something like, you fought well, Atreides. That will, yeah. that, that's going to be an important line later. So hang on to that one. After the fight, he meets with Baron. He says, Look, that last slave wasn't drugged. Were you trying to have me killed? And he's like, oh, this is a birthday present for you. You yeah. get to actually show him your, what you're worth. You're a he's hero like, I now. should kill you in that pool. And he, he says, like, ah, don't kill me. I have more for you. And he's, he's like, as a birthday present, he, he's giving him Arrakis. He's like, it'll be yours to control. Um, <laughs> and so, like, yep. you harvest the spice, make the spice fro- throw, make the spice flow freely, and I will make you emperor. And so, Fate is like, ooh, I like the sound of that. And so, he does. So he's well, no he longer asks, like, there. well, but how the fuck are you going to do that? That sounds insane. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I did think, though, that Fade was appropriately pissed off when he came in. Yeah. Like, he, yeah. He, yeah. He, he, was, he wasn't acting like, oh, okay, yeah, you gave me a treat. He, he was like, no, you fucking tried to kill me. I'm going to murder you. And, yeah. and then the Baron's response being like, yeah, I'm giving you a rackus, though, is the kind of thing that would stop him in his tracks. He's like, okay, maybe you were just testing me. Yeah, it's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of like, clearly he does this all the time and it's almost always for show. But when it comes time for an actual battle, he does kind of enjoy it. 
um, someone mentioned the part where one of the weird minotaur demon thing referees like throws something that's like the equivalent of what you'd stab into a bull yeah. in a bullfight to make it mad kind of thing. Like something he stabs into his shoulder and he yells at him to like get back, like stop interfering with my fight. So clearly he has a sense of sort of uh, honor or at least a sort of selfish yeah. desire to defeat him on his own. Uh, but yeah, but then when he when he goes to meet with the Baron, he's like, "Are you trying to kill me, you fuck?" And so, <laughs> so you get a little bit of both, right? Um, and so once he understands that the plan is going to be that he will go to Arrakis, and that if he does well there, he'll make him emperor. That is very intriguing to him. And then I believe he's wandering around at night, and he runs into Lady Margot. Is that right? Is that what happens next? Yep. Yeah. Yes. And oh, she... I just wanted to say before we get to that part that, that it was shot on an infrared camera. I just was reading yes. about this today. It yes. was infrared technology. And on site in Munich, too. <laughs> yeah. Well, does... Zero Dark 30 had, um, I think Rogue One also had some infrared camera trickery. But that's what yeah, Fraser so said. One, one yeah, of the things anyway. that infrared does is because... You know, so the infrared spectrum is, you know, on the other side of red, hence the name. So when you shoot infrared, you use the higher part of the spectrum and a little bit of the visible spectrum. What you lose yeah. are blues and the sort of blue, purple, green end of the light spectrum. Obviously, mm -hmm. this is black and white anyway, but what it does to the sky is that it makes the sky black because it doesn't pick up the blue. That's right, crazy. so that mm. so it does weird things like that. And so, like when and, you see the sky in these shots and they're black, it's it's kind of maybe the best way you could even go about trying to film a planet with a black sun. It's a really cool effect. Yeah, I really and like the, and it. The, and the fireworks were inverted too with the white yes. explosions. Yeah, ink blot the ink the ink blot white. It's, it's probably just black, right? And then mm. inverted. Yes. Yeah. Why not Pretty just shoot it normally stuff. and turn the saturation all the way down? LOL. Yeah. Why not just <laughs> Christopher <laughs> Nolan? Christopher <laughs> Nolan, that shit. <laughs> Doing all this extra no, it, work. What are you stupid? It, I think it is very cool to figure out like an in-camera process of sucking, sucking out yeah. you know, colors like that organically, yeah. and that that was that scene looked really cool. It made it looked right. made, made it look like freakish, like yes. the black and white on top of like the Minotaur black yeah. uniform people and HR and the fact that they people. i think they yeah. paint uh his teeth black yes, yes. Yeah, as no, well right. and so yeah. he looks like a creature it's like really weird yeah, yeah. yeah that was a really cool effect too with like the black teeth when he opens his mouth it's like oh god <laughs> what yeah what are you right. I don't like it. very uncanny. yeah um so then we what we have with lady Margot is kind of what you might call a darker version of the sequence in the first movie with Paul and the Bene Gesserit priest. Whereas Paul in the first movie has this scene with this sort of mater wise maternal, but kind of maybe sinister character who tests him with the box, the pain box and holds the little pinprick poison knife up to his neck mm -hmm. and tests him as a prospect for the Bene Gesserit. The, the equivalent scene with Fade in this movie is more of a seduction, um, which is interesting. I, I think the, the way the, yeah. the parallels the interplay, in yeah, yeah, really interesting stuff um, because he's the more he's more of like a snake psychopath type figure. Really interesting, um, and so she seduces him. And there's a, there's a really interesting thing it does where like every time we kind of like cut and turn a quarter, they've moved somewhere and we haven't really seen how they got there. It's almost like she's like hypnotizing him in a way. Yeah. He's, like being, he's, he's being controlled by the voice, right? Yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah. 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 Right. It's, it's, it even it's looks really confused, cool. Wait, like, wait, where am I? Also, I have never been here before. You're, you're wearing less clothes now. What happened? <laughs> what happened? But I like it. Do it again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Really yeah, it's cool how you can do shit like that just with editing and the infrequency of its use where it like mm -hmm. stands out like, oh, this is weird. What's going on? It's like disorienting. Yeah, it's good. I really like it. And so um, unless there was another interesting detail to point to there, eventually we see Lady Margot go back to to report to her Bene Gesserit boss and say, mm -hmm. everything went according to plan. He was good. Uh, we did the pain box. He likes pain which is an interesting difference between him and Paul. Paul could stand the pain, but he actually likes it. So one imagines the whole pain box thing was actually 
<laughs> something pleasurable for him in a strange way. Yeah, just imagine um, him when he's like, "Can I have the pain box again, please?" Can I? <laughs> can you? Can I buy that? Anymore? Can I buy that one? Is that... Where, where can I get? Put one your penis in the box. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what would happen if? Yes, just hypothetically, um, what if I went full Dune popcorn bucket on this? Ooh. Thing? <laughs> yes. Put your hands so... in the Dune popcorn bucket. <laughs> <laughs> you get rid of the needle against the neck element. I, I guess. I mean, you could use that thing recreationally and just get out of it whenever you want. Mm -hmm. She reports to Sweet. her boss that he was quite formidable as a warrior, which is important to them. Uh, that he liked pain and that he passed the box test. He also, she also says that um, his big weaknesses are sexual and uh, with regards to humiliation. Like, you know, those are the levers by which they can control him uh, by yes. threat of humiliation and by, you know, sexual seduction, whatever you'd say. And also she confirms that the bloodline has been preserved, that she is pregnant with Fade's baby. So Pretty they have... Day. Yeah. As so, requested, it is a girl. Yes. So. so everything is going according to plan. And she's like, you did well, Margo. And it's like, yeah, it sounds like she did great. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, why didn't you go, you lazy bitch? That's what she says one for one in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> says, well, you know, I'm more of a maternal figure. That yeah. wouldn't have worked well with him. And um, Florence Pugh's like, uh, what happened to his, like, Last, I forget exactly how the dialogue goes. Like, what well, happened to his mother? She's, she's, a, well, mo she's a mother, and uh, uh, yeah. considering what happened with his mother, probably not a good idea she was going. And then uh, the other one goes like, what happened to his mother? She, he killed her. It's like, oh, okay. He murdered her. Yeah, just casually. It's like, <laughs> oh, God, these guys are... I knew they were kind of cruel, but Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was PG-13, I thought they were going to even go even darker. I thought they was going to get into some sadistic. They just they were just like, oh, he killed her. I'm like, oh, OK. Well, yeah, I well. assumed that he killed his parents. Just look at him. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, imagine, I imagine he didn't do it with a pillow over the face. I, I mean, imagine. he legitimately he legitimately <laughs> feeds body parts to his yeah. girlfriends in the like. Yeah. Yeah, I thought they were gonna say he ate her liver with a side of fava beans or something. Like they didn't get, <laughs> but uh, oh, nice. PG thirteen. Yeah. I guess they can't really do too much graphic stuff, but I don't know. Well, they did yeah. tone down a lot of that from like. I mean, they have that all that weird sex shit from like if from reading the book oh, with yeah. the Baron. You like there is a lot of gross sex shit right. that goes on. Like he, at one point, he he takes a kid who looks like Paul Atreides and has him drugged so that he can fuck him. It's like it, it, it's it's weird. It, yeah, there's, it, no, there's no gay sex in this movie. There's no That's there's true. no gay sex. There's no like there's no giant trippy spice fueled fremen orgies in Boo. the caves. Like yeah, Boo. there was the Matrix. All of that. I want the Matrix had it. Boo. Yeah, if you want your if you want your siege tabir uh, orgies, go watch the Matrix. You go too. watch the Matrix Reloaded. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. Oh yeah. I didn't that, that catch didn't the now. rating of the movie. Is it PG thirteen? It is. Yeah, I think it is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, that didn't bother me so much. You know that it was PG thirteen. Perhaps it was a little bloodless at times, but for the most part, I, I thought it pulled it off well i don't yeah it doesn't bother me that they removed all the weird all the weird well, the sex section stuff. yeah that's a, that's an old because what, what i do like about this movie is that it's not hard to imagine all the weird sex shit is just happening but it's <laughs> it's off yeah it's like it's heavily implied i mean there's a bondage yeah. spider in the first one i think we all know what that thing is for look at its ass it's just a come fashion on. choice come on <laughs> <laughs> bondage spider spider. i think that was actually a um one of uh, the what are they called the thalaxier or thalax the th the, thala thalax the talaxu from the, yeah they, I mean th there's, there's no confirmation for it there's right, theories the theory you know yeah but like why else but, would you make that thing is right <laughs> yeah. Uh, Not I, for some you, gross, you've been quoted as we all know what it was for. Look at it. Oh, oh, but but, <laughs> yeah. but, but guys, spiders, yeah, but guys, the spider's got a big butt, dude. What do I? Yeah, but like, else? you got what's that one from James and the Giant Peach? Come on, <laughs> you guys are acting like fascists. Uh, bugs have their own 
personalities. You can't just kill the bugs and dehumanize them. Well, that's another airstrike. <laughs> oh, man. This sounds like bug propaganda to me. <laughs> yeah, that, that... It's time for some managed democracy. <laughs> so now all the threads are converging on Arrakis. Um, Fade arrives, and uh, he decides that he's going to take a different approach to dealing with the Fremen. He's going to go where, like we sort of talked about before, somehow he knows where their uh, siege, is that what we're calling it? The North Siege? The siege. Northern Siege? siege. Yes. Yeah, something Wait. like that. Yeah. Anyway, whatever they call yeah. it. Yeah. Um, he Cave obliterates city. it. Oh, yeah. He just he takes like he four or five of these uh, big ships it. and just rocket pods all the way. It goes like, doo -doo 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 -doo. Basically destroys uh, one of their sacred places one mm -hmm. of the you know kills however many untold numbers of people and then he's like this will scare them all away it'll drive them into the south if they're out there at all and um they're like okay that's an effective strategy and so all the fremen have decided <laughs> like, they need i like how the baron is like uh good old-fashioned uh, artillery genius <laughs> I was like, like, damn this is why i, I knew i picked you for a reason bro <laughs> look at that oh. wow why didn't we think of that it's like oh man somebody in the Somebody in the chat said her web connects us all in reference, I believe, <laughs> to the spider. To yes. Yeah. The web. <laughs> <laughs> it's a webstony. Yes. Um, yeah, the whole... Yeah, it's, the, it's, I, I, compared to Raba, yeah, just shooting them a bunch is pretty genius. And so I guess <laughs> we'll give them that. So uh, the Fremen are like, we have to retreat to the south. Meanwhile... Um, Jessica, now with her blue eyes, she's kind of changed as a person. She's like, we're going to go head south and prepare the way for you there. And Paul's like, I don't want to go south. I don't want to go me. south. Wanna go you south, don't, you can't make me happen. into the prophet. Yeah, the prophet is just enslaves people. It's bad. I don't want to be... Well, Morpheus, I don't want to be the key. Uh, he's butters in imagination. The end. Yeah. And so he says, I'm going to stay behind. And they're like, no, we have to go south. And he's, he's unsure of it. He doesn't want to go south. He's afraid of the fundamentalists there who all very much believe in mm -hmm. the prophecy and because he doesn't want that path, right? And yeah. so... Also because of he's the just... divisions he sees, obviously, because he thinks if he goes down there, like, there's going to be big old war, which he's not wrong about. But yes. He's uh, about at, this point, at this point in the story, like in the first movie, he has these visions of the future, but they don't, they don't always come exactly true. That's mm -hmm. something that's made clear in the first movie. Um, that he has visions of like kind of you could call them either possible futures or they're true in an abstract sense but not in a literal sense right. um, for, for example in the first movie he has a vision that he's being taught by Jami or Jamis Jamis, Jamis. 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 whatever uh, but that's the guy he ends up killing instead yeah. even though he does call upon that guy's wisdom in the scene we're about to describe mm -hmm. uh, for advice and stuff like that. He does yeah, give I think advice. The, the exact line is that he, like in the vision, Jama says, I'll, I will teach you the ways of the desert. And that by by forcing him to fight and, you know, kill him, yeah, yes. he ends up doing Begun something. him on that journey. And also he does consult his wisdom in this movie. Yes. Um, so it's like tr it's true in an abstract, non-literal kind of metaphorical sense, but not literally prophetic in the same way. So mm -hmm. that's that's where we are at this point in the story. Um, at, at this point, he puts his hand on the ground to like wait. No, that's later, isn't it? At some point, he has a vision. I don't remember exactly yeah. what the setup is, but he has a vision, and uh, he he determines that's exactly that around here, yeah, you know, yeah, you're, you're he correct. It's like before they before he decides to go south himself because the the mother is already there at this point like she already went with the other people uh earlier right in the movie true yeah that happened and, earlier and, and he says like no i'm going to stay here fight with them uh what we're we doing because she, she's like oh we're going to give them hope and he's like angry but i was like that's not hope we, they deserve to be led by someone of their own yes and uh she also um, tells him that he's blinded by love basically and he needs to uh keep himself free for the correct strategic wedding or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so she's thinking big picture, classic Bene yeah. Gesserit. She's all going the full propaganda mode currently. Like she's yeah. just like, yeah. oh, he has big, big worm. That's double. That's a double meaning. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow, Paul, he has big worms. Spread the, the word. Tell all your friends about how big his worm is. Worm, biggest worm anybody ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> Everybody, tell him about this big worm. It's just going yes. everywhere. So he puts his hand to the sand, and he's, he's he has a vision, and he hears some Bene Gesserit voices talking about uh, the prophecy and all that sort of stuff. And then he hears Jamis's voice tell him that a wise hunter climbs the highest dune to like see yeah. all that he can see before he begins his hunt. And all these signs are kind of pointing to, all right, well, to to find your way through this, you're going to have to go drink the water of life. Drink and so the you worm can see. cream. Yeah, so you can see <laughs> everything. And so, you know, if you drink the water of life and obtain the knowledge and sight that comes from it, then you can find a way to chart a narrow path to what well, you ultimately want through all this. Technically, that is good advice considering how dominating his you know, holy war is over the next, you know, hundred. like if he did, you know what I mean? If, if his goal was to, um, destroy the Harkonnens and then, and then I don't know if he would say that, like he didn't, he wouldn't have done the holy war if, uh, I don't know. In the movie, it makes it clear that the houses like refuse to accept his ascension. So maybe that's why they're changing it in the movie. But anyway, like it's good advice. Cause like he drank it and then that, he's like a god now and like he you know but well, yeah. it's also fulfilling a, a it's like it's it's bad like morally questionable mm -hmm. because like then you're feeding into the prophecy and you're like you're doing all these things that like um it's just bad it's genocidal you know what i mean so it's an interesting thing like Jameis well, wasn't yeah. i don't think Jameis was do you think Jameis was being honest but like not didn't quite understand the ramifications of that um uh, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I mean assuming what he's talking to there is actually the spirit of yeah James, um i don't think he's being dishonest or anything it right. is good advice you know like to yeah. to try to see probably your didn't way think through. about him becoming a god creature right drinking some no, uh, exactly. warm juice <laughs> he, can, he consults I with know. the spirits in a sort of vague sense and comes to the conclusion that like well i'm trying to avoid a holy war but i don't really know how to do it um, so the best way at this moment to like chart a path through all these, all these, you know, know. Uh, all these things happening all around me that I can't necessarily control. I need to be able to see, I need to be able to know what's coming. Right. And so he goes, he decides to head South anyway, not because he really wants to be the Lisan Al Gaib at this point, but because he thinks drinking the water of life will give him the power necessary to the knowledge, and the knowledge. knowledge necessary. Yes. But uh, it's sort of a bargain with the devil, as we'll see that it kind of changes him and kind of causes him to think differently about. Mm -hmm. Right. It's like the chicken and the wanted. egg. Like what? Like wh he wanted he had to. I think Paul honestly has no choice because I don't think he had, like otherwise they lose and and the Harkonnens kill everyone. You know what I mean? Um, Potentially. You know, they, yeah, that's definitely the threat. <laughs> And the, um, yeah, and, I, well, and I think that you know it's it, it's a good. This is a, another example of a, a difference that's that's subtle that I think works really well in this version, is that the the visions, at least from what I remember in when reading it, the visions are very much more like straightforward. You just kind of see what's happening, as opposed to this where it's like you get images of people talking to you in riddles and. Yeah, you know, it, it is like. true in a way, right? In a sense, what they're saying, what they're telling you is true, but it's not, you know, a specific thing like, okay, go south, drink this water, and then go do this and say this stuff to these people at this time, right? It's like the wiser, yeah. the you have to be able to see, and you're going to have to give up part of yourself in order to get that power, and then yeah, you know, that, that's that, and I, I like that. I like how they how they, how he's how he's this. It's a good question yeah, yeah. that once you're given the knowledge of generations and like effectively memories of other people, because it's all information that you didn't know that you just learned in an instant, mm -hmm. is it possible for you to be the same person the next day, the next hour? Yeah. 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 Like, are yeah. you just, you're different. You're a different being at that point. He originally doesn't want power. He doesn't want to be the Messiah. He wants to work alongside the Fremen and have one of them be the leader. But in order to, uh, to save them and to win this battle with the Harkonnens, uh, he decides that he needs the power 
uh, to be able to see and to predict what's going to happen. And then once he gets the power, it changes his whole view about what his ultimate goal should be. And he kind of loses the part of him that didn't want the prophecy in the beginning. It's a really interesting story. There's a lot of sort of like by trying to avoid fate, you end up fulfilling it kind mm -hmm. of thing. We've seen that in a lot of different stories, uh, some of which we've referenced already. But it's, it seems like a classic tale in a sense. And I feel like that part was really really well handled here yeah, yeah. Oh, sure. he was even against what seemed to be logic uh, avoiding going south though because he already knew enough to know hey the second i go there i'm going to drink that liquid and then i'm going to take over the galaxy the, the fundamentalists are immediately going to fall in behind me and yeah. it's like, well yeah like yeah. wouldn't you want that you want soldiers he's like no i, I don't want to kill billions of people in a like they call it a holy war they never use the term jihad in the movie which is uh yeah, yeah, yeah a choice <laughs> yeah this is uh, it's, the kind of this is the kind of stuff that makes dune really appealing to me is yes. it captures it captures the sense of cosmic chaos where like you have all these groups and you know factions trying to like force an outcome and it's like what's prophecy what's self-fulfilling prophecy what's right. bullshit <laughs> what's <laughs> manipulation what's for the greater good uh, yeah. And it's like There's you no have all these answer, forces yeah. constantly changing the playing field. And it's like what the sand is a metaphor for, I think, you know, like yeah. this, the dunes constantly shifting yeah. as a result of forces that are either organic or inorganic. And, and, and you, then you, despite spiced. trying to control an outcome, you really don't know what's going to happen. Like, yeah, the, the spice too. Yeah. like what's a vision and what's what's drug like a drug trip. Like mm. what's, you yeah. know, yeah. Even that shit, even clear. from the book, Anything. it's not even clear. Really, it's kind of a debate yeah. between the importance of dreams, uh, you know, because a lot of talk about his dreams being important and prescient and all that. But then you get lines from people like Duncan Idaho in the first movie where he says, like, you know, dreams make for good stories, but all the best stuff happens when we're awake because that's when we get stuff done. <laughs> like, right. and so, like, yeah. there's yeah. competing yeah. perspectives. Yeah. Like, what, like, I think the very first line in the very first movie is, uh, kind of chanted i think it's a sardaukar sort of voice but it's a throat singy sort of voice i don't know exactly what voice it is but i think it says this is oh, dreams God. are messages from the deep yes that's the mm. one that that's like the first thing we ever hear in this whole series and i think it's very important really sets the stage um another thing i just wanted to hop off of what john was saying about chaos like everything about the symbolism for arrakis itself is all to do with chaos right i mean for yeah. one Paul comes from a place, you know, of order and hierarchy and all that sort of stuff. And then he's thrust into the desert, which is a classic sort of trope. But not only that, like the, the sand dunes kind of feel like the sea. Not only do they feel like the sea, there's like a, you know, the, the worms are basically sea serpents in the, in the sort of classical ancient sense of the word. That's what they are, essentially. They wouldn't make a lot of sense logistically. It's like, what the hell do those things eat? But you know, they, they function as like these uh, serpents of the deep ocean kind of thing, only the ocean is made of sand. And like it, even with the sand walk, the thing that they do to avoid the sandworms, to avoid either calling them or learning attention, they have to become chaotic, right? They have to... Yeah, the, well, the worms rhythm. are attracted to the rhythmic exactly. sense, yeah. So They're you attracted have to... to order and they come order, and destroy yeah. order. It's like their whole thing. Right. So like yeah. in order to avoid that and to survive in the desert, they have to like break up the order and rhythm of their movements and move move like the chaos of the sands. All this sort of stuff. Really, really cool. It, it, it really um coherent symbolically is the word I would use. Good mm -hmm. shit. Yep. So they go yep. south. Another classic symbolic move. They go south and they ride the sandworms through the giant Wee. storms that are around the equator. Um, they sort of separate the north from the south, and then as as they're in the south, uh, Paul kind of breaks away from the rest of the sandworms to go off, and they're like, "Oh, where is he going?" And first, he arrives at a sort of remote temple, I suppose. That's where um, an earlier scene, Jessica had gone there, and there they have a little sand pit with a little baby sandworm in it, mm -hmm. and he's like, "Show me how they make the water of life." And so this woman grabs the sandworm it coils around her and then she pulls it into the water which kills it it's really interesting symbolism there because the worm is all coiled up and then once it's dead it straightens out mm -hmm. i don't know just an interesting thing and so then that's how they extract the water of life and she says okay now that you have this water of life there will be a man who comes 
to take it and like you should give it to him when he comes and she's like oh but it'll kill a man and so she uses the voice on her and says like let him try and so paul eventually arrives here at this mm-hmm. temple and asks to take the water of life and so he takes the water of life and the only complaint i have about this scene because otherwise it's pretty good is that we don't really his little trip doesn't seem to be as harrowing or we don't see it anyway it kind of happens off camera because uh, when jessica takes it at first she kind of has a seizure and looks right. like she's about to die and because we've hyped up how much it, this oh, could this is him, deadly for him yeah yeah that that we kind of cut away we cut into a vision which isn't as abstract as some of the late some of the earlier visions uh, we'll talk about what the vision is in a minute. But when we cut back, he's like lying near death, but we don't really see it. I don't know. It didn't have the same weight as I feel like it should have. I would have liked to see him like collapse to the ground or something to make it seem like he's about to die. Otherwise, let him do a little acting kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, it's just a little something. I feel like it kind of cut away when it would have been nice to see him, to see how hard it is physically. On him. Yeah, right, yeah. right. I don't know but. if it was made explicit in the movie, but uh, I found it interesting that uh, the the worm goo needs to come specifically from a little babby worm. It's <laughs> yeah. like it like adds this angle of like well, it's a little perverse, you know. Like I don't know, I don't know if it's they can't they just can't wrangle a big one to get that. Yeah, right? I think it's, that's it. Big, the spice is yeah. the spice comes from the big ones. The spice, well. Oh, I, I know the spice. Yeah. yeah, the spice comes from the big ones, but like I actually remember reading that apparently oh. it's the little worms oh, that have this. The little ones. There's like a, a oh, purity okay. to them that allows for the distilled <laughs> liquid that you know the people drink, and it gives them the powers and shit. Um, Got gotcha. you. Yeah, some super and, super adventure club stuff. Oh, yes. No. So <laughs> as as the worms get older, that liquid loses its effectiveness. <laughs> or, and, Remember like when the some Bohemian some... Grove bullshit to me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is reminding me of a very specific Nathan for you scene that uh, I don't know if anyone else knows what I'm talking about. I won't I explain know. it. Uh, I don't know about it. it. We'll let that be. They're killing so... baby worms to make the water a life. The Quisat's had a So he has a vision, and in his vision, among other things, somewhere in here, I think actually it was in the previous vision scene, We uh, he discovered in his vision that the woman he's following into uh, death and destruction is actually Jessica, mm-hmm. his mom. Um, but then in this vision, he sees Anya Taylor-Joy with blue eyes. Uh, he he kind of, he, he crests a sand dune, and on the other side, he sees a giant ocean you know, a vision Whoa. potentially of the of a paradisical, whatever word, future for uh, bringing water back, bringing life back to Arrakis. And then he sees Anya Taylor-Joy uh, as an adult, and she looks weird. And she says something like, like, I love you. I don't remember exactly what she says. Do you remember? What, does anyone else? It's something that? like, I'm, I'm with you, brother. Yeah, I'm with you. Or I'm waiting for I you. I believe in you, blah, blah, blah. You can yeah, do it. it. You can do it, champ. Yeah. I felt like of all the vision scenes in these movies, that one felt kind of weak comparatively. And that maybe ought to have been the biggest one. Does anyone else feel that way? I don't know. I, well, okay. So I'm going to like, I, I was sort of waiting to see like the, the main thing I was very curious about was seeing how they were going to handle all the material that takes, you know, that happens in the second half of the first book. Like how are they going to handle the siege orgies and how are they going to handle the polygamy and how are they going to handle? So uh, how are they going to handle um, the daughter, uh, his sister being born? Um, Cause so like another big change here is that in, in the book, he spends a few years with the Fremen and his sister mm-hmm. is born and she becomes sort of this like saintly figure moving amongst them because she's like, you know, a three year old child or a four year old who walks and talks with the attitude of an elderly woman or like like an old basically like a wise old woman. Yeah, wise old woman. And so they consider her both like a saint and a witch. And I remembered that Anya Taylor Joy was going to be playing her, and I was like, "How are we going to work this in here? Like, this is a like a, another weird thing that is going to, you know, be kind of a big deal." Uh, and then this is if this with this being like the only way that they worked it in, I was a little like, "Oh, okay." I mean, 
I guess it gets rid of some of the extra fat of trying to explain all of that together, you know, in yeah. the, mm-hmm. this you know already rather full movie. Yeah, um, streamlines it. Yeah, but the the deployment probably could have gone a little better. Uh, I think they probably they could have done a little more with the symbology here uh, and with what she is going to like with her influence and how she's going to, you know. What she's going to play, the role she's going to play moving forward in the story that he's telling. Yeah, I wasn't sure what to make of this scene other than, okay, there's there's the daughter. She loves him and says, go get him, champ. And mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, that's cool, I guess. But I, I, my central complaint about it is just that this is when he takes the water of life. This is the thing that's like supposed to kill him, maybe. And like this is going to transform him into someone who's like a, you know, a man, god, demigod type person. And the vision he experiences was just a little underwhelming in comparison to some of the better ones. Yeah, I mean, he he sees, that. you know, the, the, the ocean and he sees a woman he doesn't know yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, that's pretty much what we get. Yeah, which is... but then he is, uh, he, oh, I just wanted to highlight someone in chat who says, uh, she says, I love you when I came. So <laughs> I'm happy for you. Nice. Big, big Anya Taylor Joy fan in the chat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> then... Uh, he is near death, and Chani arrives late and says, "What have you done to him?" And it's like he drank the water of life, and it's like, "Oh no, he's he's dead." And they, Jessica says, "No, his vital signs are just so low that he seems like he's dead. He's not actually dead, yeah. but he's near death." And they say, "You need to be the one to save him because you." Oh, this was mentioned earlier. Probably should have mentioned it. Uh, her fancy fremen name is Desert Spring. She doesn't like it because of its association with a prophecy she doesn't believe in. Mm-hmm. And this is the payoff for that. But apparently oh, in the prophecy... That's all they want? The, okay. <laughs> yeah. So the Desert Spring will... The des- uh, this tears of the Desert Spring will bring will save him from his slumber or whatever. Yes. Okay, I did not yes, make so it he's basically. I was just confused when, <laughs> when he woke like, up. Beauty, son. Yeah. Yeah, so he's in a sort of coma after drinking the worm piss. And so the, the desert spring has to resuscitate him or resurrect him with her tears. And so um, she doesn't want to do it. And interestingly, uh, Jessica commands her to do it with the voice. And then she yeah. kind of goes into a trance, cries some tears, gets a little dab of the water of life and presses it to his lips. And that brings him back from the dead. And then, of course... Stilgar and all the other believers like, oh my god, as it is written. Luzo oh my god. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I love I love that stuff so much. It just feels so real. Like exactly yeah. that's exactly how they would treat this. Um, oh yeah. So he is resurrected. He has blue eyes now. So that's neat. Um and now he sees everything. Blue eyes white Paul. <laughs> That's a, that's that's a tough crowd today for me. Sure. I, I got it. I, like it. I, got it. I, got it. I got it. I didn't get it. <laughs> the desert tears thing felt a little thrown in. To I, me. Yeah, I wasn't a huge fan of that. It, it's it just like, oh my god, he's like... dead. Oh wait, the tears. Okay, he's alive now. Like, I don't. Um, I don't think it was set up. Was it? Like, it was. Just I mean, it, it, it is nowhere. in that like earlier when he asks her war name. Uh, she says it means desert spring, and like, I don't I like, like it, it because of. He's like, I, he's like, yeah, I like it. She goes, I hate it. It's because it's like some prophecy, you know. And then, oh, yeah. and when it gets to here, that's this. This is that's the setup, and then this no, is the payoff. That still feels kind of weak to me. I don't, I don't know. Maybe it's just me. I, I'm well, with you on that one, honestly. Well, a little bit, is yeah. it, is it real or not? Like she, she put the tear on his lips and he woke up. Like, was yeah. he gonna wake up anyway? Yeah, well, and was he gonna wake up anyway? What it like? If not, why did the it tear was, do it? Yeah, yeah it like, wasn't like a tear though. It was a tear and a drop of the water of life. Yeah. Right, it was both. But he already yeah. drank the water of life. I, he drank I, I the don't water of life. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It, I don't like, understand. It, maybe yeah. there's something yeah. about taking like a pick me up dose. Oh, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> a little hair of the dog, you know. Oh, when you have that's just a counter, like a okay, counter beer. Here. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. next day, there's a counter drop I, of water of life. I, it's, <laughs> it's an interesting thing here because clearly, whatever resurrects him there is kind of magical, you know, in a way that there's a sort of magic to the foresight and the powers that the Bene Gesserit have. It is a little, it's maybe not the strongest aspect of it. I didn't mind it because I felt like, uh, you know, symbolically, thematically, it works 
but it you know how does that actually save him in universe i'm not exactly sure like, how does that actually bring him back? Is it just yeah, like a, another drop of the water of life is a shock to the system? Because mm-hmm. maybe that's it. Actually, maybe that's it. That if like giving him a little bit more would kind of like, you know, would be like I'm stabbing bad. Mia with uh, with uh, adrenaline in Pulp Fiction and kind of wake him back up. Yeah. But the, but that Jessica, but the Jessica specifically does the tears thing for the sake of everyone there. Yeah, maybe. I, yeah. I could believe that. Yeah, you know, that, like right. really, all it would take to wake him back up would to be give to give him a little more to sort of shock his system back awake. But the tears flick, flick one of his testicles. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ah. Flick. <laughs> flick him in the gooch. Um, <laughs> but that you know, it needs to be the tears for the sake of everyone there who knows the prophecy by heart. You know that sort of thing. I could believe that. Got to do it for the propaganda. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's did a they ever earlier. say what the water of someone in yeah. your chat metal says? Did they ever say what the water of life tastes like? Is it blue raspberry? It does look like a blue raspberry. <laughs> it's, it's, it's get a get a get a raid. Yeah, get a raid. it's it's basically just like pure undistilled Cinnamon. Mountain Dew voltage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Blue. It looks like syrup for like a slushy uh, a blueberry. <laughs> well, spice tastes like cinnamon spice. Oh. I'm assuming that's more potent spice. Potent cinnamon? It is, know. yeah. It, it's just undiluted spice is basically yeah. the thing. You're like, yeah. Wait, do they say that? The spice yeah, they do. Like cinnamon in the in, book? In the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure no. do, Part, yeah. It's That's weird. funny. <laughs> That's why it's so addicting. I mean, cinnamon you know? is pretty imagine, great, so I get it. Yeah, imagine if cinnamon was a uh, heroin. <laughs> I would just be imagine, like... Oh. Well, imagine if cinnamon made you trip <laughs> fucking balls. <laughs> That's <laughs> basically... I'd be eating yeah. Cinnabons every day of the week. Yeah. <laughs> I already do that. I already do that now. And I start, oh, yeah. my God. No, that's, that's brilliant. That needs to be the opening. Or, like, we need a movie set on Arrakis <laughs> where somebody's just opened With... a, cinnamon, a Cinnabon shop. Yeah, Saul <laughs> Goodman. <laughs> Saul Goodman's cin- Cinnabon spice shop. <laughs> how, and how does the spice trade affect the regular man, the working man? <laughs> this, that's now why I'm picturing, he... like... Early YouTube cinnamon challenge videos, but with spice. Oh, yeah, that's why, oh, that, that's God, why no. Jimmy McGill became Saul Goodman. <laughs> oh, I love God. the idea of Saul Goodman having to go to Arrakis to hide from the police. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and sell cinnabons. That's great. We need lore cro- like lore crossing uh, media. More of it. More of it. More like crossover. Multi- What's it called? Crossover media? What would you call Alien yeah, versus metaverse? Predator? I don't know. <laughs> no, but like Alien versus Predator, like Metaverse is like implied internal. Like, I don't know. Canon. I think I mean, the point crossover is the right term. Crossover. Crossover. Yeah, yeah. yeah. what we're doing right now. Fewer things crossover. Jimmy Neutron, the Jimmy Timmy yeah. Power Hour crossover. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's true. That's Good funny. reference. Now, um, he's got the blue eyes and he can see all sorts of stuff. Mm. What immediately happens after? Do we remember? Uh, Does, he well, gets up. Get, oh, Chani slaps him, and then we the get that face. musical sting. Oh, yes, that, <laughs> that was actually very might funny. be almost laugh out loud in the cinema. The the way uh, yeah, they put uh, the yeah. music. He gets slapped in the face and like. <laughs> 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 I, I have expected to hear Stilgar say, "Lisa Algaib, turn the other cheek." He turned the other cheek. <laughs> That's what he would do. <laughs> that would have been great. I want to I respond to someone in your chat, Metal, who says, I'm going to say it. Spice feels like it just does anything the plot needs. I don't agree with that uh, at all, actually. No. I think it has. Yeah. I, Time I, and powers powers are the big thing, and that those are pretty powerful, yeah. so yeah. it can do a lot. Designated well, yeah, but there's, there's all yeah. sorts of stuff it doesn't do. You know what I mean? It's yeah. This is not the Black Sledge from Prometheus, by comparison. No. The Black Goat from Prometheus does you know, being, Oil being, does a lot of things for... You know, fossil fuels do a lot of things for us. <laughs> I, I think what, one of the things throwing maybe throwing people off is the like they use it for interstellar travel, and I think a bunch of people don't understand. Like they, I mean, I was told this. I don't know if it's accurate, but like the ships integrate creatures. It like, that yeah. eat yeah. the space. They, 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 the br- they basically like breed people in at like the spacing guild are people who are bred in like in orbit you know off planet in tanks full of spice that have future sight the way paul does and they use that to chart safe paths through space to make sure that nothing goes wrong that and so like that's their entire thing but that for that turns them basically into like the david lynch monstrosities 
that exist in the original 84 one. Oh, or like, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, like manatees <laughs> yeah, that live in orange gas <laughs> tanks that are being constantly pumped full of cinnamon. So... <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yeah. It, so, the main thing is that it gives you future sight, like when you use enough of it. But it it causes a, an an addiction that like it, there's there's a lot that goes on. Yeah. If you, like, if you like, want a lot to, of in depth you, stuff. If you want to use it properly, you have to be, I guess, a Bene Gesserit or well, Paul. I guess. <laughs> I don't think. The, oh. Yeah. Yeah. You have to. Yeah. I don't know if the Bene Gesserit use as much of it, but they they are like, yeah, you have to basically either like completely absorb yourself in it or just mm. be, you know, the guy. You just have to be the guy from Spy Kids, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so immediately after he is uh, resurrected by the desert spring, everybody leaves and he's alone in the temple with Jessica. Yep, And this is when we start to see him change the way she changed earlier in the movie. He starts talking, honestly, like Doctor Strange does, about all the different timelines he sees. But there's one, there's one, there's a really nice directorial sort of editing choice here to like get to a close-up of his hands while he's talking. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I just thought that was yeah, something that was really good. Yeah, and it so worked, yeah. He's talking about like there's one straight, so there's one narrow path through all of this. You know, like this, I see all these different futures. My visions are clearer now. Interesting thing. One thing I noticed while I was watching this movie for the first time, I was like, I feel like the visions are getting a lot less abstract. And I kind of liked them visually more when they were abstract. But then there's a sort of in-universe reason for it is that his visions are becoming more clear and concrete now. And I'm like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Anyway, so he sees this one pathway through. And he realizes that the only way, or at least he believes that the only way to victory here is to fulfill the prophecy and get the southern um fremen to join him in the fight against yeah. the harkonnen and so because he realizes or at least he believes because it's, it's a little unclear exactly how reliable his visions are because remember earlier in the movie his visions didn't happen exactly are we meant to believe that they happen exactly now unclear but anyway he believes that the only way to win is to fulfill the prophecy which is interesting. Mm -hmm. So now he is set on his path. And this is where the real sort of falling out with Chani begins in earnest, because it becomes clear to her that he is concerned with power, that he is, that he, he does has, he does have greater aspirations than just to live among the Fremen and help them. You know, he has galactic ambitions. Pretty mm -hmm. much. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Th this is also where he, where he says that, uh, Chani is gonna is, is angry now, but she will come to understand in the future, which I guess he also mm -hmm. saw uh, in his visions. I I, I guess, or he yeah. assumes that's just gonna happen. Uh, yes. So well, yeah. I mean, we're meant. To, I think what we're at least the way that it works uh, for me, you know, having read it, is like he does know exactly what he has to do mm -hmm. at any given point in order to make sure that everything goes on the path of, you know, the least amount of carnage uh, that will result from this. And he, he has to follow through with all these different, he has to do like pretty much exactly these mm -hmm. things at exactly these moments. These moments. One thing um, that, um, one yeah, thing that yeah. Cap kind of touched on was um, the way it's directed as uh, you see Paul <laughs> sort of doing the knife hand. Like he, he kind of points out his yeah, fingers yeah. as he's talking about finding that narrow path to victory. And I, I just, I wanted to highlight that for a moment. I thought it was a good choice. Yeah, yeah. It's a very well-directed yeah. movie. Very well-directed yeah. in terms of like how, to, how, how scenes are filmed and stuff like that. And like choosing what to cut to and when. It's all very effective, very well yeah. crafted. Technically, really helps elevate the story. Uh, someone in the chat said Chani is such a buzzkill. I feel like she's so understandable and relatable in this movie. Yeah, like, I, I don't understand the hate yeah. for her. Like, I I think her perspective is very reasonable, and it's totally understandable. Like what she sees happening to him and why she doesn't like it. I, I'm, yeah. I'm I I do wonder where we go with her uh, after the this movie. Like what what direction yeah. we're going with, especially after hearing what yeah. with the whole polygamy stuff that's at normally in the movie. I'm just wondering, because <laughs> yeah. yeah. my friend who I was in the uh, in the cinema, he was like, "Oh, I wonder if she's might be might be going to be an adversary in the future because she's angry. Maybe I know maybe like getting a subset of the people who still like has all 
but a bunch of bullshit with the messiah he's just gonna enslave us again like every other uh, other person so maybe she has like mm-hmm. a little rebel force going on or something uh i don't know could go anywhere now really with how we ended the movie yeah she just really didn't want to be part of the polycule <laughs> <laughs> So, um, they go to the south, and uh, I think at one point we this somewhere in here we learned that uh, at the big meeting of all the different tribes and peoples or whatever at the south, only the leader of each tribe or group can speak. And so Stilgar says, "Like I want you to speak at the meeting. You'll have to kill me in a duel." And he's like, "I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Fucking <clears throat> hell, that's ridiculous." Uh, eventually, there's probably some scenes in the middle, so stop me if I'm misremembering anything. But when they eventually get to the south, oh, this scene's really, really good. Yeah, so I like it. They come, in, they come into the temple. Well, first of all, we get this shot that you see in the trailer with the giant masses of people and Paul kind of walking his way through mm-hmm. among them. Cool shot from above. It kind of looks and like then, a drop of water, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. a little bit. It does. Just just, just remember that. I think the I might have that was by... By design, I mean, I would, I would absolutely believe it is. Yeah. Yes. The thing is, you kind of get that. I, I guess you kind of get that, uh, that form when you walk through there and people make space. Uh, so mm-hmm. that's why I'm wondering but if it, it might just be by accident, but also by design. Maybe it's design. just a, maybe it's a happy accident. I would. I don't know. <laughs> I would say that symbolism happens whether you intend to or not. Quite often. Okay. And so. <laughs> Fair enough. No, I just. I mean, like, the, the, I would believe that they did it on purpose, but I could, like, you know. I sometimes with stuff like that, it makes intuitive sense even if you don't think about it consciously. Right, you know, right, right. That sort of yeah. thing. So he arrives in, into the temple, and all the people are gathered there, and they're waiting for Paul and all, everyone else to arrive. And um, Chani is not happy with this whole thing. No. <laughs> uh, let's see, what's the what's the exact order? So eventually, the Bene Gesserit, uh, the Reverend Mother, arrives, and then Paul walks in, and he's he's doing this kind of like. Ooh, he's doing this strut. He's doing this little catwalk <laughs> walk. It's, it's a little male model but it made he's me laugh a walking little. towards the middle. He's walking with purpose. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and he walks yeah, to the center, the center of the group. Of the group. Right oh, you were saying something, Mark. Yeah, I just made a Zoolander joke. I just said that Hansel's so hot right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I didn't think it was so hot, hot right now. <laughs> And so he arrives at the center of the group and he starts speaking and one of the elders of the tribe says like, uh, you are, you're, you can't do that here. You, you know, only the leaders can speak. And Stilgar's like, yeah, come on, kill me. It's okay. <laughs> Stilgar's you know? just so like, yeah, come on, kill me. Just do that. Like, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm here. Yeah. Come this on, kill me. Oh, my life, man. <laughs> Give me this. <laughs> Paul has a really, and so he, he's like, you think I would deprive us of one of our greatest weapons at a time like this? Like, I'm not going to kill Stilgar. There's a really great parallel to his dad in the first movie. Uh, if you remember, uh, the, the the one Mentat assistant that uh, Tawat. Duke Leto has. Tawat. Yeah, Tawat, is that it? Uh, Hawat, with an H. Hawat. Uh-huh. So Hawat is... is you know, helping them when they arrive at Arrakis. And if That's you remember, right, yeah. there's a spy who was cement, a Harkonnen spy who was cemented in the wall in the first movie who had the little sort of dragonfly dart thing that he tried to kill Paul. Paul barely survived and they managed to kill this spy. And Hawat says to Leto, he says like, I have let you down. I have failed you. You must accept my resignation. And Leto says like, I like, we need you now more than ever. I don't accept your resignation. Mm-hmm. If you want absolution, go find some spies. And so the choice to have Paul say something kind of similar to that. Um, right before arrived, putting on his father's ducal signet. Yes, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. feels it's very great. deliberate, very good. I like that. I like it in movies when they actually care about this sort of thing. You can kind of tell people are related by the way they talk and behave. You know what I mean? Like he, like you really get the vibe that, is his, that he's his father's son in this movie. Yeah. And I really like that. Yeah. Um, um, go ahead. I just agreed. I just said, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's a great little moment. So, and then, so he, and this is where Paul really puts on the big boy voice. And it, yeah. it, like, he has a gravitas on screen that I, I honestly, I, I got to give Timothy Chalamet credit. I had no idea he was capable of this. Honestly. Yeah. I thought <laughs> like many people, he was just kind of, he couldn't do this type of thing, but I was so wrong. 
Mm-hmm. Man, like when he speaks in front of everybody and he, he puts on the big boy voice, I'm like, oh, Jesus Christ, I get it. I get why he's, <laughs> I get why everyone worships him now. You know what I mean? Like he just really brings yeah. it. Um, I forget exactly what he says here, but he's talking about how he like, convinces a few of the, so basically he, he, he yeah. offers to fight any of the leaders who think that they would be better suited for it. And yeah. a lot of them yeah. stand up, right? Well, and then he starts, the, the whole room stands up, yeah. like, because he yeah. says, no one of you can stand in front of me or can beat me yeah. or whatever. And, yeah. and then as he's walking towards one guy, he, he like reveals his, um, his past, his past. <laughs> yeah. He, he just like read, like, he's like your grandmother. <laughs> lost her eye yeah. fighting against Harkonnens and the guy is like stunned mm. and as soon as he finishes the uh, the story he Lisa Nagaib Lisa Nagaib make a true believer out of four people in the same room and everyone else in that room is going to yeah. believe yeah. that's, that's true yeah. like one, yeah. Yeah. yeah right <laughs> I, I I I I was gone for a bit but I wanted to comment on the uh, right before this the uh, when he says Stilgar is my hand why would I cut my hand off as a fan of the book, that was one of my favorite parts of the movie because that's in the book. It's like a direct yeah. quote from the book. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, he says the same thing. It's like, why, w- why would you expect me to handicap myself? Uh, and your 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 stupid fundamentalist religion is like beneath me at this point. I'm like, I'm a I'm a god. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so. I, I don't think he's saying that because he's... well, I mean, he 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 said in this scene. Um, that their ways are old and don't matter anymore. Basically, like their their traditions of uh, of speaking. If you have to, he has to kill Stilgar. That's that's their religion. Well, yeah, but he, he's. He, I don't think he's saying that your stupid fundamentalist religion is no, like, but he's fulfilling he's it. Your, it's kind of like your prophet. Listen to me because I'm right. gonna you the next chapters in our book. You know, right? Yeah, he's kind of treating Changing them like like the yeah. Philistines sort of thing, like obsessed with the letter of the law, not the spirit of the law. Kind right. Of thing. That's that's true. Yeah. Yep. For sure. Then he starts acting. Then Paul, th- this is where Chalamet very transforms as an actor. Really, I mean, he <laughs> yeah. goes from. That's what we were saying. He's really good in this scene. Yeah, it's very good. Yeah. Great. I disagree yeah. with it's the people like in chat. Yeah. Disagree. <laughs> You're wrong. You ever remember the first time you really saw Heath Ledger like bring it in a performance when like he used to be yeah. the yeah. guy that was in some teen movies and stuff, and then it's like, oh, oh, that dude can act, man. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. So oh, even then, in uh, uh, Ten Things I Hate About You, is a great actor. I thought. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, right. Go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say that he he wins over the crowd, everyone but Chani. Apparently, um, yeah. there's a really great moment where Chani is like causing trouble. I think this is earlier actually, but and uh, Gurney, Gurney, yeah. like pulls her down, and she's like, "It's like this is none of your business." He's like, "This is exactly my business," because he's got, he has the scar on his face from the Harkin, and he's like, "This is exactly my business." So anyway, as Paul is up there, he's he's leading the room. Uh, Stilgar asks him, what do you see for us? And he says, like, green paradise or something like that, which is, yeah. of course, what they're hoping for and what they really want to hear. And it still kind of proves that, like, that's what he wants for them ultimately, even if he has greater ambitions. And then um, the other moment I really liked, this is one of my favorite moments in the movie, is he finally decides to put his father's ring back on. So if you remember in the first movie, uh, he has a discussion with his father, like, I don't know if, like, what if I'm not the future of House Atreides? And his father, it's a great little moment in the first movie where he says, like, if that's not your path, you'll still be all I ever wanted you to be, which is my son. Mm-hmm. And so he, the ring is obviously very clearly the symbol of whether he's choosing to continue uh, the House of Atreides and whether to take on that role. And er- earlier in this movie, when he decides to join the Fremen, he says something to himself about the fact uh, he's looking at the ring in his hand. He says, I've chosen my own path now. He's right. like kind of talking to the spirit of his father, puts the ring in his pocket. And at this moment, he decides to take the ring back out and says that I am Duke of Atreides, or Duke of Arrakis. Mm-hmm. He's got so many titles, it's kind of hard to keep <laughs> yeah. But he puts the ring back on, and, the, and the, the movie cuts to Gurney looking at him, looking like he's almost about to cry. He's so yeah. proud. It's yeah. a great moment. Pretty good. It's, it's, right. Yeah, there's a lot of good like character stuff in this movie. I really that's the strongest aspect of the movie for me. All that all those sort of little moments, all those details. Yeah. Good shit. I like Paul's journey a lot. And this is a really pivotal yeah. moment for that arc <clears throat> of the story. Mm-hmm. Yep. Now have we what skipped do- over 
the part with the family atomics. Does that happen before this or after? <laughs> oh, we definitely skipped it, over that one. We yeah. definitely skipped over it. We I kind of skipped about. about it. We kind of skipped over Gurney returning. I just realized. Oh, well, we did yeah. do that. Didn't <laughs> <we>? <laughs> oh no! He's yeah, there, Gurney Alex alive, by the way. Yeah, Josh Roland's yeah. alive. He he basically <laughs> that's, that's... He, he, yeah. he survived, and uh, the way they explain it is like, oh, he was able to negotiate uh, some kind of treaty or co contract uh, that allowed them to get off planet. Uh, like the survivors could get off planet, and then he started smuggling spice from this planet. I think yeah, that's well, that the gist of it. In the, yeah, in the book, he ta it's a little bit more narration or whatever, but he's biding his time until he can kill somebody of importance. He's just he wants to kill the Baron. He's yeah. he's basically trying to get into the castle or into mm -hmm. the palace to kill the Baron because um, he thinks that you know he thinks everybody's dead. So he's just, you know, out mining spice to, yeah. you know, get money and kill Harkonnens because, yeah. yeah, yeah. And this is um, another scene that's closely adapted from the from the novel. Like when they're 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 hug, they are they embrace each other when they see he sees Paul's eyes, and he's like, "Who's this?" Because his blue eyes, and he's yeah, you know. But then mm -hmm. Paul pulls his mask down, and he's like, "Yeah, it's a great moment from the book." Because he also says, "I remember your your footsteps, old man." Like in the yeah. first movie, it's like, oh, that's neat. That's neat. Nice little callback. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So he's alive and he's basically working as a smuggler because the Harkonnens are having such trouble with spice production that it, it is lucrative to try and smuggle spice off the planet. So that's sort of what he's doing now. And he ends up joining with the Fremen. Of course, they're very distrustful of him at first, but they kind of cut him some slack because he's family of mm -hmm. Paul's. Um, uh, and then somewhere in here, and I don't know how you guys feel about this, but I hate all the Atomics stuff because it feels, you know, this feels really yeah. unmotivated <laughs> and dropped on us like a bag, like a ton of bricks. I'm like, oh, okay, there are nukes. By <laughs> the way, he basically comes in to say, by the way, I know I, where, I know where your dad hit the nukes nuke. off screen. <laughs> I'm like, what nukes? What are we talking about? It's like, oh, and by the way, here's where they are. I'm like, what are we doing? This is like, so, I didn't even know nukes existed in this world. So um, <laughs> what, what am I supposed to think, by the way? Did they hide this like ages and ages ago or just when they arrived on Arrakis? When they arrived. So, okay, so this is some, some world building lore that got dropped um, that I think is, especially for this part, um, kind of necessary to understanding it. Every one of the great houses has an atomic arsenal, but none of them will like there's laws governing their use. Nobody wants to use them against one another because that would be seen as like filthy warfare, right? Like that's okay. that's not a, that's not okay. So they keep them because it's meant like in the same way that you know we keep nukes today, right? Yeah, Where right, it's right. like it's like yeah, we yeah. want them we, and, and mutually assured destruction kind of thing. Like we, we we need them to like as a way like to make sure that the Harkonnens don't nuke our planet without getting retribution. But like nobody would ever consider using the nukes against one another, right? And it would be viewed as very uh, haram should you do this. <laughs> um, which and so this is a great way to bring in one of the other changes that I'd like to get everybody's opinion on here. So in the book version, they consider using the Atreides family atomics that have been hidden in the desert, but they realize that because if they do this, um, pretty much everybody will be really pissed at them yeah. and will not want him on the throne. They need to find a different way to leverage the family atomics. So what they do is they shoot that giant blue Fremen lezer, lezer at the wall. Because the, the wall around the shield, the wall around the wall around the city is shielded. So they shoot right. the giant laser at the shield and simulate a nuke mm. so that everybody thinks they, you know, maybe would. And then they point the nukes at the spice to try to be like, OK, if you come if you come try to get me off the throne, I'll blow it all up. Right. Um, yeah. In this one, they yeah. just launch nukes. So, well, what do we think? And they, <laughs> they, didn't, I, they didn't launch I nukes. I like it. They? Yeah, they did. Yeah, that's they, they, There's a massive explosion at one point. Um, oh, was that a nuke? Was was a, yeah, three nukes, nukes even. It was three nukes yeah. that they shot. Yeah. And the thing is, cool. I was thinking, like, you could have just used normal rockets for that. Uh, yeah. Because they blow up stones to, uh, yeah. I don't know, disrupt the soldiers on the ground and make some dust or something. I'm actually, I'm actually still not 
100% sure what their plan was with those nukes, to be quite honest. Yeah, that's the that final battle's a little weird. I didn't realize those were nukes at all. Yeah, you they, expect they don't have like any other fallout. missiles. It has to be nukes. I guess so. Yeah, uh, yeah, I yeah. guess you're right. That's weird. I don't like that. <laughs> Again, it's just it's just for a cool movie moment. Really, it looks really cool. It, it looks it amazing. The explosion goes off. Yeah, it's the most iconic shot in the movie. Well, I guess I think. it does. You know, yeah. prove he's willing to use them, and he and that he has them for later when he threatens to use them on the yeah. spice fields. They believe him, I mm -hmm. guess. Mm -hmm. um yeah but it's a little weird it's also him embracing death like a destruction like becoming a dictator or whatever you want to call it becoming a, a warlord it's also kind of symbolic like the shot of him in front of the nukes is very symbolic i think of just it's, it's just like a good visual yeah. visualization of his transformation into a warlord i think it, yeah. it distilled down to like a single image i mm -hmm. i loved it i didn't really yeah care too much about the, the nuke yeah thing. so the, the, people are pointing out in the chat that obviously that what the nukes are doing there is blowing up a wall to allow the uh the storm the and the worms to come through yeah um definitely the but I, oh. okay yeah sorry i i exhumed exhumed legume in the chat uh, our chat is is right they do use the atomics to blow yeah. away part of the cliff and they argue that it's justified because they didn't use it against people they used it against right. the landscape yeah okay okay, okay. And then I would have liked a little point. more of that in this. I think I would have liked that yeah. to have come into play a little bit more, like more discussion about doing that, because that is oh, a yeah. strategically very sound thing. And it, yeah. it just like all it does is make Paul look smarter. Right. Oh, yeah. It, yeah. It, I think that would have been nice to have. Um, the, weird, the weird thing about it for me is that like he's using nukes in this battle. And it's like, do you not have any concerns about radiation or anything like that? <laughs> You know I, I mean? don't know if it's the same. I think the atomics could mean anything. It could be radioactive or could not be radio. I, I we don't know what the mm. technology is for those. I, I feel uh, like I, I think that it's pretty clear. It's supposed, it's supposed to be atomic, atomic weapons. Oh, really? yeah. 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 I yeah. So I guess radio it, it feels like a weird thing to do at the at the start of a battle to me. It, it yeah. is weird when like Starship Troopers has this as well, where they fire nukes and the the destructive power of the nuke is kind of whatever it needs to be for the scene but uh, right i don't i don't love that in in either film to be honest okay so uh another person in the chat says i don't think those were nukes because I, earlier on paul has a vision of chani getting melted by seeing a nuke but he but it doesn't happen when it actually happens that might be some evidence to it not being nukes that they're using there question mark um would they i think is that, I think that vision people? I think that vision was an exaggeration. I don't think it, yeah, I think definitely. it was like, yeah, I think but it was still a nuke, but there, there seems it, to be a recognition from the movie that the nukes have those sort of effects. Yeah. Is there, is there any, is it plausible at all that they're just missiles? That's what I mean. Like, it's just, I they call them atomics. Think... I, it could mean anything. To no, me. I don't sorry. Really... I, I, I should specify. Yeah. Uh, obviously they have atomic weapons. Right. Um, is okay, it possible well, okay. that what so they let's... use to blow up the wall are just normal missiles? So if oh, they are know. just normal missiles, then we have a whole scene showing us the arsenal of nuclear missiles that ends up going nowhere. Well, well they, I mean, they pointed has... at the spice. They threatened to blow up the spice mob field. Yeah, well, it doesn't comments. go nowhere, but they okay. But, in... but uh, yeah. It, it, mm. it would just be confusing to have the entire scene where you're showing nuclear weapons and then have a scene where a missile is fired. The explosion looks like a nuclear detonation, but it, they're they're actually not, though, and you're silly for thinking they are. Like, that to me would be odd. I'd be like, wait, yeah. why, why did you do it that way then? I think I think the the only way to get, like, it, they, are, they are probably nukes that they use because, I mean, they are... Yeah. Yeah, they are yeah, in the book. They're probably news, and they're just not quite concerned with uh, whether yeah. or not the radiation is going to, yeah, play a role. And and That's who knows if weird. they're even gonna, you know, I don't know what happens in Messiah, but is that is our Iraqi city still a thing? Yeah, it's is a it, thing. Is it, oh, really? Mm -hmm. So, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I guess, I guess it's just I don't know. Well, I, I will Every say that if, it, if it's meant to be nukes that they used in that battle, that wasn't clear to me. I've seen the movie twice, and I never once was like, oh, those were the nukes. So 
Not sure. Oh, uh, okay. Kind of, I thought it's a that little unclear, I maybe. I mean, so I, I maybe I'm just like I saw a bunch of missiles in a silo. Saw a bunch of missiles get launched out of the side yeah. of you know something, and That's was like, what I thought. and then you yeah, remembered from from the book version that they are nukes that you get used to blow a hole in the mountain. Okay. No, I, I was believe like, you. Okay. A little. I, that's that's well. I'm just I'm just justifying how I read yeah. that. You know, like that's. that's I would have all. expected yeah. more <laughs> fallout or something of that, or more of a more of like consequence, because it just seems like they blew up the wall, and that's all they really mention of it. Hollywood mistake. <laughs> Nuclear weapons. Yeah, are dead well, and like you would, would think that if they did that, then we would have a scene with the emperor or somebody being like, "What are you fucking crazy? Like, why would you?" Yeah, or that the fremen might be upset about using nukes on their planet or something. I don't know something of more consequence and gravity surrounding that decision. Anywho. Uh, yeah. So still not a fan of Gurney being like, Oh, by the way, there's nukes in this universe. I have them and they're right over here. Come get them. <laughs> it's like a little like, okay. I feel like maybe they hid them in, the, in plain sight. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> also Paul's DNA was the only thing that could open the door. Yeah, that's that's how they had them. So they had them in plain sight, but it didn't matter because Paul's DNA is uh, the only thing that can open it. I guess. Yeah. I don't necessarily. Yes. That doesn't bother me as much as that. There's been no setup for them, and all of a sudden, in the middle of this movie, they're like, "Oh, hey, by the way, nukes." <laughs> yeah, they did because, like, in the they tell you about them very early on when you're reading it. So it's like it doesn't come so far out of left field the way in this. Yeah. Where, like, there is no mention of family atomics. I don't think in the in the first one i don't remember one anyway no there wonder, wasn't i'm back yeah that's just like a, a it might be a thing where book readers just and non-book readers will interpret it differently like non-book readers might be like what is this all about all of a sudden but then as me like i was expecting that to happen i was like oh finally here come the uh, atomics and then like yeah so to me it just made sense as a as a person who's read the book but yeah well yeah i mean you you bring yeah. the the knowledge that you have and kind of fill in the gaps but yeah. there is a gap there in in the way the movie sets it up and that's that's like the reverse of book fans getting upset about something that's changed and the non book fans not caring as much it's this is kind of yeah. like the reverse of that a little bit exactly yeah where it only makes sense if you understand yeah. the book otherwise it's like comes out of left field and it's like that feels kind right. of <laughs> honestly yeah. But anywho, uh, are we caught up with Gurney? Pretty much. Uh, yeah, pretty sure. Joining the group. Um, back to the scene in the south in front of everybody. There's a moment that I liked at first, and then I thought this is this is the nitpickiest of nitpicks ever. But there's a moment where he, when he's impressing everyone with his knowledge and sight, he says something about how Arrakis, known by its original Fremen name, Dune... He said the title of the movie. Um, <laughs> it's a it's a nice moment in theory. I like the idea of like cause what it sort of implies is that Arrakis is more of like a Harkonnen name for this planet mm -hmm. or something like that. And that the original Fremen called it Dune or something. There's a nice right. idea in there. Only problem. And like I said, the nitpickiest of nitpicks is that Arrakis sounds more like a Fremen word than Dune does. All, oh, the, yeah. all the Fremen words are very like Arabic yeah. and I can see yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> coded and Dune is like a Dutch word, I think. You know what I mean? It's just a little right. like ah, it's fine. It doesn't sound yeah. more Fremen, but sure. Yeah, they should have a Fremen word for Dune or something. Yeah, Dune something Ladesh or something. They, they call anyway. it Dune Part Two. <laughs> <laughs> Dune Part Two. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, it's uh, anywhere in the world. <laughs> I can't remember if he says it with like a little too much impact, like he knows he's saying the title of the movie. It's kind of like when uh, Benedict Cumberbatch <laughs> says Khan in the the Star Trek sequel. <laughs> Just like my name is Khan, because like the audience is gonna like recognize the name, but it makes no right. sense for him to <laughs> say that uh, like that in the movie. <laughs> Um, someone said in our chat, the, the modern day nukes we have don't have radiation because they're fusion bombs, not fission bombs. I assumed in this movie when they said atomic weapons that they were talking about like atom bombs, not hydrogen bombs, but maybe. It's all I, well, I mean, written in 1969. So, you know, like. <laughs> 
a little older on mm. ter- in terms of the nuclear arsenal, we can, you know, maybe draw the conclusion of like, yeah, maybe the radiation, you know, this is also set something like what, 10,000 years in the future. So <laughs> that sounds like the most uh, thing of its time. It's like, oh, nuclear weapons are so powerful. They're going to be they're going to be powerful forever. Nothing's going to change yeah. change that. Atoms are going to be atom bombs. Big deal. Space <laughs> really, really big. We can't get bigger than that. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, and then he's going to lead the army. He's basically fulfilled the prophecy now. Like, he is their leader, and they're all going to rally behind him to go fight the Harkonnens. Is there anything else to talk about before we get to... To the fight? The the battle plan and the well, big battle itself? He, he sends a letter to the emperor... Right, saying, "Come yes. here, you pussy! I'm gonna beat you up." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Let, let me ki- let me kick your ass, bitch. Yeah, I, I misspoke. By the way, it's 1965, not 69. Just if, in case that you know, in case that. How dare you? That, yeah. You said yeah, 69 so that, so and that, nobody said nice after. That's even worse. I didn't even hear you say that. I was I was gonna say because Lucas took a lot from this uh, for Star Wars, and uh, that would have been a little bit too. What was 70? Star Wars is 77. 77. Oh, okay. I, I'm I'm a decade off. Never mind. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But Star Wars borrowed a lot from Dune, for sure. A lot of things have. I've noticed through this conversation how much The Matrix actually borrows from Dune. The Matrix. Mm. Yeah, Um, that wasn't one I was expecting, but yeah, there's a lot. Avatar. (laughs) Yeah, they all all do. Uh, This is also where the the daughter uh, figures out that uh, the the reverend mother was ready to sacrifice a whole bloodline Mm -hmm. for their goals. Yes. Yes. This is when she discovers that the emperor was in, and by you know, also the Bene Gesserit were in on the destruction of Atreides and their whole bloodline, except for Paul, who's the only one who managed to survive. Or at least that's what they think. Yeah, I think she points that out as well. And it's like, well, he's still alive, and you lost control of him, so he's a problem now. It's like, yeah, it's gonna be fine. It's basically yeah. what she thinks. It's not fine. Unless that's was, all part of their plan too, which I don't even know anymore. Those those Bene Gesserit, they're crazy, man. <laughs> yeah, they're shifty. Um, it can get a little complicated thinking about their machinations, especially because the story's not over yet. Yeah. Part like one thing when trying to assess the quality of these two movies, it's like, man, I really need to know how it all ends. <laughs> yeah. Um, partly, <laughs> partly just to know if like who was right. You know, I'm like, obviously the prophecy <laughs> has come true, question mark, to a degree. Whether he'll be successful on behalf of the Fremen, which is part of the prophecy, or not. Or whether only part of it was necessary because they want him to become, you know, an emperor and not necessarily to make Arrakis a beautiful green place. Because if I understand correctly, if Arrakis is a beautiful wonderland of green trees and grass and oceans probably it no wouldn't spice be no able more, to right? mine yeah exactly yeah so I, that, that that seems like something no one else in the galaxy wants um yeah yeah so it's it's hard to assess a lot of this stuff because i i'm like well are the bene Gesserit like always right or can they be wrong is paul's vision of this narrow path correct or can he be wrong it's hard mm-hmm. to say at this point yeah it's but it's a little it's a it's a it's a twisted web. Her web connects us all. Need to wait a couple <laughs> of years and then we'll maybe figure Just, it out. Ten year in ten years, uh, you can see Denny Villeneuve's vision of Dune Messiah. <laughs> and yeah, uh, I hope yeah, it's yeah, good. We'll good go. I hope it's good. If, if I just want it to be on par with these, you know what I mean. That's yeah. all I'm asking for. Pretty I hope much, it's not yeah. measurably worse. I'd be happy because I like. Be I'm going to be turning sixty when that, that happens. Jeez. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. Um, so yeah. it's time for the big battle. Big battle. Uh, the yeah. the emperor comes down in his shiny chrome. It was so shiny. I don't even want to know how long that took to render. Holy shit! <laughs> oh, yeah, because you can see the reflection <laughs> of the landscape in it. It looked really cool. I was happy with it. Also, fucking show off. Come on, did you really need that? <laughs> did you really need a, a mirror thing? <laughs> It yeah. looks cool. I mean, if I could, I would. It does look pretty cool. <laughs> Especially when it's, like, curiously on fire later. That was pretty cool. I don't remember why it was on fire. Oh, that was the shield with the sand. Yeah, the, there's right. a, oh, yeah, okay. the sandstorm hits the shield, yeah. and then they shoot it or something, right? Like, they blast it with a rocket. 
something like that. Anyway, it was like a flaming metal ball floating in the sky. It was pretty cool looking. Um, so it's time for the big battle, and they're sort of they're gonna attack on three fronts. Uh, uh, Gurney is going to use, I guess we have to assume, atomic weapons to blow a hole. Oh, so, okay, so they've orchestrated this battle to be on a certain day that the sandstorms are going to be big. There's even a line from Stilgari says like, "Ah, you were right. Like, there's a big sandstorm today, so that's going to play into the battle." Right, right. They're going to blow up a wall that's meant to protect. Uh, I guess. It's not a wall, it's a mountain range, right? Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. They're going to blow it, that up. It usually stops, like, it, uh, when, I think the Baron says something when somebody mentions a sandstorm, he says the mountain range will protect us from most of it. Mm-hmm. Yes. So they've built this city here strategically because it's best protected from these wild sandstorms. So they're going to blow up part of that <laughs> mountain range to allow the sandstorm and the sandworms to come in on that front. Uh, meanwhile, Chani and a bunch of the Fremen warriors are going to attack on another front. Mm-hmm. And what's the third front? Is like Paul and the his folks? W- I don't remember. Paul, sand, oh, no way. That's the same one. Sand all of coming from through. the north. Yeah. Like through yeah. the normal channel of of travel. Anyway, they're going to attack and them Shani, from three sides. And, uh, yeah, the first... Shani must... How did they get in there? Because Sh- did Shani, did they climb the wall? Or they didn't... Ex- they only blew up one side of the wall. But oh. then there's another side that Shani comes in with her team. I don't know how they got there. That's a good question. I don't actually. remember. I, 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 I'm sure there's a there's a quick line about it in this. They, yeah, they, they talk about where team. they where they are and who, where goes where, but we basically just cut them being there already. So I, yeah. I'm not sure how exactly Maybe they got a, there. Yeah, I don't know. Could be a secret passage or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> they didn't say. They didn't explain it. Secret tunnel. <laughs> secret tunnel. <laughs> So, um, I like secret tunnels, man. Lord of the Rings had the coolest secret tunnel. Yeah, no secret Red tunnel White. in Dune. One out of ten. <laughs> Boo. And Mor- Mordor has the really deadly secret tunnel. With the spider. Don't, don't go into Shelob's lair. Don't do it. Yeah. Yeah. Live in secret tunnels. They're definitely secret tunnels. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's well, so those right, be- yeah, yeah, yeah. right before the battle actually takes place, uh, the Harkonnens arrive to meet the Emperor. Uh, and they kill or almost kill Baron Harkonnen because they're like, like, uh, like he gets confronted over doing a bad job of harvesting spice mm-hmm. and, uh, for not knowing that there are millions of people in the South, which the emperor knows now, if I understand correctly, I'm not quite sure. That, this knows. is yeah, probably yeah, yeah. his most Christopher Walken scene where he's like, <laughs> what? So you know nothing? <laughs> yeah. You don't know anything. <laughs> More. Yeah, there's more. signs of life in the south of the planet. <laughs> <laughs> and so they they yeah, they wound. I don't. They talking? don't kill. It. Sorry. Go ahead, Mark. No, it was just more Christopher Walken. Never mind. You can keep going. <laughs> yeah, we need more spice. We need more. Nah, nah. <laughs> Can't have enough Christopher Walken. <laughs> so they wound uh, Baron Harkonnen. They don't kill him immediately, but they like. Yeah, they shut. Him. Well, they shut down his like floaty, floaty thing, pack yeah. thing that's embedded in his spine, and he's too fat he... to pick himself up. <laughs> yes, exactly. And then uh, the Fremen attack. They they blow up that wall, and then as the dust clears, the the Sardaukar on the ground are like, "What's coming? What's going to happen?" And then the giant sandworms come. And the Fremen are riding the giant sandworms into battle. It's a really cool moment. I do wonder, though, why they don't do this more. <laughs> yeah, it, it seemed like there. Were, it seemed like the indication was that they've never thought to do this until Paul started leading them. Because why don't you do this? Why well, it never <laughs> seemed like a good idea. <laughs> Honestly, uh, at least I'm not gay. <laughs> I need a little bit better, like, because uh, they don't, like, to be clear, they don't say, oh, we never thought of that before. That just seems to be the implication. Um, I'm going to need a line to explain why you don't usually do this or something. Maybe you could do something to the effect of, like, um, I don't know if there's a way to make it so that the worms don't usually go into battle for you and it takes some sort, like, being tamed or controlled by someone with a mastery over them to like allow them to even do this you know something like that they don't mind transporting but they don't want to fight and then something like that 
yeah, yeah or like, yeah, like, yeah, like yeah. it's it's hard enough to tame them to ride them to get them where you want to go but to like ride them into battle is kind of like something you really need to be an expert at something that's like actually, that that reminds me speaking of overpowered weapons why, why isn't paul using the voice more in like like single combat like like you figure he could just be like kill yourself <laughs> jump off a, a cliff <laughs> Go ride a sandworm. <laughs> and they try and they fail. And... <laughs> that would well, be the best he... way to kill people. Yeah. It was an accident, I swear. <laughs> That's weird, Paul. Every time that happens, you talk to them before and tell them to try something and they always die. It's like, I don't know. <laughs> Unlucky, I guess. In our two chats, I see d two different possible explanations for why they don't ride the worms in battle. One of them, calling the worms and getting them ready to ride probably takes a lot of prep time. It doesn't actually seem like it takes all that long, especially when Paul calls one and then it just shows up. Um, so I don't buy that mm. as an excuse. Another one I see, uh, this is a, from a person who I've seen a lot in the chat making references to the book. So apparently, according to this Cecil in the chat, uh, in the books, it was kept secret. The relationship between the Fremen and the makers, that is the worms, is supposed to be hidden. Okay. Um, that, might ex <laughs> that might go yeah, some I way of explaining why they don't ally with them so openly though that is not mentioned in these movies yeah, that's yeah it's basically they want to they don't want people to know that they can do it um because that's how okay. they like disappear that's basically the, the main thing is right. like and the emperor doesn't even know about it yeah yes yeah. um so okay by that's doing the... it in a large-scale assault they would reveal this fact and you know like i guess you could say that they weren't confident they could win before Paul showed up, I guess is the best way. So they wouldn't have risked it. it at that yeah, point. Fair point. Okay. I, okay. I think that's a reasonable explanation at least. Uh, yeah. I would love it if it was in the movie, but yes. Yeah. Yeah. Without it, shield... yeah. I'm left wondering why they don't do that all the time. And I do think you probably need that line. Yeah. It's a, I didn't even think about that watching the movie or reading the book. Um, trying to think. I mean, the shield wall had to get blown up before they could ride a worm through there. So that was Paul. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, as far as are you talking about just any combat period, like the spice harvesters, because they'll get picked up by a balloon before the the worms could even get to them. Well, that's um, not that's that, not them using in that's combat. Though. That's just them being. Uh, but they the, try to ride them to the raid the spice harvesters. Oh, then the the balloons will see them. Okay. They'll see them point. from real far away. I yes, I I agree. That's a fair point. Yeah. That in terms of attacking the spice harvesting right. Right. Um, yeah. machine, that wouldn't work. But in yeah. this battle, um, oh, because they can use they the, don't the they don't usually okay. engage in the open combat either. You're it's right. Like the, you're right. The main yeah. thing. No, that's you're totally right. I can't actually think of another situation where that would actually do them any benefit because I believe the main city itself. Uh, Arakeen, the one with the big ziggurat, yeah. however you say it, that has a big uh, fortified wall that would yeah. disallow a worm to even get in an attack, right? Yeah, and oh, it's on and it, rock. It's it, built it, on it, rock. And, and right. even if it got through, the city is, he designed it. I watched the behind the scenes and the um, production design was uh, designed in a way that's like, I guess it, the the headquarter the where people live is so far away from the, the and the worm would never make it through the city it would just like you know mm -hmm. what i mean there's a bunch yeah. of buildings and infrastructure like in the front and then there's yeah. a shield wall i don't think i think it's impenetrable really I, yeah they, they only get, the worms cannot get through okay and they so that, actually, that, yeah. that answers sure. the point better than whether it, it needs to be kept secret strategically right. whether they can ride them that the fact that like it wouldn't really do them any good in their combat until this battle. So, okay. Yeah. I problem yeah. solved as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> All right. So, uh, the, it, the, the sandworms come and they just like fucking wreck these Sardaukar. And it's pretty great. It's pretty I like the watch. one guy who still has his blade up, points it at a thing. And it's like, um, <laughs> yeah. no, actually, I'm going to run away now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just one like one of these paralyzed things. Like, yeah. uh, I don't know. My I don't. I wasn't trained for this. <laughs> I I would run away. Um, oh yeah, fuck yeah, I'd run absolutely. Away. Um, I think no, I really. Someone, someone asked like, uh, and it's a it's a good question. 
one assumes based on the events of the movie uh how vulnerable to arms fire the worms are they seem pretty much like tanks they mm-hmm. seem beefy yeah but like yeah. I, you know I, who knows yeah, man really impenetrable like even the hooks that they throw in them are just around the flaps they're not like yeah. Skin. yeah let's say like, like, I, what... when we get so, i get so annoyed whenever i see these like giant like, like whenever missiles don't do any damage at all to just like animals in the wild right. in these movies i'm like i don't know like just that you know elephant guns exist for a reason like they're not going to just tank everything you know they're yeah. they're flesh and bone like the rest of us yeah that's, that's not I, to say that they would have had any real time to shoot like large right. like artillery fire at the worms which are moving quickly and came as a surprise and all that yeah. um but i do i'm just kind of curious you know how much yeah how if much you, damage you, the worms could tank mm-hmm if if you cut one of these worms in half, did they just turn into two worms? Oh, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's oh, oh, actually, I don't know. Maybe that's in God Emperor. Who knows? I want to fire one of those blue lasers at the worms for science to see what happens. <laughs> um. So the battle continues. The worms are attacking, and everyone else is riding in. Now this is one small problem i have i don't know if it bothered anyone else it's it's a very hollywood type approach to warfare where at a certain point they just all run at each other in a big mess <laughs> no right. end game yeah. it's like okay i mean you don't have like fronts or try to flank people you know it just seemed very kind of chaotic in a way that probably wouldn't be how they fought but that's all right it's a small battle of the bastards stuff where it's yeah. like oh yeah well, it was just a battle whatever they run at each other yeah, I mean, attacking them from all three sides, that's a strategy. That's you know. not how you're supposed to play Total War. What are they doing? <laughs> exactly. Uh, what are you doing? you got to drag the cursor and uh, a loop and hold control alt and then... <laughs> Wait, where are you okay. archers, goddammit? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, the battle where is are they? going... They're, they're ranged stuff anyway no that i think about and it that's it i mean that's one of those questions that's that i um like, kind of don't quickly. use shields right <laughs> so like the fremen are vulnerable to arms fire and rifle fire so you would think there might have been more of that you know i know they took them by surprise i'm okay with this but you know yeah we didn't see a lot of people pulling out rifles and the, shooting at the fremen but i think it's the scene itself problems. it's not very long either so yeah, yeah. it's, it go, it's over quick. quick it's very quick yeah, and that's a, and then, that is a pretty accurate adaptation of how it happens very, in the book. It's just done. Like oh, it's like, oh yeah, by the way, we took the, yeah, we took the city. It's like one pair. I was listening to it on audiobook and I had it at like 1.5 speed because I'm trying to get through it before the movie comes out and, <laughs> and 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 I was like, I don't know, I think I was like just on Twitter and I was listening to it and then I I like zoned out for about 10 seconds and I missed the entire fight. <laughs> it was like I was like, wait a minute, fuck. I, I missed the I missed drama, drama. and then I had to rewind it. <laughs> It's annoying. I don't as the don't. as the battle rages outside everyone inside the emperor's yeah. metal ship thingy are awaiting the eventual yeah. siege which eventually comes I like uh, how they, they go into formation as soon as they yes. realize there's like a ruckus like they have like a line in front of all the important people and then some mm-hmm. more at the front. It's kind of cool. It's just a neat little yeah. detail I really enjoyed. A, ru- a ruckus on a rackus. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um and then they 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 blast the door in, and Paul comes in first through the cloud of dust. There's lots of clouds of dust in this movie, and mm. Paul walks past the Sardaukar, who've kind of like moved off to the side, mm. protecting uh, the Emperor, his daughter, the Bene Gesserit, all that fun stuff. And he sees Baron, who's in his like fat, <laughs> like yeah. can't pick himself up state, <laughs> is still <laughs> trying to climb towards the throne. Um, not sure why, what he hopes to accomplish there, but there he goes. And so Paul Who walks up to down. him. <laughs> he just oh. wanted to sit on the throne, yeah. He went, he went fair. He went like a lizard brain at the end. Yeah, he did. Like, I bit. have to sit on throne before I die. <laughs> yeah. Yes. yeah. Uh, a detail we probably should have mentioned earlier. Once he takes the water of life, Paul learns that uh, Jessica is actually the daughter of Baron Harkonnen. Oh, yeah, that's what? right. Yeah. Twist. yeah, that is important. <laughs> daughter of the evil man. And he, he asks if she knew, and she says, I didn't know until I took the water of life. I'm like, ah, yeah. that's interesting. So he's what he's realized 
is uh, this other kind of classic storytelling, especially mythological storytelling trope of that he's like part of his lineage is the noble lineage, part of his lineage is the evil lineage yeah. as well. He's yes. kind of somewhere in between. So he he is the uh, nef no grandson grandson yes. yeah grandson yeah. of yeah. Baron Harkonnen, and so when it comes time, he walks up to Baron Harkonnen and he stabs him in the neck, and he says yeah. he calls him he calls grandfather him. or something like that as he kills him. Uh, did he say anything else there? I don't think so. Yeah. I think he just silently yeah. walks toward him and just stabs him yeah. in the neck. The cool that I. I almost applauded because um, <laughs> somebody yelled at Trades real loud when the thing got blown open in my theater. <laughs> uh, the door, the wall got blown open, and then every, so everybody was already hyped. And then the fact that Paul just confidently walks past everyone, including the Emperor, and not a single person is is like everyone's cowardly and afraid to even do anything. And mm -hmm. he just stabs Harkonnen in the neck mm -hmm. in front of everybody, and nobody does anything. To me, that's uh, like the most so badass thing in the movie. Yeah. So it's badass. Pretty, pretty good. <laughs> I love it. He that calls part. him grandfather right before he kills him. That's pretty that's pretty yeah. harsh too. I like that. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. And then now time for the sort of conflict with the Emperor. Oh yeah. Uh, I don't remember exactly what he says, but he walks over to the Emperor, kind of walks right up to the swords of the Sardis. He tells him to take them prisoner. Yeah, I don't think uh, they talk he talks to him directly now. He's just like okay, take the okay. take them to the residency and well I, that's the fight basically. They won. Yep. He says, Yeah, take them prisoner, and then he says this in the Fremen language so they don't understand. He says, Kill yeah. all the Sardaukar and take them. And so they so take them take prisoner. Take their water and something, yeah. Yeah, so they have defeated. They have won the day. Bam, Hurrah. Bam, bam. Yeah. Now, yeah um, now... Okay, so there's a couple people in the chat real quick who are pointing out that uh, Aaliyah in the, the book, Anya the book. Taylor Joy in the book, is the one who kills the Baron. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, like that's, a, that's like just a, a change. Like, that, yeah, she's a five year old who comes, she's in, in the it... room. And that, she kills was, him. that was done in service of avoiding the time jump, though, right? Because they couldn't age up the actors that quickly. I'm like, sure. I don't know. I don't know if it was either the acting, the actors, uh, or if it was the time, uh, the fact they didn't want to do a, you know, like a child Aaliyah being weird, like really creepy and weird, because mm -hmm. people hated that. And uh, I think Villeneuve just decided to not do it for a purely because that's his. He didn't want to do yeah. it. I, I am I am not sure. Sorry, Mark. Go ahead. I, I was just saying I thought her being a fetus worked really well in this. Movie. I agree. I agree. Yeah, I'm with you guys on this one. I I'm not sure because I've seen some comments in our chat that are saying things like that really changes Aaliyah's whole history and all that. And I I don't remember that being the case. But I've only read two of them, right? So I'm not like mm. the super yeah. fan who knows what she. I know she plays a much bigger role in the third book uh, and i don't know if it affects how that story goes um i did not have as much of a problem with it in in no. this uh, i didn't think it was a, like, an omission that really kind of like stood out to me glaringly what else? um i'll say yeah. that based on nothing else other than what you've just said i prefer this a lot more i yeah. prefer that paul gets to be the one to kill him yeah that's great that yeah, really and it, it makes because Paul like Gurney kills Raban in this version, which I like mm -hmm. a lot because it gives them him some you know a little bit of closure there. Mm -hmm. And yeah. in yeah, we Paul gets to fight Fade, you know Fade Rautha, but that always even in the in the book version that always kind of like stuck with like, like it stuck in my craw a little bit because I was like, well, you know, like yeah, it's I guess it makes sense. He's killing, you know, he's fighting his cousin who is another mm -hmm. prospect, but they don't, they've never met. Like they don't know each other. There's not as much weight there. This as isn't there Darth is. Vader. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not Luke I, and Darth Vader or, or Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin. This is not the same. They only have a blood connection, not a physical connection, but it, like a lot yeah. of the stuff yeah. in this, this movie, at least, or like these two movies is based around blood lineage and that yes. being extremely important so i th i think that it's actually kind of interesting that his only connection to him effectively is blood that they're total strangers mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah and so oh, well he there, gets... there, there's the benny jesser at uh uh Gam Gamjabar. they both participated in that there's also some other like things that they're 
paralleling each other in in different ways. I yeah. really like that he gets to kill him. I really like that this is a sort of fulfillment of an early scene in this movie where yeah. he's talking to Jessica and he's talking about how he's going to kill the Baron and mm -hmm. then the Emperor or something to that effect. And Jessica says, your father didn't care about revenge. He's like, yeah, well, I do. It's like, right, Ooh. right. That's yeah, it's a little, <laughs> little hint of the... I am I not my I father. <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't want to strictly call that his dark side necessarily, but like there's a little hint of that coming through and that like now that he's become this this character um that that he gets to take his revenge. I like that. It's really good. And I if if all else the same, his little like 5-year-old weirdo adult child sister killed him instead, I'd be like, "Oh, what the fuck?" Like <laughs> yeah. some people, that's what I'm saying. Den Denis knew a lot of people would hate, would hate that shit. So I think he just got rid of it. Yeah. You know, maybe maybe um, there are other things you lose by getting rid of that, but I think right. letting Paul I'm kill not, the yeah. Baron, not really. That's great. Aaliyah I don't just... know. I don't know if you lose all that much, honestly. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm yeah. I was just one. allowing for the possibility. <laughs> yeah. I, I also I think though that it helps the the narrative thrust taking out the time jump there, like having it be yeah, like yeah. they just escaped to the desert and this situation is on and developing rapidly because it's a big deal as opposed to he has time to spend years in the desert and like the you know the yeah. sister get older and stuff. Right, a little more urgent. Definitely makes for a more cinematic experience, yeah, for sure. Yep. Oh, yeah. Symbolically, I do like the length of time in the novel. I think that that's one of the stronger, yeah, the stronger symbolic oh. things. Uh, but I, I under, like, it, for the sake of the movie, I think it works very well. And and they don't have, and Shani, they have a kid in the movies, in the book. It, uh, yeah, they do. They so, have a kid who gets blown up in one of the sieges, which oh, is no. another, yeah. So Paul's son dies, and, uh, that's another part of his revenge, basically. But that's another thing. It's like, yeah, they, they had to, for a cinematic movie, movie yeah. have, that's a big, that that would be another 20 minutes. Yeah, I, I feel I like really you know, want to well, do like that full... be more like, you, then you have to explore, you know, his ideas of fatherhood and, you know, right. what, like, how being a father looks in Fremen society, which we're not diving into in this movie for no. sure, because that would be way too long. And then, you know, I don't know if the the kid because uh, he names his first son who gets killed Leto. I don't know if that kid comes back at any point later on. Like for all I know, it it might happen, but um, I, I don't remember. Like it doesn't really add that much. Even in Messiah, no. it doesn't drive anything happening in the second book. Really, like there's there's not all that much going on. And he's not it. even so I think it's a smart to cut. his. Yeah, he wasn't even attached to his kid in the book. He sends him away, never even sees him, you know? So I yeah, I think it was fine. I think, yeah. yeah, I think that I think those those trimmings work work yeah. well. Um but somebody so in our chat somebody's saying that Aaliyah has vision conversations with the Baron in Children of Dune, one of the ones I haven't got to. Okay. Um so her her not killing him causes uh, he says kind of undermines that. I, I don't know. I think you could well, probably handle that yeah. moving Here's forward. The thing, if he's never going to make Children of Dune, because he's only he's yeah. in movies, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. He's not. He he can do what he wants. This is not like Jan Ryan Johnson coming in and fucking up somebody else's thing. Like, this is his vision. Yeah. yeah. If he's, when he, if all if we're doing wants, is, yeah. you know, one and Messiah, you know, like, right, if, right, we don't yeah. need to consider the storytelling implications for children just yet. We don't even know if we're going to get a Messiah, you know? So, yeah. like, I really hope we do. And I really hope that one is conclusive because I would really like this to have an ending. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah, don't want to with you. like, oh, like, let's just let mm -hmm. it. He's already out. writing it. Um, the the com the composer of this uh, movie said Hansel. that he already got a script, uh, dropped okay. on his desk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he nice. said that Villeneuve walked in silently with like n didn't say anything and just threw the script down. Dune Messiah right on his desk. This is like confirmed. Oh, so, nice. well, yeah, we got that I am looking forward to it. I Actually, definitely. I, it seems I think that may have been the book itself. Not okay. well, maybe the book. Pick. Yeah, maybe the book. But 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 it's gonna, like I'm saying, it's like he's gonna do it unless he dies. Yeah. <laughs> oh, for sure. I think um, it was the case with like Dune Part Two. Like he had written the script in advance so that once the project was greenlit, he could just go oh, yeah. straight into production. And also, yeah. uh, he had Hans Zimmer compose the score early on to like help inspire yeah. 
him to like write the script, mm. which I think is a great idea. That's yeah. a great idea. Yeah. Um, for those curious, because uh, I was wondering how this movie would do. Because if you remember, after the first movie, it was kind of a question of whether they were going to greenlight the second, kind of had to do well. Mm -hmm. They had to wait and see. And then not long, maybe a couple weeks after its premiere, they greenlit the second one and announced it publicly. Uh, this movie is doing better than the first movie financially. Twice it is art. Twice nice. It has already made $178.5 million. million dollars worldwide wow. on a $190 million budget. So Not that's bad. a pretty good opening weekend. Wait, this was only it, 190 million? Yes. <laughs> Which is a lot, but this yeah, movie Yeah, but I'm looks comparing it so to expensive. what fucking yeah. Marvel spends on hidden yeah. exactly. exactly. like trash exactly. fires they create. It's just that's the price of the Marvels. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's wild. Denis Villeneuve is a gifted director for a lot of reasons, one of them being that he knows how to manage a budget, I think. And yeah, and a, I mean the thing is and Avatar, I think if yeah. you if you just write down things you want to do, you're already doing better planning than Marvel Studios do. Just, just <laughs> knowing what yeah. you want to do in advance, you're already like five steps ahead of them. Yes. Or so, or Halo or Rings of Power, like those budgets are Halo budget is doesn't even make sense with what, what what's on the screen. It makes no sense at all. I don't remember Rings of Power. <laughs> like um, comes out don't get me started. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. So but Avatar, it's, 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 Avatar it was three hundred million. I even think Avatar was half that because the, so a lot of that was for part three and developing the technology uh for, for the entire mm -hmm. you know, half the it's like three hundred million dollars or something for Avatar: Way of the Water, but but I'm, some of that is definitely for Part Three and the technology that it took to invent. So even Avatar is like crushing. Our Cam James Cameron knows how to how to save money. Yeah, more than more the one so bit. A better example of just money yeah. that away. <laughs> like that was like a three hundred million dollar budget for what? Right? For Indiana? For which one? Oh. Uh, for Wait, the Marvels, Marvels, the Marvels, yeah, the Marvels, yeah, the Marvels, oh. twice what Dune do did, and that's wild. Yeah, so there's a couple of things. Obviously, it's already been said that he seems to know where how to spend the money better. That seems obvious. Another thing um, is that when you have a director and a story that people really want to work on, actors yeah. will do it for less money. No one yeah, is going to work true. for less than they're worth on the Marvels. Okay, yeah. everyone's everyone working yeah. on these MCU movies is just going to bleed them for as much as they can because they don't want to work on these movies because they're probably not going to be good. Meanwhile, yeah. you have people who are, would be begging to be in a movie like Dune because they trust Denis Villeneuve. They like the story. They know it's going to be a big hit. There was a, it was a whole big thing when uh, Dune won. It came out on HBO Max the same day as it was in theaters. Um, they were upset about that because a lot of actors had were, had taken pay cuts um for back end deals which means yeah. they would get more of a percentage of the the revenue than the than they got money up front because they knew the movie was going to be a success mm. so That's a lot of them cool. yeah. yeah scarlett johansson sued disney for that right that was for black oh, widow, widow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was yeah, yeah. 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 So it's that's another one thing of the ways that they, I, I remember when the casting for Dune was announced, everybody was looking at it like this is an IMDb fan casting list, you know, and <laughs> yeah. Javier Bardem and Jason Momoa are perfect for the roles that they're playing. And <laughs> Timothy Chalamet looks like a young Twinkie or Kyle MacLachlan. So, you know, we've got everything we need for a, a good Dune movie, every, as, uh, but they're taking less money to be in these in these roles in these movies that are gonna get set you know set as a standard right yeah like a sci-fi standard I, one yeah. of the reasons i wanted to mention that point specifically is i think a lot of people who are looking at like the ballooning of budgets in these movies fail to consider how much uh that the movie might actually be good incentivizes actors to work for less what? because they want to work yeah, with weird, huh? <laughs> yeah i know that's you know, ridiculous. if they if they if they have if they reasonably think it's going to be really good, they might work for less. I mean, you ever wonder how a Wes Anderson movie has the stacked cast that it does and only costs like fifteen million dollars because they want to work <laughs> right. with them. Mm -hmm. So if you make yep. good stuff, you know, they don't even have to be that expensive. Anyway, that's my rant. Um, <laughs> it's a good. Point, hopefully, yeah. the movie does well. I'm ex I'm I'm. It seems to be doing well so far. Yeah. I hope it makes enough that they greenlight three with ease. Do we it... now back? To the story, I, see it again on I think Warner Tuesday. Brothers will, I think, absolutely give it to him. It just comes down to when Denny wants to do it. <laughs> Pretty much, because yeah. I think uh, I think he's just done with Doom. You guys while. see my picture I sent you? Yeah, you can I'm you put that on? Yeah, Doom. I will be putting this up on Thank screen. You. Right now, yes. <laughs>
I love it. I love it. <laughs> 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 he <laughs> <laughs> he should have done the, did the nose thing where he pulls his nose off with his thumb. <laughs> I love that. Man, this is going to be memed forever. It's like an already iconic m- meme movie <laughs> moment. Yeah. There's some you good know? memes. There we go. It's on <laughs> screen. There it is. Beautiful. You'll That's love it? to see it. That's funny. Oh, damn it, it's too, too large. Ah, we beat it, you to it. Suck it. that. <laughs> it was not cropped properly for my fleems. Oh no, it's too tall. <laughs> Lisa, I'll get you. I got oh, my border is in the way from this. <laughs> Lisa, <I'll get> you. <laughs> Good meme. Good shit. Good meme. Good so memes. we are we are almost at the end. Yeah, Let's right. power through. Oh, I thought we were. <laughs> no, Oops. we have we have a big scene. Oh, the fight! Yeah, 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 the fight yeah, scene yeah. going on. Yeah. So. Uh, everyone is gathered in the sort of headquarters of the, uh, yeah. I don't even know what, what room are they in actually? That's Doesn't the, matter. um, it's the palace room. room. Yeah. The, yeah the it's, room. it's the same room that they moved into in the first one, basically. Right. Okay. They are back in that palace and he has the prisoners, the emperor, his daughter, the Bene Gesserit, Fade, and those sort of folks. And, uh, then they discard, start discussing their plans and things now you got, you'll have to help me remember specific lines because there's important things said here and i'm fuzzy on some of the finer details um uh i think the first thing that happens if i'm not mistaken is that paul says that like he is going to take over the throne like that's the first thing he says is it not like that's his first move well before they before like, they get in he he talks briefly to shawnee to tell her she's going to love her as long as he breathes because he knows what right. he's about to do. Correct. Yes. And so now he has the yeah. emperor uh, uh, as a captive and he says, I'm going, basically he says, I'm going to take over as emperor, right? Yes. Something to that, that Pretty much something to that effect. Yeah. And the emperor says, I'll like, take the hand of your daughter. Yes. I'll take the hand of your daughter and then we will rule together. And the Emperor's like, are you fucking crazy? No Nuh-uh. fucking way am I doing that. Nuh-uh. And, and he's like, by the way, all the, see all those ships out in space? Those are the other 12 houses. They're going to come here. And like, they're not going to let you do this. And he's like, oh, how do you know they're not here? Like, yeah, like why do you maybe they want to hear me? mice. Because yeah, we, maybe we they want to hear mice. That the, the Baron has uh, called them over to basically... Rue, I think yes. you wanted to snitch on him that he was... Uh, uh, the one he was who in Kabo- the yeah that he was the one who yeah who got the Atreides thing yeah yes and but but Paul says like maybe they'll want to hear my side of the story that story being that because the rest of the houses don't know that mm-hmm. the Emperor allowed the Harkonnen and lent him his army to wipe out House Atreides if they found that out they would be very much suspicious of the Emperor you know that the, that he would plan against one of the great houses so. He has that to sort of lord over him, like you know, you know. Okay, maybe I'll tell them what you did to House Atreides, and um, then I think somewhere in here I might be missing something. Oh no, Christopher Walken tells him why he killed his father and his house. He said because he was a weak. He, a weak, he was yeah. weak. He we was going too too far with the uh, the way of like emotions or love or something the rules of the heart He's yeah not, he, he wasn't ruling hard yeah he was like a weak he ruler was... and he was a weak man mm-hmm. and so uh that upsets paul naturally mm-hmm. i think i think at this point paul uh, paul challenges him to is this when he challenges like, yeah, but he, he like... tells him uh your, your daughter is gonna live uh gonna live I, i'll keep her safe but you have to answer for your crimes uh, yes, and he basically does the um, the same thing. Uh, Jam- Jamis did to him. It's like uh, yeah, choose st- your champion or stand yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Um, right, but right before he challenges him in that way, I want to highlight the moment where he says, "Like I will take your daughter's hand in marriage, and we'll rule the empire together." Uh, we cut to Chani, mm-hmm. who was upset by this. Now I've seen some dismissive comments, not necessarily in chat today, but elsewhere on the internet, that like, oh. 
like what they did with Chani make her kind of like butt hurt at the idea of him wanting to be with someone else. It's like I think that's a little reductive because mm-hmm. it's not just that he that she loves him and wants to be with him. It's that like he is this is proof like as we mentioned that he, earlier yeah. that that he has greater ambitions and that he craves power and that he wants power and that he wants more than yep. just to lead the friend or at to least victory. to her yeah yes it, and so it, she's it's proof to her of that now and and it makes i think it, it makes sense i just i think that uh, there is definitely a lot of criticism that i've seen also that this wouldn't this wouldn't be as big of a deal if they had kept the polygamy aspect from the book in the movie because it is sort of just something that the Fremen do. Mm-hmm. Well, so, I think I think the choice to remove that kind of makes this moment stronger. Make it, yeah, it makes the moment it makes this character moment stronger. Yes, but given that he is very interested in it, like again thinking from the perspective of somebody who's super into these, right? Like I don't care if he changes the Messiah story very much because I don't really like it, but somebody who really does like the Messiah story, hearing that this guy wants to adapt Messiah sees this happen and goes, well, now what's he going to do with this? Like what, what's he doing with my story? Right. Like yeah. what's he doing with the one that I, I that I know it's like a rewrite. That's what I, so I would, I've seen some criticism of from that angle. And yeah. I, like I can see that's like that's kind of I can see where that would be valid, right? Like if you're really into the second one, well, it has the potential to be it's valid, hard. you know, in terms yeah. of like because he, he could change all the necessary details to do something really strong in the third movie. Yeah. Wait, what I'm detail are, are we? What, he does. What, what what detail are you um, narrowing in on now? Are you talking about Paul's response? Response to who? I, I missed what we're talking about. I, Chani's response to Paul saying he will take uh, the emperor's daughter's hand in marriage. Yeah. yeah. So and, in, oh, in she, this she version, gets mad. In, yeah, because in yeah. this version, she she gets very she gets very upset by this. Um, not just because Paul, like, and like we've we were saying, it's not just because Paul is choosing someone else over her. No, but it's, it's, it's going back. It's confirmation. Right? Yeah. He's going back on his word from what, mm-hmm. yeah, it, it basically is, it's him shifting to being the emperor instead of, you know, who she thought he was, right? Or being like the prophet, yes. right? Well, mm-hmm. yeah, but also she is like a little naive because like he just uh, got, got, uh, drank the, um, the, that magic water. <laughs> and uh, now he like knows what, like he has just so much more knowledge than he did before. Like he's not changed. I think Paul changed, he couldn't help but change like it, it was it was the yeah. result of drinking that water yeah. it's not like he became a different person so therefore she doesn't love him anymore i just think he had no choice like she should stick by him probably i don't know because i think like it makes sense for her it makes sense for her to be hurt by this right because she well, yeah. she's right and I, I like you know if even if she eventually comes around to to it in the next one mm-hmm. right i like that this allows her the opportunity to be to be hurt by this revelation what i'm like the one thing that i was saying regarding the you know the adaptation thing is that it does significantly alter how the story of the next one is going and for somebody from the perspective of someone who really likes the next book that would you could i could see where if somebody was like oh my god this guy understands dune he really wants to adapt my favorite chapter being messiah don't know if anybody would actually say that probably somebody <laughs> yeah. right but it's like oh he's he really wants to do it and then he like they see that and they go well but okay but yeah. like that's not how it that's a totally yeah. different thing so it, it's a different story i'm okay with it uh, i do that there is somebody in our chat who's talking about how um jessica calm because jessica is just a concubine for his father never marries jessica in the in Mm, the book and so nor in the movie nor Nor in the movie but when when chani she is upset in the book when he reveals that he is going to marry irulan instead right um jessica calms her down and basically says like like maybe not calms her down but comforts her in her grief and basically says there's a line that where she says history will call us wives basically being like you on the surface yeah he's not going to be married to you you're just the concubine right but history is going to remember you as his wife right mm. and yes that's a, oh. it's a strong parallel between him jessica and his father and, and jessica, jessica and Johnny. 
Also, and that, they got rid of that. And that's by part of this change. Well, the, 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 a lot of the book talks about how history is written. Um, uh, you know, like for example, the betrayer betrayal of of du- of the Duke was uh, the history books. W- who was it again? It was um, uh, shoot, Doctor Yui. He oh, is yeah, yeah. known. Yeah, he's known as like pure evil in in the history books, but it's so much more complicated than that. And um, so, like people how they view how you people are viewed in like uh you know 100 years from now or whatever 1000 years from now is a very big theme in the in the books um, yeah mm-hmm. so and the fact that like Shawnee and Jessica like shared that together was nice i just it's just one line for me though it doesn't really like i don't need i it's in the book i don't need it in the movie also i understand that it's a mm-hmm. powerful like it, 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 it well not, okay that's yeah. but i i you know if somebody who is a big who is a big fan wants to see their yeah. favorite thing adapted well and then sure. they come in and yeah. they see you know a real a solid adaptation but that's missing what right. i think you you would agree is a pretty large thematic yeah. component or it's making a change that seems at the moment to be kind of I, undermining that a little bit i'm, I'm not convinced yeah. that it's doing that for good i think that there is a way to make it work the way he's done it and right. i'm i'm willing to let it play out right but I can understand why people who like yeah. would yeah, react I mean, the way that they are yeah. reacting. I'm not. I'm not saying that I don't understand anyone not liking it. But I'm, I'm just talking about sort of objectively criticizing what we have so far. But I wanted right. to ask you a question because I haven't read the books. In like what perspectives are the? Uh, uh, in what perspective is the book written? Is it sort of an omniscient third person <laughs> yeah. perspective, or does it? It's, third, it's a. It's a third person. Okay, so it's written just by some narration. Who knows everything. Yeah, Paul did this. Chani said this. Mm-hmm. The Baron la- cackled, and you know, except for Irulan, every chapter opens with Irulan's reading her history book. But the book is yes. not written like a history book. I mean, I'm sorry, the book is written sort of like that. It's not like from the perspective of anybody, really. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Irulan, right. Irulan writes a history while she's married to Paul. Um, yeah. And the, all of the every chapter opens with a new like passage from that history that gives you sort of yeah. world building details and everything like that. Um, OK, so I need to respond to, to Cecil in chat. It says the point is the change was made because modern day woman strong, not concubines. I don't agree with that in the slightest. Yes. No, I don't, I don't agree to go that far. Well, the reason is no, because <laughs> Jessica is a concubine, a concubine in the movie. Oh, well, sorry, Mark. yeah, <laughs> but the change, the change for Chani, that is. Uh, the, I know, but if, that, if, if the uh, argument is that I don't know, it's like woke or something, well, then why is Jessica a concubine? Why, why didn't they change that for her, too? It's not because... That, it's that's a definite part of it the other change is i i don't it didn't occur to yeah. me at all that the point was oh she needs to be a strong mm-hmm. woman it's str- like this sort of strong woman syndrome approach to writing female characters wouldn't have them be emotional and vulnerable which is what no. she is in this yep. moment she gets really and, upset about it and she loses right? everything she lost yeah all one. So like, <laughs> no i don't agree with that in the slightest <laughs> yeah it's not it is it is to improve upon her character maybe a little bit give her more I actually think it's it's to the whole theme of the Messiah complex, like being afraid of the the this person is very narration heavy and monologue heavy in the book. And the only way to make that happen in the movie and get that point across is if you distill that into a, like a character, which they did with Shawnee. Yeah, that's yeah, why that's I think. Perspective. Yes, that's that's I why agree. I think. Yeah. And that's why I think he wrote her that way so that she could be relatable. So we could relate to that fear of a Messiah. Otherwise, the whole point of the book would be gone and the movie wouldn't even exist. You know, that's why it changed. So he says that Chani was uh, far more prominent. That's why she goes off on her own in the end. Uh, Let's be honest here. I think we are being honest about this. You know, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a strong woman type situation. I think she is there to, no, I, I think she's there to be, the like the the signpost if you like it, it, for this this theme of like not wanting him to be like because i think one of the there there's a lot of articles that you can find about dune messiah about how people reacted very negatively to paul sort of being cast in a more villainous light once you get into the second book because people viewed the first one like the first one's a very straightforward kind of hero's journey right like they dropped the ideas of the jihad and everything like that 
but it's not really it, it it doesn't resolve in the way of like cluing you they in that he's about to go kill billions of people right so like they interpreted they, they, it like he's a messiah not a false messiah yeah yeah so i i think that the, the way that they do chani here is a way of keeping that character giving that character a little more substance or a little more to do and then also sort of giving you that giving the audience that kind of person to identify with as like looking for at paul from the outside in right yeah like the she's... voice of the voice of the anti-messiah prophet thing like the voice of that perspective is her in the movie yes right? he's yeah. the person who doesn't want tim to become so obsessed with power that he becomes something that he's not he, he, she really admires him in the beginning and falls in love with who he is and then sort of sees him going down a path that leads to something that she doesn't believe in so like without her and her perspective in this movie you don't really have anyone to voice the strong concern against what's going to happen other than paul's own so, sort of concern in the beginning which is how like, it works in the book is, is is it's all in paul's head this sort of like internal narration of like oh man i really need to be careful here because otherwise i could launch an entire holy jihad that burns yeah. the, like humanity and her her being there to realize that he's sort of gone off gone off the rails or that he's gone too far down that path now and to feel the betrayal of it and the loss of it like i really like these moments with her especially towards the end and i i find it very reductive to say that the only reason to make that change for her is because strong woman i feel like it adds a lot of drama and yeah it, really strong any, character moments to the story if anything another it's like they even turn jessica is not this way in the book at all she is more demonic in this movie for sure she's way more uh sympathetic towards paul at the end of the book she's more supportive um she even says please marry shawnee don't don't do the don't you know but she doesn't did you guys get a sense in the book that she was trying to manipulate paul the whole time i mean sorry in the movie <laughs> in this movie Who, that, jessica? That, that jessica was trying well, to, to manipulate yeah. paul and and she never broke away from that, like the at, at, up until the very end of the movie. That was her goal. I, because I mean, in the I guess in the book, that, that's what different. You mean by manipulate him, because she she sure she certainly does try to present him with information in a way that makes him want look more to like a god. Want, yeah, no, that makes him want to do the things that she wants him to do. Yeah, so you can argue that is manipulative, but it's also like well. I mean, you have to tell people things somehow, right? <laughs> right. Well, I was just bringing this up because in the, to put it to them is, yeah, yeah. But in the in the book, she um, she dials this back. Like, who's the other person that read this book? I can't remember. Um, in this stream, <laughs> me? you back me up. You 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 know what I'm talking about, right? Like, doesn't doesn't she at one point say, "Oh, I went too far with basically with my pushing him too far." It's a big part of the, does. End of the book. Yeah, there's yeah. there's moments where she's I mean, she's always worried about that throughout the whole thing. But there are moments yeah. where she's she's worried about what's happening um, yes. and about him mm -hmm. losing. Like She's the one who sort of like gets more worried about the whole thing. They kind of removed that and put that on Chani. Like they moved yeah. it around. During yeah, because his speech yeah. too. Yeah. like when when he has that big speech in front of all the Fremen, she you see her say slow down like you're you're pushing too hard like she 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 does and, kind of have that yeah. moment where she's like oh my god no he's he, he's gonna uh, like, drive this whole thing off the rails like she has well she has a moment where she's actually afraid of him yeah yeah i i took that to mean more that she was worried he was going like too fast too soon kind of thing not right. that she was worried that he would go too far down the path in this she seems to have been rather utterly consumed by the Bene Gesserit yes. agenda, for lack of a better term. Um, yeah. And so. she's become that now. She's kind of lost the individual Humanity. mother of Paul side of her. And... and more... Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah. And? Well, and and she's lost that part of her. The mother part, You. that's why I wanted to chime in, because in the book... When Aaliyah's born, she has this moment with Aaliyah where she realizes that she did so much, tr caused so much trauma to Aaliyah in the womb and how she feels horrible about it in the book. And she's like, 
you know, they're calling her an abomination. And the fact that she, as a fetus, she was like experiencing all of this trauma with like her, her brain, like, you know, becoming, yeah. you know, and while her brain Jessica is forming, feels, she's experiencing like all the aspects of life yeah, as they, a woman on this planet. Yeah. They call it like, like grape in the book. <laughs> they call it like, uh, like she was being assault, like uh, assaulted mind, mind. Fucked. Yeah. And, um, and Jessica feels horrible, and there's a beautiful moment where she, you know, um, Aaliyah's like, "Am I a, am I a freak?" And she's like, "No," but all of that is gone too. So she has no sympathy for her child. She's like talking to it. She's like just per- acting like it's normal the whole movie. I'm just uh, bringing this up because, like, if they were gonna, you know, do some sort of like woke stuff with this character stuff, you know. They have, would have made her way more sympathetic. <laughs> and well, and you could have had it. You could have literally had yeah. a three-year-old girl daughter who's got sure. you know a, a literal that. legend of Korra come in and stab <laughs> yeah. the bear yeah. Aaron in, in the road. road. Yeah, it also just works yeah. so much better with her being less sympathetic. Like I like, I like it. I like so. it. Yeah, I, I really I, like this here. You know, uh, ha, yeah. And I, 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 totally, like him I totally like disagree mom. that Chani has been anything like character no. assassinated here. Yeah, no, I, I don't. I, I think the main thing that it does is just throw into question where the second or where the next one is going to go. Right. Yes. Like what what plot mm-hmm. events are going to be the driving factor? Maybe we'll get a True. time jump uh, for the next one. I guess that would make sense. And then just uh, see what the what what happens off screen i guess just get a little explanation right. like it's been 5 years and we did holy war and stuff and it was great that's pretty much how it goes in the book too it's oh, like okay. it's well, been there you go. <laughs> like, here you go it, it it is now 10 years later the holy war has happened now it is uh now here I'm we the... go now it's time uh, to do some cloning i'm the baron stabber you got to deal with it um... <laughs> So uh, back back to the scene. We're so close, I can feel it. I so feel it. It um, he tells the emperor, you know, put forth a, uh, a, a champion or stand yourself. And so Fade offers himself. He's like, he, oh, I like fighting. I'll do it. I love fighting. I'm yeah. And so uh, there's a, there's, when he kills the Baron, Fade has this look like he almost came in his pants. <laughs> He's, there's a little. Like, he oh, loved yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> he's he's a big fan of Paul. He's intrigued by him. Yeah. So Austin Butler, he, by the way, killing it in this role. Oh, one really good friend. job. I really like him. Really yeah, good, good. Really and good. So, so he steps forth to challenge Paul, and um, I think Gurney tries to say like, "Let me stand in your place. Yeah, like you shouldn't a, be risking yourself. Don't like, waste like, don't waste yourself on this animal. Yeah." And he's like, "No, this is my burden." So. It's it's time for the fight, and I believe there's even a moment where Gurney says to Stilgar, he says like, "Why does he take such risks?" And <laughs> Stilgar just says, "He's not game." He's not game. That's like that's yeah. like ninety percent of the dialogue <laughs> at this point. I love it. Um, so it's time for the duel. What do you guys think of the duel? I think it was pretty fucking good. It was really good. Pretty badass. Scene. I liked it. I I there's something about the way the fights go like the one-on-one fights in this like the style they're in that are kind of they're really nice and stylized while also being yes. pretty easy to follow like i can tell i can tell what is happening like the blocks mm-hmm. and the kicks and how things are moving uh which obviously the way it's directed is a big part of this i mean i've seen enough action mm-hmm. scenes in the last couple of years where it's like i don't know what happened but the good guy won Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, this is one of the best action scenes, fight f- one-on-one fights since. Oh man, you gotta go back a long time, really. Besides, um, maybe Winter Soldier. Maybe I don't know. Like, like I want to talk about the ending specifically because oh, where his hand disappears and then. Uh, uh, we'll get to that in a second, but I want to mention something that we skipped over right before the fight starts uh, when they're oh. having the argument. Uh, the Bene Gesserit lady is talking back to Paul and he says, silence. In oh, yeah. Voice. I must say, watching this movie in like a Dolby screening, like your silence shake yeah, whenever you like, oh, use the voice. Oh, it hits really hard. But when he, he uses the voice on her and it's a great little moment. It's just a nice little uh, yeah. like sort of answer to the moment when he first meets her in the first movie when she uses the voice on him and he says, how dare you use the voice on me? Mm-hmm. He kind of, you know, gets to get her back in the end. And, and I like and she that. like kind of cowers uh, and says, abomination. Yeah, that was kind of, <laughs> that was kind of funny. Um, anyway, it's just a little detail I liked. 
back to the fight. I thought 90% of the fight was very good. I have some questions about the ending. Did anyone else find how the very, very end of the fight was filmed a bit confusing in terms of what actually happened? The knife? Yeah. You mean? I, yeah. I don't know how. Yeah. So at the I, guys, I know what happened. Next, I, I know what happened. Okay. Yeah. okay. Go ahead. I, I was, you're, you're talking about when he, whether, like, I think he pulled the knife out and then stabbed him with the knife that was inside of his body. Yes. Already. Okay. So let's okay. set it up. So the fight is yeah. happening <laughs> and. They're yeah. going back and forth. Fade gets a, gets a good stab on Paul. He stabs him, I'd say, sort of in the abdomen on his uh, left, left side. Left side, yes. That, yes. This yes. is the side you would want to get hit if you want to still keep moving because there's not a lot of uh, there's not a lot oh. of important structures over there. It's just well, the medic, people. the medic. Yeah, thank you. you. <laughs> so way further into the middle, so and that's the only thing on that side that you really have to worry about all that much. Nice. Yeah, so he gets stabbed there, but he's still standing. He's going, uh, uh, making those kind of noises. Fade kind of circles the crowd a little bit, showboating a little bit, and then he comes to stab him again. Paul grabs the knife in Fade's hand. And is, I guess blade. he's got He grabs gloves. the blade of the knife. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So he's holding onto it, and but Fade's like pushing it closer and closer and closer. And then... I understand what happened now, but I did not after the first time watching the movie. It was only after watching it a second time that I actually understand what happened here. Because oh, okay. how it looks when you first watch it is he's got the knife, he's got the knife, he's got the knife. The knife in question, the one being held in their hands, goes below the screen. And then there's like a, there's like a push forward. And you're like, oh no, did he stab him again? And we cut out and the knife is actually in... Uh, fade now in his stomach and it's like oh you fought well atreides and then he collapses mm -hmm. over dead and i found it kind of awkwardly filmed the first time now that i actually understand what happened what happened was off screen in that brief second paul pulled the knife out of his own side and stabbed fade with that while fade his knife stabbed paul in his right shoulder yeah um oh yeah did anyone else have trouble with that the first time, or is it yes? Just... Yes. Yeah, it was a little jarring, especially because the not rest really. of the fight went really? quite well. I, I thought that um, I, I thought that it was a really good fight scene, and then the end was it seemed a little confusing to me. But I mean, I don't know. I kind of got it. I, I understand yeah. what happens. I think. Yeah, I, would, I, I think it I just took me like end... ten seconds to figure it out. I, I had to think about it, and then I figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I, th I think it was wasn't that a, a callback to when he did a sparring match with Gurney in the beginning? Right. Yeah. Yes, there's a parallel there yeah. for sure. Oh yeah. Um, the, the the slow blade that kills something like that. He says. Yeah. Yeah. They're not they're not fighting with shields in this fight scene to be clear, but no, yes, right, right. They right, do have right. a moment at the end of the first training fight with Gurney where they both have the knives. They both have like a killing blow on each mm -hmm. other. Right. Um, and it's similar to that. I would have liked it to be a little more clear how that happened and how it happened in that amount of time. That's fair. I can see how you it's get a little, confused. Because it's a little, sure, it yeah. was just a little jumbled and I felt like that's the, the big moment. And I was like, wait, what, how, what? There, uh, so how? there were a lot in my theater. There was a couple of people sitting next to me who, when that happened, I'll, like quite a few people went, wait, what? <laughs> huh? Yes. He had audible what's in the theater. Somebody, and then, you know, you hear somebody leaning over. It's like, he pulled the knife out. He, he pulled the knife. It's, oh, oh. <laughs> just, okay. someone, yeah. just someone stands up in the cinema, goes from the screen. He's like, okay, listen, um, he got the knife out, and then he stepped the back. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, he, he, he got, got you the knife out. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. We we pause the screen and be like, okay, if you look closely, you'll see that where <laughs> Paul is stabbed is actually on the opposite shoulders. That's a different knife. Yeah. You see, he pulled the knife out and turned it around real quick. And uh, something about that was just a little awkward that if it was a little more clear, it could have made the moment a little more impactful, I think. Yeah, Obviously, not everyone will be confused by it, but some uh, enough people are like, what uh, What happened? Especially because of the rest of the fight scene is so well choreographed. It's so clear what's happening. And the, yeah. The, yeah. the clashes are great. Um, I love when Paul does that, like that spinning flip away from the thing. Like that wasn't Timothy, obviously. That was a gymnast. <laughs> Uh, stuntman, uh, stuntman. Yeah. Tom Holland could have done it. He's a he's a gymnast. Does his own stunts. Tom yes. Holland should have uh... been Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Spider Man, <laughs> better. I think a reason why why I knew what was happening is like as soon as he got stabbed and stood back up with the thing in his belly, I was like, he's gonna yeah. use that to stab the other guy. 
one hundred percent. And I <laughs> like that. That's fine. I actually really like that a lot. A because mm -hmm. it makes his victory like harder to earn. You know, yeah, he, that's he something takes I damage really like it. anyway. When there's a fight yeah, scene and there's actually like both parties are getting beat up. It's like yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. stakes. Yeah, Paul's his face gets bloodied. He gets stabbed yeah. non fatally, but he does get stabbed. I like that, and I also like the idea that the knife that like that he gets stabbed with is the one he uses to kill the other guy. That's a nice detail. It just it was a little confusingly filmed, Not which is a, strange because so much of the movie is so incredibly well filmed that I never felt like I was confused logistically about any other aspect of the movie and uh, it just sort of took a little bit of the impact off of that someone mentioned that possibly that might have been a pg-13 editing decision mm, okay. i don't Maybe. know possibly. it seemed intentional to be like to have it be a reveal yeah. that that's yeah. how it worked out i'm not sure it's possible Maybe I gotta watch it again, but personally, I wouldn't describe the end of the fight as like jumbled or confusing. But it was clearly shot in a way that doesn't sell the killing blow at all, and it just I, I like what you yeah, just slowly just realize it, and it's like, oh, okay, it's over. I guess he got like, him. Is yeah, that yeah. Like Aragorn at the end of Fellowship of the Ring with the the Urukai? It just like slices his head off. Like I mean, they, not I'm saying that he could have sliced Fade's head off, but you know what I mean. An impactful end to a fight is, uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's valuable. It is it is valuable. And then the only other small detail that I would quibble with, I know, I, obviously, you know, location is everything for getting stabbed, but uh, the fact that like Paul gets stabbed and then the way he kills Fade is just to stab him in a similar, not exactly the same, but he just stabs him once and that kills him, but it didn't kill Paul. Obviously location matters, but it was just a little, I don't know. It was a little easy. Maybe Lisa uh, Malgaib. That... Lisa Malgaib. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, maybe that's more of a nitpick, but it's just, I saw it as just like the way of shooting it is just meant to reflect, uh, by whatever his name is, um, his sort of realization of it. Like, even he is, like, he doesn't even see the blade going in, and then he doesn't even realize until it's too late, kind of yeah. like the audience. Hmm. And it's like, oh. And it's I, meant to be deliberately yeah. a bit anticlimactic. It doesn't have that shot where you have the insert plunging in, you know, to yeah. the guy's yeah. side. Yeah. But it has right after, but... Bus, but Alston's line, Fade's line at the end was cool. He was like, you did what, what he was like, uh, you fought well, 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 fought well, well so, you know, that Fall was back. cool. Like that, that was Fall a great ending. The gladiator yeah. scene. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Also, apparently, so I don't even, apparently in the book, yeah. Paul stabs Fade up under his jaw and through his, his head. Face. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. God damn. That's pretty yeah. gnarly. That's pretty. He did that with the uh, emperor instead. I mean, with, uh, with the uh, Vladimir, he sort of stabbed him in the face instead. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I well, love he killed that scene. Fade, uh, and it was a very good scene, except for a little bit of confusion. I yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe a small misstep on the on the ending for some people. I mean, definitely for a good portion of people in my theater, they seemed like they were confused by it. So, you know, that not exactly what you want from the end of your fight scene, but it still works out pretty well. Yes. Yeah. He, so he kills Fade, and then we kind of rush through a couple things. Um, suddenly we're told over, you know, they're, they're communicating with the ships up in orbit and they say they don't accept your ascension. Mm. Oh, no, sorry. I am skipping briefly. Uh, after the fight, he walks up to... He walks up to the kill emperor. the emperor, yeah. He walks up to kill the emperor and his daughter, the emperor's daughter, says, like, spare him his life, please. And so he decides to let him live on the, you know, condition that he kneeled down and kissed his ring. Kissed and ring. that was a nice moment. That was a cool moment too. Mm -hmm. but he has and to that's he has and this is when we find out, yeah, that that the other houses refuse to accept his ascension. I just like that he has he to has to yeah. be a trade. He has to yeah, well, kiss trade 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 specifically. Yeah, it's yeah. the inversion of what um what the princess says that they need to do to him. It's like you, you can't kill him. You can't just martyr him because then there's going to be a lot of people yeah. who will yeah. rally around the mm -hmm. idea of him. Oh, you true. basically true. you have to get him to like bow to mm -hmm. you. That's why he's like, no, no, like you're, you're doing this. <laughs> yeah, Fade says, "GG." That's the, the <laughs> long and short of it. GG, um, <laughs> no re. And then the we find out that the other houses have not accepted his ascension. Now, I don't know about you, that I don't quite understand that. 
I mean, I don't know how the rules work in general with those houses. Like, if if the, obviously if the they current, haven't. If the current emperor says you're the the big boy now, the, the, I guess that doesn't count for anything. That's, I just I just don't even understand how their system wor works in general. With that, I understand that they wanna they wanna get to the okay, and now we're going off to do the jihad holy sure, war sure. thing. I understand that, but. I also understand that the, the, the heads of these houses have not heard Paul's side of the story yet. That's something he threatened to tell them. Mm -hmm. What he All he has told them is, if you come invade right now, I'll blow up the spice fields. So I suppose from their perspective, I don't even know if they know it's Paul Atreides yet. Do they know that, do you think? Uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure, actually. What's the, no, what's the I, line you know, in the movie? What did they say about uh, refusing his ascension to the throne? The other they houses put... refuse to acknowledge your ascension. And then he says, yeah, send who's... them to... Oh, who told him Ger that? I think Gurney, Gurney, Gurney was on the, uh, on the comms. Oh. He yeah. told him. He Josh also Brolin, threatened Josh him Brolin earlier. Says, yeah. that, hey, we're going to do a thing. We're going to blow up. We're going to nuke the spice if you don't... Uh... If you if you don't accept our I, ascension, I gotta just imagine what Gurney's call was like. He's like, yeah, so um, I'm here on Arrakis. Uh, Paul Atreides is now the emperor. Yeah, and the emperor just sat down and kissed his ring. Yeah. And the other noble, the other families are probably just like, uh, no, yeah, you, you fuck yourself. <laughs> yeah. What I, what yeah, I would fuck off, Gurney. <laughs> Fine, yourself. The the other houses didn't acknowledge your ascension. <laughs> I mean, yeah. the moment before that line could have been really funny. <laughs> what I hope happens. I mean, we might have a time jump, so maybe we'll miss this part. But I'd I'd like to think that they wouldn't immediately just start the war. Like, surely you have some more things to talk about. He, he might be going to do a parlay up in space. Yeah. He, is, he is absolutely not going to do a parlay. He says, oh, send well, them to paradise at the end of this thing. That I don't yeah. think there's any send way them to... to paradise. Paradise. Oh, I forgot about that. Mm. I forgot about that. I have to watch the movie again. There's too much to, go on to remember. <laughs> so <laughs> that that feels yeah. like, an, like an abrupt turn. Um, and I very maybe... much so, because it... Like, we talked about this a little bit before, but just to refresh, um, the the book does not end this way. The book ends with them being like, well, what can we do? You know, you've, you've got nukes aimed at the spice. We can't let that yeah. happen. So I guess we just have to let it happen. Uh, we have to let you become the emperor. And then they start plotting behind the scenes to get him off the throne without killing him. So. Yes. Okay, so. Lot, I, very different. Villeneuve, Villeneuve said He's been back and forth about this, but it's very un. He's uh, uh, he wasn't sure he was going to make Messiah. He wanted to make part one and two a complete thing. If if it never happened, am I wrong about that? So so, so that's what I mentioned at the beginning of the screen. So, is stream that I think this ending is the the dark version of the Matrix. The dark ending. version. <laughs> and, yeah. and then send I'm, them to paradise is yeah. like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's dark. That's a dark ending. And I think that's yeah. fine. It could end there, and I'm fine with it. I mean, that, it's what happens at the end of The Matrix, but he's talking to the machines. He's like, yeah, well, yeah, I'm going right. to tear down your whole system. And then he flies at the camera and Rage Against the Machine plays. <laughs> right. <laughs> Shame and then, um, yeah. So but... now he's fucked, maybe. I guess now he's going to have to rewrite around that for Messiah somehow. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I don't. Does. I don't know how uh, how okay I would be with this being the ending of the whole thing. I think there are I still agree. a few too many ends that are not tied up here. I'm conflicted. That, <laughs> I yeah. keep going back and forth. I don't know. I mean, I'm like, I like all that's going to be able to tell is if Messiah sucks. If Messiah's terrible, then we're all going to be like, yeah, they should have just stopped. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. Then you know, keep Hind going. Hindsight <laughs> is twenty twenty. Um, I know. My, my thoughts with this ending, it seems like we're rushing into the Holy War when they probably like, I mean, obviously, I still think, you know, the book, what the book does where they immediately agree to let him be emperor and then they plot behind the scenes would make more sense than what happens here. Now, future context could improve this if we find mm -hmm. out that he didn't immediately just start firing into them, but like went up to like uh, yeah tell his side of the him. story maybe yeah you know, that's that kind the of sort thing. of thing that i feel like we're skipping if we just immediately start just now we're at war well, I, I don't think like we could... skipped a couple steps there i don't think he could just he fight them and i don't think they could fight him in orbit just now i don't think he has the firepower if there's like no. how, ma how many no. how many people how many houses are there seven or how many were it 
they, well, they don't even they don't there's, there's a lot, people, there's a lot. Though, okay so and i guess they have all the emperor's tech that's on the planet right now from the yeah like, but Florida. there's like i don't know how many ships in orbit right now and they have like some small ships i assume they all have bigger ships up there so yeah i don't Unclear. know how he would fight them immediately from down here i don't know what what weaponry he could do that Bring the worms to space. Oh, space, worms. <laughs> space worms. Space worms. And then also, Irulan, the the Irulan marriage is in question now. Sorry, Lafayette, oh. I just wanted to, before we get too far away from the knife fight, Wolf just mentioned in our chat that in the book, Paul Paul stabs Fade under the jaw and through his head. Uh, we uh, said that already. I read that Idiot. out like 10 minutes ago. God. <laughs> I totally didn't catch that. I just read it. <laughs> In the that's brain, okay. in the I brain, that's how he dies. <clears throat> but yeah, that would be pretty brutal. Sounds that would be gnarly. Fun. But but I like that instead of that, we got that line from Fade. That was a nice part, you know, because he can't do say that line if he's in the good stuff. Well, he can kind of like gargle through it, like it's like Batman in the Dark Knight. <laughs> but no, the the Irulan marriage is now in question too. That's a totally other like, why even marry her now if they're going to go to war? Yeah, if like the whole point was to was to oh, yeah, get to legitimacy yeah. for the for the throne, then and then it's they so immediately bad. said, "Yeah, fuck you, buddy." And then they're like, "Well, then we'll just then I'll just Johnny, come back, Johnny, 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 wait, 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 wait. <laughs> hey, wait, I made a mistake. Hold on now, come on. It just turns around. We got we gotta fight. Chill, chill. Why are you acting so crazy? <laughs> turns around, and stabs the emperor and the daughter on, on the spot. It's like, <laughs> yeah. well, sorry. <laughs> Do you have argument, though, that if he marries the emperor's daughter, how long can he be at war with the universe at, like, as the emperor before people start being like, okay, well, maybe... Maybe, maybe some of the houses will change their mind. Yeah. Fighting yeah. Them? Maybe, I yeah. I think, I think as it is, I'm, I'm worried that they kind of rushed into the Holy War part. If, if, we, if we find out in the next movie that, no, there wasn't really anything in between. They just started the war immediately. I'll be like, uh, yeah. I don't know if that's very good. Um, I think we, I think we need yeah, a little it's, something it's... in between. It's a, it's yeah. a little like you're taking a character who has a like a plan basically to extort a, a position on the throne and mm, turning yeah. it into like I'll just kick down your door then and take it if I want it right like it's it, a, it's. it's We've, we've been... done such a good job subtly building up his arc that this feels like a big leap right at the end. I know. Isn't it weird, though, that, like, whether or not this movie is, like, I don't know, just, like, what, whether or not you love this movie or not depends on what happens in the next movie. I, I just, I always, like, I don't know. I always try to avoid thinking that way. But um... Yeah, but, like, oh, it also lends a little... Movie. Lends a little bit of credence to the idea that I we probably wouldn't be okay with it just ending here. Yeah. 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 Especially after the first movie, if that was all there ever was, I'd be like, well, this is just not a story. This is not a whole story at all. <laughs> this one, I feel like I they're, think they're definitely going to do it now. I mean, War yeah. I think Warner Brothers is definitely going to do it. Yeah. I think Den I think Denis will do it. I hope he does. But if he doesn't, I suspect that Warner Brothers would find someone else Matt to, do it, anyway. to like, Matt get Reeves it done do anyway it. yeah right and Warner Brothers is like oh people Cause... actually like something we made oh my goodness oh I don't know what to Cause... do um <laughs> this, this feels this like uh, territory. this feels similar to like you know the original Star Wars trilogy or Lord of the Rings where it's just like we we've got two dope like yeah movies that made a lot of money we'd be stupid stop. not to wrap this up with a third one that'll act as the conclusion mm -hmm. and then we'll probably make we'll make even more money than well Greg maybe the Fraker, second and first one combined think that would think about the, even if phil Noom doesn't want to do it the, the fourth one children of Doom. he wants to do stop at messiah i think matt reeves could pick up because he's already worked with greg frazier on the batman and matt reeves right. could do dune uh children of dune and he were he works for Warner Brothers. I just think that's a like I think it's gonna happen. I think they're gonna make all of them. No oh boy, that's my yeah. That's my well, like if if three comes out and it's even more successful than one and two, they'll certainly want to keep going. Oh, whether yeah. they'll yeah. be able Children to or not or is TV another question. Yeah, what's yeah. the deal? Okay, well that's basically just the end of the movie. We see Chani. Uh, she's running away because 
well, she's going back. Yeah. She's to... she's going to pick a, to catch a sandworm. We yeah. it, it is. So yeah. Uber is we, we can we can say yeah, yeah. yeah we can say it's unclear what exactly is going on. She's either going for a drive to clear her head, or she's <laughs> really mad at Paul and yeah. she's not coming back. And yeah. there's going to be some some issues to either to either one to resolve, resolve this, this conflict con- moving further. Yes. Or she puts and... in the bumper to kill herself. Oh no! <laughs> that, that's oh, Jesus. A real dark. Really? Th- <laughs> he, he walked in. He walked in and threw the copy of the book on the on the table of Dune Messiah. Yeah. And the guy was like, "What's this?" He goes, "Forget about it. None <laughs> of that's getting made." Yeah. Right. Oh, that's that's not Emperor of Dune. Oh, yeah. and everyone doesn't want to come back. Paul and the Fremen going off to fight uh, the Holy War. Uh, Chani is l- leaving and she's not happy about it. That's the end of the movie. We did it. We we, we came to the end we of came. the film. Before we go Still off together. into uh, any other tangents, I wanted to actually finally finish it because we were so we're close. Done. We did it. Dune I'm actually two. drawing a blank on the very end. Like I can't remember if rockets start flying or ships just take off. Ships, ships, take, off. ships take off. Ships take off. I don't remember. Oh, Stilgar okay. and no. some some Fremen peeps. They all board ships and then they are off to space, which is probably very exciting for them because they never left this planet, from what I understand. Yeah, they, they never right. have. No, they, that is that is an interesting interesting thing. They're gonna have to adapt to yeah. space combat, and you know they they're also piloting these ships. Um, Presumably, the only thing they've ever driven before is sandworms. So I don't know. No, if the there's like... Oh, the ornithopters. That's right. They well, the, 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 there's, there's people from the emperor there that, that have to acknowledge him now, or that do acknowledge him. They all kneel down. So I guess they mm. fly the things, probably, possibly. I don't know. Yeah, I'm just guessing. That. Just throwing some ideas yeah. out there. That we, seems like the likeliest yeah. option, right? We see them get aboard the ships and go off towards space to go presumably fight the Holy War. We don't see any shots fired yet. Also, not clear whether Paul is on the ships with them. That mm-hmm. is not shown. And then the very, very last shot is Chani calling a sandworm. We close, uh, we push in on her face, and then we cut to black. Yep. Right, yeah. Two. My theater, My theater applauded at that moment. I don't know about your guys' theater. There was some light applause the second time I watched it. That one was one guy clapped. <laughs> <laughs> what? My whole theater, my whole theater went nuts. No, no one claps in German theaters. Oh, no. That's you guys not, are so not serious. A, that's not a thing in Europe, like, in general, I feel like. Yeah. Are there any German comedians? Is that a thing? Yeah, that's what they suck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm on Goth. Stuck in Lucken. So... That is Dune 2. Did anyone's opinion on the film change significantly? Yeah, I hate it now. It's a terrible through... movie. Oh, okay. Two out of ten. <laughs> no, but it sounds like it sounds like your opinions could change depending on what they do in five years from now, <laughs> which is well, interesting. Like you're, it's t- it's tough. Well, because I'm the same way too. Like I don't even know. I my opinion might change, but it's just weird that it's like we have to hold this like ambiguous feeling about this. Uh, franchise for another five years and we won't get like a definitive you know what I mean like that's kind of weird I don't think it's that weird and I'll tell you why it's not weird because this is not a complete story yet yeah and so judging the story kind of like you gotta wait till it's over surely you feel that after part one don't you but I felt that after Dune the book like I felt that it didn't feel like it was over but also it was a really good book so I that's how I feel sort of the same about this movie. Like I, the first think five hours one... of this part one and two is a really good science fiction movie. Like it's a complete story, but like Oh, so you think you think one and two is a together complete is story. a com- definitely complete saga that I think No, nah, I think it's very clearly like, like I mean I, I think it uh, that ending yeah. serves that purpose, but I still don't I still don't want it to be over. Like I do. No, want I don't want it to be over to either. Very yeah. much. And it's I'm not just... okay. Okay. And to, to make another thing clear, I don't have some nebulous, ambiguous feeling. I like the movie. I've talked about oh, okay. what I think yeah. is really good and what mm-hmm. I think is not as good. The point being that the ultimate end of some of these plot threads can be fully assessed once we see their conclusion. There, are, there. Are, right. You know, there are things. For example, let's let's think about. Paul's future seeing ability. Are we going to find out that everything that he can actually see the future and that everything works out exact? Once he has the sight, he can see everything perfectly, or is there going to be any sort of twist to that? 
uh, like what what happens once the holy wars you know there's so many things there's so many threads that haven't been tied up yet that it's just like well what happens later can affect the the these earlier plot points yeah how, how, how like, crazy is all the killing gonna be like i'm just interested to see what decisions somebody, he has to make exactly. because he, he knows what from what i understand he knows what he has to do so he probably has to do some very fucked up choices to actually get to the goal he has in mind yeah yeah i, I think some people assume what i'm saying is that like oh you can't just judge like the two towers on its own it's like yeah but like in t you know if you had seen only fellowship in two towers there would be a sense that like oh well i can't wait to see how it ends because yeah. like you know there are things that haven't been resolved yet and i'm curious about and as, let's say for example the return of the king actually kind of shit the bed as an ending it would like or like if certain threads that you thought were going to go one way don't end up mm -hmm. going that way it probably would impact how you feel about the first two movies well, I don't feel that way about the original Star Wars trilogy. I, I see. I don't, I don't. You probably don't either. But like a lot of people do, are like, I can't watch them anymore because of where where uh, where are they, where are the characters end up. And I'm just like, well, then, uh, we'll just Disney pretend that it's not yeah. canon. Yeah. Canon, you know. Yeah. 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 No, I I agree. I have no um, problems with, not yeah. considering Jake oh, yeah. Skywalker, or Luke Skywalker, for example. But yeah, let's say if. Though. Yeah, it is it is different, I think, because if, let's say, they character assassinated Luke in the third of the original yeah, two movies, <laughs> that would be different, I think. Sure. That would be harder to cleave off because that's the end of the story of the trilogy, if that makes sense. And, well, another thing is the books, a lot of people think the books go into this weird, bizarre territory. They don't even like a lot of the books. And that, so, they're, that, you know, I've heard people say the the first Dune is all you need to read. And it's like... I, I agree. It's one of the best sci-fi books I've ever read, but it is sort of also still incomplete. Like I jumped mm. right into Dune Messiah yesterday on my audio book. I, mm. I, I, I'm going to disagree with you on that one. I don't think that the first Dune book is an incomplete story. I think you can read the first one and never touch the others and have a, like a pretty complete understanding yeah. of what that story is about. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm with you in the idea that like it's a cool universe. You want to know more. You want to dive yeah. a little deeper. It's not the, there are no narrative threads at the end of the first book like like there are at the end of this movie that are left hanging with you being like, well, wait a minute, where's where where's Chani gonna go? What's how's the relationship between Chani and Paul going to turn out? They kind of tell you what's gonna happen right there at the end, right? With everything that's going on, they they give you the conclusion that you yeah. need. And then they move forward. It's not hmm. it, the changes that they make between book and movie here are to lead maybe more fluidly into a, the Messiah story, which is yeah, an maybe. interesting. It's an interesting choice, and I'm interested to see where it goes. Maybe but I, 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 yeah. yeah, but I don't think that it. I don't think that the end of the first book feels like the end of this movie, uh, in, in, with, <laughs> when it comes to the ambiguity. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, the, the the holy war is still like what what's going to happen. But but you're what you're saying about, about the threads being like sort of neatly tied up is true at the end of the book. But um, yeah, tied up neater than they are here. A little bit neater. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, but and that that also leads to the problem of Messiah. Yeah, you know, for me, feeling kind of you know, disconnected, right? Like when I got into it, I was like, ah, it's a little, I don't know. It, it doesn't feel like the, like, a, and for a lot of people, apparently, you know, if you go and look at the articles where people are like, well, it's really meant to sort of be a bridge chapter between, you know, one and three. So it's not like, yeah, three is really where the story is going to pick up more steam. It's like it, it, Messiah doesn't f feel as right. necessary for a lot of people. So I think that th the changes here might be, toward facilitating that that feeling out of people right like let's make messiah feel like a more necessary part like an actual conclusion as opposed to a bridge chapter between two and three time yeah. will tell yeah. in the five meantime years. five more years in the meantime more dune. i think dune 2 is good despite the problems i have with it i like it a lot and i'd recommend it to most people same it's a, very very enjoyable theater going experience and the stuff that's great here is fantastic as far as i'm concerned so it's an easy recommend for me 
Yeah. I wonder how willing Warner Brothers is to like postpone the release of like three. Like, you think the sooner they do it, the better. You, like realistically, I don't think they can wait ten years for it, right? Because like, you don't you don't want people to like co- to be like, wait a minute, where's where's the next bit? And then you know yeah. it finally comes out, and everybody's sort of like forgotten about it. oh yeah that's right dune came out a while ago yeah you don't want to miss the bus uh right i mean that could be a huge profit loss just to look at it in terms of the money that they'd be pulling in mm-hmm. but like i understand the story necessity for like letting the actors age a bit if you're gonna like if the next part of the story takes place what 10 years or something after i mean you, i guess you could like well um, they've already a, changed a enough of it the actors they've already changed oh, okay. enough of it they probably could get away with you know speeding up the time you know i don't think they need to go a full 10 years or anything like that Mm -hmm. right yeah well 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 Uh, i can't wait for the the game there's a new game coming out uh it's a survival game what takes place on arrakis oh that sounds neat how world of sandworms yeah Yeah. (laughs) like 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 kakonan exiles but on eggs on arrakis (laughs) Interesting. Very interesting. I've been playing a little bit of the tabletop Dune game. Um, that was kind of, or I was for a while. That's kind of, that's kind of a cool one. Like yeah, establish nice. your house and control spice fields and stuff like that. Yep, it's fun. Well, we did it. We did it. <laughs> Crossover event achieved. We did. Yeah, that's true. Hooray! We crossed I am. I am. <laughs> we crossed streams and no one died. That's good. Yet, it's always a risk. Thank you guys in chat for hanging out with us for so long. We appreciate it. I think been a long boy. I'll want to respond to some of the super chats we got, but we can kind of go separately. Well, we we only had one that is a ten euro, a ten pound one with no message. So yeah, thanks for that. (laughs) Okay. What was the name on it, Metal? Oh, it was uh, Diane Seaborn. Thank you very much, Diane. Thank you very much. Lisa Al Gaib. Lisa Lisa Al Gaib. (laughs) He is so selfless. I mean, Lisa Al Gaib. I mean, Lisa Al Gaib. Lisa Lisa Al Gaib would leave a super chat with no message. (laughs) You You know what? I retract the thing from earlier. They don't really need to know how to fly those spaceships. No, they... <laughs> Lisa Nogai, you taught them well. Um, well, there's only a couple on our end, and some oh, of them no. might have questions you guys yeah, can answer for as well. So we'll just go through it. Donald Angry, thank through. you very much. Says episode four of Devs, the prophecy has foretold it. Yes, just a little, just a little while longer, the prophecy will come true. Lisa Nogai. This is not going to uh, Pie Guy says, This had me feeling the same as minus one. Love the film. Probs the best of the year for sure, but the big hype going into it kind of killed it for me. Wait. So you loved it, but it was still <laughs> overhyped? Yeah. yeah that, must, that must have been a lot of hype. Yeah. Um, I avoided all trailers, man. It was, it was a good move. Yeah. Movie. I think it's good. It's a, it's a lot of fun. I understand why people love it. Uh, bye guys that's another one. one thank you very much there's not sure this is plot slash pacing how has she not given birth yet she was pregnant before harkonnen attack in part one and she's still at the end of part two i think uh, the only thing to assume there is that it actually hasn't been all that long right yeah it's probably yeah, like half, maybe half a year or so maximum. yeah she's definitely more <laughs> pregnant yeah she was you know she she was not showing at all and now she is so it's been a few months I think that's all we're really meant to assume there. And the last one, uh, this is probably the funniest one, says, from none of your business, said, how many people here have seen Dune 2? Um, oh, I haven't. I lied. Six. I was just making... Was six. Six. Well, six. Well, I guess that was meant for been. all the chatters, I, I assume. I suppose. Well, thank you. Thank you. I don't know if anyone in chat responded to your question, but we've seen Dune 2. We, we sure did. We talked we a sure did. about it. We sure did. Just a, a, just a bit. Movie. That was a good time. Thanks, it thanks was. for joining us, friendos. Thanks for, yeah, thanks for hanging no out, problem. everybody. Yeah, Thank you. Uh, we'll see you in f- f- uh, somewhere between five and ten, five years, ten years for Dune Part Three. <laughs> We're not streaming ever again until this Never comes again. out, because yes. Lisa Nogai yes. has taught us so. 
We'll be on yeah, the screen fast, fast until then. Yes. Yeah. Oh, fuck fuck it, Fur I, Furiosa. Hang on. There, <laughs> just, there, there was a super chat coming in right now with 10 Canadian by Sir Raff. It was nice listening to you lads discussing Dune 2. Do you think what may uh, do you think what maybe holds back Dune's mass appeal potential is the lack of diverse environments? I don't know. I don't even <laughs> no, know. Too much <laughs> desert. You know what? That's a fair point. Well, I mean, <laughs> well, the thing is, the content taking place on Tatooine, I think I could forgive some people for being like, oh, God, another desert space movie. <laughs> well, I, I would probably rather ask the question, what do you mean with mass appeal? Because it's been pretty successful already. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. And just we get that's why people like us. And by that, I don't mean people on the stream. I mean, anyone who's seen the movie, just, mm -hmm. you know, tell people about it. Be like, yeah, you should go see that movie in a theater. It's worth, yeah, worth the yeah. money. Yeah, some popcorn. Definitely. Tell Hollywood this is what, what kinds of movies you want to watch. More yeah. desert yeah. movies, With man. your money. I mean, if you want to go out with your family and your two children, you probably don't want to watch Dune 2 or 1. You probably want to watch Barbie's Farmhouse or whatever. I don't know. Man, a whole family of five came in to watch this one with uh, in really? my theater. It was, well, I, yeah, there was... I stand dad, corrected. You know, like, there was like a, I think there was like an eight-year-old who was sitting there watching this movie really into it. So. All right. The Star um, Wars of our generation. The, it's someone, certainly not Star Wars. The no. person who sent that last super chat says, I mean, it's successful, but I don't imagine Dune ever becoming a Star Wars, if that no. makes sense. No, probably I think, not. I think a big, big part of it is Star Wars again. Like, no, the big, nothing will ever be on the scale that Star Wars was uh, because there's too many options now. It's the, well, like, I, don't, I don't think it's possible, really. Would you not say that, like, the Lord of the Rings movies kind of did that? Eh, I mean, oh, I mean, maybe, yeah, yeah. I think I could, yeah. I, I, at the same time, I guess it's different because Lord of the Rings never had that massive um, merchandising thrust oh, I behind it, making it Just as video games, but not really, not as, yeah, not as, not well, as. I mean, I had a lot of Lord of the Rings toys when I was a kid. Uh, that oh, was like, I, I had a lot of like action figures of the Urukai or Faramir oh, or like all oh, that kind of stuff. It. But I, I think that George Lucas, like, I, you're definitely right in that though because george lucas really pushed for yeah. the well, merchandising well, well, of star okay. wars yeah, I, I think yeah. i guess my point is i think that only happened because of its time and place in history or not not that it only happened but it primarily happened because of that so i think yeah. Yeah. something ever being on the scale is star wars honestly i think the closest thing that marvel. we've had is, yeah marvel is probably the only thing that that really challenges it and even then it's a different it, it takes a different angle you know it's not yeah. it's not same it's not just hey here's a three good movies like you know? right yeah it's a, it's a whole nother level i i will say though i think part of the reason let's let's say for the sake of argument that these movies are of the same quality as the original star wars movies just assume it for the sake of argument right fine I'll do um it. i think part of the reason why star wars will have more appeal is that it's more of like the positive heroic story rather than sort yeah, of like a darker yeah. sort of tragic version. I just think it has a little bit less appeal in that it regard is, because it it's a bit a more of a downer. <laughs> it is a much right. better idea for you to learn your morality from Yoda than from Paul. <laughs> yeah. If I you're think, a little kid and you want yeah, a favorite yeah. sci-fi movie, that's Game of Thrones had a big appeal global appeal game of thrones mm. True. and then it failed I, to stick the ending yeah, yeah. And then it i think so it's totally yeah. i think it's totally possible that with the perfect conditions you could get something on the level of star wars again right uh, just like the original not the um not everything that's come since minus andor uh i think it's totally possible it just seems unlikely at this point because very few <laughs> unlikely filmmakers unlikely. are gonna yeah. be able well to i wonder off. I wonder about that appeal, because, like, I know what you mean, but I wonder, like, I think we live in a time now of, like, um, cynicism and anti-heroes and stuff where, like, downer shit memes and plays memes. pretty nobody, well. nobody takes anything seriously anymore. Everything's a meme. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Everything's a joke. I mean, I guess I'm old, but I, I take it seriously. Arguably I know, but we're old. But you, you, you know what I mean, right? Like, th people like things taking a dark turn, like... Yes. There's there's a greater appreciation for that now than say when Star Wars came out. Well, the prequels did that, but yeah, prequel me right. A little bit of that's true. Thing. Yeah. Uh, that, also, video game adaptations. 
I think video game adaptations are are one of them is gonna strike gold. I I, I don't know which one, but one of them is gonna blow and up. A good Star Wars <laughs> game came out yeah. this week. Dark Forces no, no. remastered. I oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That. that's good. I just yeah, mean video- like. If they adapt Mass Effect or Metal Gear Solid or something, it's gonna one of them is gonna just be global, globally dominant. You know, it could be Zelda. I don't know. We don't know yet. Yeah, maybe because that's the, the next frontier. Zelda is such a bad idea. I hate that they're doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the next frontier for movies, though. It just is for sure. Video game adaptations. There's so many of them coming out. Well, all oh, right. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. I guess we could wrap it up there. Yep. Good a place as any, I would say. Thank you all for hanging out for so long. Yeah, exactly. Chunky boy. No worries. Thank you very cool. much, everybody. Almost I there. was talking to the chat, not to you, John. My chat. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, maybe shut the fuck up. No. <laughs> it's been fun. Thank you all very much for joining us. We'll uh, you. At, we'll at least on our channel, everybody. we'll be here next Sunday. We'll be competing next week, I'm oh sure, for your attention. Rather yeah. than If you don't watch us, we're going to beat you up. The son of guy taught, uh, taught me that everybody needs to watch our stream. All right. Goodbye, friends. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.